Hey everyone. So I initially covered this case back in the fall, but I am not going to replay that case before I add in all the additional stuff that has happened since then, which is so much and it gets wild. I'm just gonna give you a really quick recap of that. So if you already know the backstory, feel free to go ahead and skip ahead. You should be able to just see the chapters below or they are in the descriptions. So in Clark County, Indiana, the trouble in the sheriff's department started around 2014 when then Sheriff Danny Rodden was caught up in a federal sting that was not so pretty. He was charged with interacting with a prostitute and then lying to federal investigators about it. He was ultimately placed on administrative leave and well-known defense attorney Larry Wild represented him. We'll see Larry Wild in just a minute. Former Sheriff Rodden ultimately confessed and was sentenced to two years of probation and 240 hours of community service. Let's jump back a few years in time to the early 1990s. Jamie Knoll attended the university, Indiana University Southeast and received an associate's degree before going on to work on the fire crew at the former Indiana Armory ammunitions plant. He also worked part-time in the county's probation office. And that was before he became a state trooper for Indiana and spent 22 years there. While he was still working as a elected as the head of the Clark County Republican Party. That was in 2009, 2011, he selected to serve on the 9th Congressional District Chair. By 2014, he began his campaign for sheriff. Mike Pence, then the governor of Indiana, campaigned for him and Noel had many strong political ties. At some point in time, Noel became the head of the New Chapel EMS and the Utica Fire Association as well. Noel made a pledge to root out corruption in the jail systems as he took over Clark County. Somehow this plan to root out corruption culminated in the television show 60 Days In, which filmed seasons one and two in Clark County, Indiana. It later moved on to Fulton County, Georgia. The premise of the show was regular people off the street were taken and put in jail for 60 days. They had to keep their identities a secret and basically go undercover to root out the corruption. I know that they started arguing over tater tots early in the morning, so that's what led on uh, conflict and stuff. Now, you know, what's the door open to try to make a scene wrong? What are these doing out here? I'm gonna try to get you to death out here, dog. I'm not playing. You just wanna turn going in? Friday or Saturday night, you're probably going to see a fight. There's nothing in this jail worth me fighting over. Ricky's got blood all over his face. He's missing a tooth or something. I mean, that seems successful, right? During his time as sheriff, Noel was not always squeaky clean. More than two dozen former inmates settled a federal lawsuit against the Clark County Jail. The WDRB uncovered these settlements through an open records request. Everyone involved signed confidentiality agreements, but since taxpayers ultimately funded the settlements, they have a right to know how much was paid out. This case dates back to October of 2021. Prosecutors say former Clark County Corrections Officer David Lowe sold male inmates a key to the female dorm inside the jail suit. Former Clark County Sheriff Jamie Knoll, who was in charge of the jail at the time, vehemently denied the sexual assault claims and even created a website where he posted short clips of surveillance video showing the inmates inside the women's dorm. Covered evidence during those interviews through phone calls, jail-based text messages that several female inmates threatened and intimidated other female inmates to lie about what happened and to join their lawsuit. Some female inmates talked about using this as a potential lawsuit to get their get out of jail free card, while others talked about lying in order to get big payouts. Some female inmates repeatedly told their loved ones that nothing happened over the phone or jail-based text messaging, and then dramatically changed their story later. The settlements paid to 25 women by the county's insurance carrier total more than $328,000. 
Jamie Knoll's priority was to cover his own ass, and it remained that way for quite some time. Although he did get called out again in 2020 when a paternity suit was brought against him by his mistress, Brittany Furry, bringing to light the existence of a child between them. However, this didn't result in a divorce from his wife or anything else, just child support payments. And that brings us to June of 2023, when the Indiana State Police began their investigation into Jamie Knoll after there were allegations that he was having jail workers do work on his personal property and home and run errands for him. As they began looking into this, they all fell down the deep rabbit hole and shit got real. In August of 23, search warrants were executed on various properties owned by Jamie Knoll. And in November of 2023, November 8th, Jamie Knoll, sheriff of Clark County, Indiana, for nine years at the time, was arrested on 15 felony charges. Now, let's head to court. For everybody that wants a copy of it. $50,000, that being on May the 3rd, 2021, 
you traded a Utica owned 2020 Chevrolet Corvette uh, with a specific VIN number valued at $92,000 for a 2020 Mercedes Benz S Class 450 with a specific VIN number and registered said Mercedes in your own name. Count three, theft as a level five felony pursuant to Indiana Code 35-43-4-2A would indicate that between January the 2nd, 2019 and October the 10th, 2019, in Clark County, State of Indiana, you did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association, that being Utica, with the intent to deprive Utica of any part of its use or value of the property, said property having a value of at least $50,000, that being on January the 2nd, 2019, you traded a Utica owned 2017 Chevrolet 3500 <coughs> Silverado for a 2019 Challenger SRT Hellcat with a specific VIN number and titled said Hellcat in your own name. On October the 10th, 2019, you then personally sold said Hellcat for $83,716. Uh, count four, theft is a level six felony under Indiana Code 35-43-4-2A would indicate that between April the 30th, 2021 and September the 4th, 14th, 2022, in Clark County, State of Indiana, you did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control <coughs> over the property of Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive Utica of any part of the use or value of the property, so that said property having a value of at least $750 and less than $50,000, that being on April the 30th, 2021, you traded a Utica owned vehicle in for a 2012 Porsche Pan Panamera uh, with sp specific cause number and title said Porsche in your own name. That on September the 12th, 2022, you sold said Porsche for $32,000 to a car dealership and deposited said funds into your own personal account on September the 14th, 2022. Count five, theft as a level six felony, would indicate that between December the 2nd, 2020, and September the 28th, 2022, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association, Utica, with the intent to deprive Utica of any part of the use or value of the property and property having a value of at least $750 and less than $50,000. That being, on December the 2nd, 2022, you traded a Utica owned vehicle in for a 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air with a specific VIN number and title said Chevrolet in your own name. On September the 27th, 2022, you sold said Chevrolet for $39,500 to Kenny Eubanks and deposited said funds into your own personal bank account on September the 28th, 2022. Count six theft would indicate that between August the 31st, 2022 and September the 14th, 2022 in Clark County, State of Indiana, you did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive Utica of any part of the use or value of the property, said property having a value of at least $750 and less than $50,000. That being on August the 11th, 2022, you took a Utica owned Kubota HST tractor purchased in 27, 2017 for $40,600 and sold it to James Bishop for $31,000. On September the 14th, 2022, you deposited the check for $31,000 into your own personal bank account. Count 
Count seven, obstruction of justice as a level six felony would indicate that. On or about August the 16th, 2023, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you did knowingly or intentionally alter, damage, or remove any record, document, or thing with the intent to prevent it from being used, produced as evidence in any official proceeding or investigation. That being, you factory reset your phone upon the arrival of the Indiana State Police on your property. Count eight, ghost employment is a level six felony. It would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, and December 31st, 2022, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you, in your capacity as Clark County Sheriff, a public servant, did knowingly or intentionally assign to Michael Bowling, an employee under your supervision, duties that were not related to the operation of the governmental agency that you serve, that being the sheriff assigned bowling duties on your personal property, or rental properties, father-in-law's properties, pole barn, and property of Utica Fire Department. Count nine, ghost employment as a level six felony, would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, to December 31st, 2022, in Clark County, State of Indiana, you, in your capacity as Clark County Sheriff, a public servant, did knowingly or intentionally sign to Donald Jones, an employee, under defendant's supervision, duties that were not related to the operation of the governmental agency that, the, that you serve, that being Sheriff assigned to Jones duties on your personal property, rental properties, father-in-law's property, pole barn, and property of Utica Fire Department. Count 10, ghost employment, as a level six felony, would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, and December the 31st, 2022, in Clark County, State of Indiana, you, in your capacity as Clark County Sheriff, a public servant, did knowingly or intentionally assign to Rodney Walker, an employee under your supervision, duties that were not related to the operation of the governmental agency that you serve, that being sheriff, assign watery duties on your personal property, rental properties, father-in-law's property, pole barn, and the property of the unit fire department. Count 11, ghost employment, as the level six company would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, and December 31st, 2022, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you, in your capacity as Clark County Sheriff, a public servant, did knowingly or intentionally assign to Brent Fisher, an employee under your supervision, duties that were not related to the operation of the governmental agency that you serve, that being a sheriff assigned Fisher duties on your personal property, rental properties, father-in-law's property, pole barn, and property of Utica Fire Department. Count 12, official misconduct as a level six felony would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, and December the 31st, 2022, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you, a public servant, that being Sheriff of Clark County, knowingly or intentionally committed an offense in the performance of your official duties, that being ghost employment of Sheriff of Clark County, relating to Mike Bowling. Count 13, official misconduct as a level six felony. It would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, and December the 31st, 2022, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you, a public servant, that being sheriff of Clark County, knowingly or intentionally committed an offense in the performance of your official duties, that being ghost employment, as sheriff of Clark County, related to Donald Jones. Count 14, official misconduct as a level six felony would indicate that between November the 9th, 2018, and December 31st, 2022, in Clark County, state of Indiana, you, a public servant, that being sheriff of Clark County, knowingly or intentionally committed an offense in the performance of your official duties, that being ghost employment as sheriff of Clark County, related to Rodney 
cooperate. And count 15, official misconduct is a level 6 felony, it would indicate that between November the 9th, 2020, 2018, and December the 31st, 2022, in Clark County, State of Indiana, you, a public servant, that being Sheriff of Clark County, knowingly or intentionally committed an offense in the performance of your official duties, that being ghost employment as Sheriff of Clark County, relating to Brent Fisher. Mr. Null, the first three counts are level five felonies, which have a range of imprisonment from one year to six years, with the advisory sentence being three years and up to a $10,000 fine. Counts four through 15 are all level six felonies, which have a range of imprisonment of no time in jail, treated as a misdemeanor, to two and a half years at the Indiana Department of Corrections, with the advisory sentence being one year and up to a $10,000 fine. Do you understand what you've been charged with? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand the potential penalties? Yes, Your Honor. The next question is usually do you intend to hire a lawyer, but you obviously have counsel seated with you. I need to tell you, you have a right to a speedy public trial by jury in this county. You have the right to face all witnesses against you, see your question and cross examine those witnesses. You have the right to have witnesses brought into court to testify on your behalf. And at your request, the court will issue subpoenas requiring those individuals to come into court to testify on your behalf or to bring evidence in. You have the right to have the state prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the right to remain silent. You cannot be required to give any testimony or make any statements against yourself to anyone. You do have the right to be heard in your own defense at any hearing or trial concerning the charges against you. Anything you say, however, may be used against you. Do you have any questions concerning your rights? Okay. Now, by agreement of the parties, I'm going to enter a preliminary plea of not guilty for you and set this matter for a pretrial conference date on January the 8th at 1 p.m. At that time, we will also select an ominous date. There will be a jury trial set for the May the 6th, 2024, starting at 9 a.m. Do you have any questions? We have none, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, the next issue is uh, State of Indiana asked that you be held without bond, at least till the initial hearing. So on. I now want to take up the issue of, of bond. Mr. Hurdle. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. The, uh, the state would ask the court to consider, and I believe it is required that the court consider the factors set forth in 3533-84, the amount of bail, entry of order, endorsement on warrant and lieu of order, um, factors relevant to, non, to risk of non-appearance. Um, so the state would ask the, uh, the court to take a look at that. Uh, specifically, the, court, or the state points the court to subsection 7, the nature and the gravity of the offense and potential penalty faced. The defendant, as the court just read, is subject to 15 counts, 15 felonies, three of which are level five felonies, 12 of which are level six felonies. The state believes the gravity and the nature of the offense is significant here and would ask the court to consider those in determining his bail today. The state would also cite um, a couple of things as risk of non-appearance. Uh, the defendant has a home in the uh, state of Florida. Uh, does the state have any evidence that he's going to flee or run to the state of Florida? And no evidence of that, Your Honor, but I do believe it's important for the court to at least consider that there is a home there. The state would also point out that the defendant owns his own plane um, and has access to a plane that certainly allows him to come and, come and go outside the state of Indiana at his leisure. The state would also point out that the defense has filed a brief on the defendant's bond or recognizance conditions. And outlined in that brief, it does specifically say, in fact, he voluntarily availed himself of the court when he became aware that the Indiana State Police had potentially secured a warrant for his arrest. He traveled with his attorney, Larry O. Wilder, to the courthouse and waited in the circuit court, one, for multiple hours, presenting himself voluntary at the lobby of the Clark County Jail. The state doesn't dispute that, Your Honor, but I think that only tells a snapshot of the story that happened yesterday because 
I agree with part of it. The state police were waiting for a warrant to drop after the charges were filed yesterday, and in fact put, made contact with him in an attempt to basically locate him. They followed him for a period of time. Flea might be a uh, strong term, but he certainly went to the state of Kentucky and attempted to elude them for a significant period of time, ultimately parking his vehicle on the street in Louisville, getting into a car with his attorney in Kentucky. Uh, so I, I think that adds a little bit of a difference and a different flavor than what the defense posed, that he's basically sitting in the courtroom here waiting and then turning himself into the lobby because earlier in the day, he's running from the Indiana State Police, bouncing around in a truck in Indiana and then to the state of Kentucky. So I think the state should consider that as well in determining his bail. Um, the state is not in possession of any IRAS. I know he was evaluated today. I believe the statute does require the court to consider the IRAS as well. I'll just give him one a little bit earlier. Okay, Mr. thank you. And I would ask the court to consider whatever that might be, Your Honor. Uh, further, the state would ask the court to consider if and when the defendant posts bond that he be placed on some sort of monitoring device, whether that be a bracelet of some, some, some sort of in-home incarceration, work privileges, or something of that nature. And if the court is un, um, maybe not inclined to do that, then a day reporting of some sort to the probation department or court services here in Clark County or court services in a neighboring county because of the connections the defendant has here in Clark County. Um, and lastly, Your Honor, the state would ask the defendant uh, to turn over all of his weapons um, to the Indiana State Police so that they may be kept. Um, as subsection B points out, defendant poses, could pose a risk to the physical safety of another person or the community. Uh, the state is aware that pursuant to the search warrant that was executed in August of this year on at least one of his properties, there were a multitude of weapons that were there. Uh, the state did not um, seize those weapons as there was not a warrant for those and that he was not illegally possessing those that the state is aware of. But in factoring bond, and once he does post bond, those weapons the state believes ought to be turned over to the Indiana State Police for uh, safekeeping as well. All that being said, Your Honor, the state would ask for a bond in the amount of twenty-five dollars to $30,000 posted uh, by cash by the defendant. The state believes that is reasonable under these circumstances and again asking the court to review the um, factors set forth in Indiana Code along with the IRAS and those that the state just laid out for the court today. Uh, Mr. Earl, you, you indicated there was a multitude of uh, firearms. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, they, in talking to the detective who uh, is handling and overseeing this investigation, there are assault rifles, rifles, shotguns, and handguns as well, Your Honor. Thank you, Judge. The state rests. And this is the argument? I suspect they'll want some rebuttal, but uh, oh, for the time being, Mr. Certainly, Judge. Your so first, Judge, we all know that bond issues require evidence, and as we know, what lawyers say is not evidence. I've seen no evidence. We call Chris Tinman to the stand, Judge. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury testimony about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and not the truth? Yes, sir. I'll see you. Thank you, Judge. For the record, tell me your name. Chris Tizman, T I Z N A N, and I'm with the Pretrial Services Probation. You can make some. So, in your professional address? I filed in the police court all the time. Jefferson, no. Mr. Timmer, can you, I'm sorry, thanks, Judge. Can you, Mr. Timmer, can you tell the judge what your qualifications are that provided you with the ability to provide pretrial services in Clark County, Indiana? I've uh, been with pretrial services for four years. I'm a Bachelor of Science in Sociology, uh, as well as uh, training uh, through the Indiana State Government. And that's training in 
providing a, for the Indiana risk assessment. So when we say IRS, we're saying Indiana risk assessment, correct? Mm -hmm. So to prepare your Indiana risk assessment in this matter, did you review the CCS chronological case? Yeah, we do a, a limited background check as well as conduct an interview with the defendant uh, to come up with the IRS score. And we agree that when you looked at the charges filed, uh, Mr. Dole is not charged with murder, correct? Yes. Nor is he charged with treason, right? Yes. Which are non bondable offenses in Indiana, right? The only way you can keep somebody in jail without bond in Indiana is they're charged with murder and treason, correct? And in fact, when you reviewed his criminal history, you uh, determined, or did you find that, that my client has ever been charged with a crime in Indiana? I did not locate any uh, involvements. There was one very old involvement that was abolished, but other than that, there was no... Traffic infraction. Right. So he has had a traffic infraction in his lifetime. And when you reviewed the information and got the evidence together to provide this information to the court, did you did you notice whether he was on probation or parole from any unrelated offense? He's not currently on any active supervision. So you're familiar with Indiana Trial Rule 26, correct? Which is what makes you have to do this, right? So in considering your recommendations or what the IRS says, the reasoning should be that no bond for arrest, or excuse me, for murder or treason, correct? Doesn't apply, right? right. No bond for someone who has pre-trial detention in other places or is on probation parole, correct? Yes. Doesn't apply. And that uh, you review whether or not that this new offense has something to do with any other old offense, correct? Yes, all those factors combine into the and none of them apply to Mr. Null, do they? He, he scored a low on our IRS. And how low can you go on an IRS and be the lowest you can be? It would be a zero. And what is Mr. Null's score? He scored a zero on our IRS. So based upon what Indiana Supreme Court's adopted through this trial rule, which is evidence, right, that the finding is that he has a zero risk of flight, correct? He would be a low. He would be a low risk of flight. He scored a zero on the IRS. And with having scored a zero, we agree that the Indiana pretrial release rule says that he should be released on his own recognizance. Correct? Yes, and I put him as a uh, level three on the supervision. And what's level three supervision? So Judge Medlock understands because he's right. from Washington County. We have different things here. What's a level three? I'm from the country. Yeah. That's not true. That's not correct, Judge Washington County. Uh, level three is our lowest level of supervision. Which is what? Is one monthly contact with an officer in person. Now, you heard the, the government's argument through its special prosecutor as to what they recommended the detention be. Could you enlighten us all as to what he's asked for? What level would that be of supervision? Right now, currently, we don't uh, do any HIV, but that would be at least that would be level one, uh, which would be the most restrictive. And what and, and, and what is when somebody's on the most restrictive type of pretrial release? In your experience, and based upon your time doing what you've done, what are the crimes that usually constitute that? Uh, it would more so be with any past uh, trial pretrial FTAs. Uh, or a risk of if they don't have a stable residence and things like that would be more so related to the amount of contact that we would like to have. So what he's asked for is the highest, which is for the most prominent criminal offense and criminals, correct? And what he grades is the lowest, which is zero. Yeah, he's and that's the evidence, he's right? Low. Yes. And that's the evidence. And you were aware that Mr. Knoll and his lawyers waited until there was a warrant signed, correct? I'm not aware of that. Okay, then I have no further <laughs> questions because okay. that would not be evidence because you don't have personal yeah, knowledge. Yeah. Judge, I would move in the IRS as evidence as it relates to what bond should be, and we would just ask that the law set out, criminal uh, trial rule 26 be followed, and that our client be released on his own recognizance at the level of supervision that seems to be appropriate based upon the evidence presented by this witness who's qualified to testify.
Any objections to the admission? No, Your Honor. No objection. I'll show you. Made it is. Defendant's Exhibit A? Yes, Your Honor. That's acceptable. Cross examination, Mr. Hurdle. Mr. Tibbet, I, I guess maybe I don't fully understand, or maybe in Ripley County we uh, use the uh, IRS for something different. Is it your testimony that if someone scores a zero, they should be released on their own recognizance each and every time, no matter what the charge? Uh, no, sir. I don't okay, because that's what I got. Judge, can he answer? He wasn't finished. He asked a question. Can he answer? Is that an objection? It is an objection. He cut the witness off and he wasn't finished answering. A response, Mr. Irwin? I'll withdraw the question. Thank you. Again, Your Honor. you so all, all due respect, I'll, I'll repeat the question, Mr. Tidman. Is it your testimony today that if someone scores a zero on the IRAS, the court should just release them on their own recognizance? Uh, no, sir. That, that decision is up to the judge. I can only simply make an IRAS recommendation and a supervision level recommendation. Okay. And so you're not saying bond should be a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. You're talking about once bond potentially is posted, what the what the supervision level you're uh, at least recommending? Through our pretrial services program, you could be released on your own recognizance to pretrial. You could have a bond and then report to pretrial as well. Okay. Now. Um, who employs pretrial services in Clark County? It would be the Clark County government. Okay. So who do you report to? Who do I report yes. to? The chief probation officer and then the judges. Okay. Do you work with the sheriff's department at all? Uh, directly in the mornings, uh, they get together our defendants for interviews in the morning. But as far as like a face-to-face, -face, not, not daily. But we do communicate with the jail every day to get our defendants for interviews. So they provide you information and access to their inmates? They provide us the ability to talk to the inmates for mm -hmm. the CR 26 interviews. Okay. And uh, you said you've been employed for four years? Yes, sir. And during those four years, um, was the defendant uh, the Clark County Sheriff at that time? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so you had received permission, at least at some point in time, from him or his employees to access those same different defendants for the IRS, is that right? I've never uh, personally communicated with Mr. Knoll, uh, to my knowledge, but I do communicate with his staff uh, through the jail, through the interviews. And obviously, just like the staff now reports to Sheriff Maples, at one point in time, that staff reported to then Sheriff Knoll. Do you feel comfortable um, supervising uh, somebody like Mr. Knoll? Um, I, I, Judge, I don't object to the characterization of the question. Somebody like Mr. Knoll? Are we talking about somebody that scores a zero on the IRS? What are we trying to imply? Is somebody like Mr. Knoll? State the objection, Mr. Wilder. I object to the characterization of, the, of the, the question. It implies something that is nefarious as it relates to my client. There's no evidence. There's still no evidence from the state of anything. Response, Mr. Your Honor, it was uh, no attempt to be nefarious. Uh, it was an attempt, basically, to ask him if he felt comfortable supervising the ex-sheriff in Clark County. Overruled you, man. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I, I I understand what you're asking. I don't personally I do supervise. Too. I think it's Mr. Wilder. I too. just I do the assessments. Um, so in terms of me personally supervising him, I wouldn't be in that role. Um, but I, I understand what you're asking. And I wouldn't really have an opinion on that one way or another. If I was asked to do something, that's what I'm asked to do. So that might be a question for one of your superiors, the chief probation officer, or someone else, how they would feel about supervising someone like Jamie Knoll. That would, that would be a question for the chief probation officer on how they would like to handle uh, a former employee of the Clark County uh, government branch being supervised. Above your pay grade. Yeah, if you want to phrase it like that. Sure. Right. Do you know the defendant? Uh, just as the sheriff, but not personally. 
give any personal knowledge of any of the accusations made in the criminal um, information against the defendant? Just what I did on a report from copying the charges over. Have you always been in pretrial services here? Yes, sir. You live in Clark County? Yes, sir. Was any of this a surprise to you? Judge, I'll check. Relevance? Thank you, Judge. Judge, I don't believe I have any other questions at this time. Mr. Just Hurl. one, Judge. Was there anything that Mr. Hurdle asked you that caused those findings on that piece of paper to change? Uh, no, sir. What I put on the, the paper is, is what he scored. Thank you. No question. Uh, the court has a question. Yes, sir. How do I, how do I, besides this one, how do you pronounce your last name? Tibna. Tibna? Yep. Mr. Tibna, how many times have you done a pretrial assessment on a past public official and a, and a current you know, public figure uh, that has an airplane and that allegedly has uh, a lot of other people's money and government taxpayer money? Um, this would be a unique situation. Would be a unique situation. Okay. That prompts any questions from either side. Not from the state, Your Honor. I have no judge, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the step, Any other witnesses, Mr. Wilder? Uh, Your Honor, at this time we've provided all the evidence that's necessary, we believe, to support our argument for the trial of the 26. Mr. Wilder, I have not had, I was given your brief just moments before I came out here. Uh, would you like to summarize it for me? Your Honor, there's really no need to summarize the brief because what really matters is the government provided zero evidence. Lawyers' words are not evidence. Statements that Mr. Hurdle made are not evidence. We do evidence-based bonds now. The trial rule is clear. The statutes are clear. The only evidence before the court today is what we heard from the gentleman who's trained to make that determination as to what his IRS is. The only thing we follow based upon that is what the Supreme Court of Indiana has told us we follow, Trial Rule 26. He is not charged with murder. He is not charged with treason. He was not on pre-trial release for an unrelated matter. He has never been arrested, and he is not on probation or, or parole or under a community supervision program. The Supreme Court states that the IRS indicates that he is not a risk of flight. Therefore, we ask the court to place him on level three supervision and that he be released today on his recognizance. Mr. Earl. Your Honor, the, uh, the state would rest on its uh, prior evidence that was uh, placed before the court in the, um, my first round. Um, and uh, I think probably to clear up the record, the, the state has um, no issue with Mr. Tidman and, and pretrial services in Clark County. Um, I think the state is trying to be cognizant, as the court is, of potentially supervising an ex-sheriff, a public figure, um, someone like Mr. Knoll, um, no nefarity noted there either. But um, I, I, if, if Clark County is in a position that they want to supervise, and if the court feels that ultimately after bail is posted, the pretrial services in this county are most appropriate, um, then by all means do it. But I, I think that... Um, there certainly could be some at least perceived conflicts. Hence, that's why the Indiana State Police is investigating this. Hence, why there's a special prosecutor involved. Hence, why there's a special judge involved. Because Clark County has removed itself from that equation. So that's the only intent that the state was doing that. Nothing personal or um, untoward with, uh, with Mr. Tidman. So the state would ask the court to consider that in any determination it makes today with respect to bail. Uh, I, I have no concern. Mr. Waller, did you want to say something? I, Judge, I was only going to once again state the only evidence in this hearing today is the testimony from Mr. Tinman and the document that was put into evidence. Nothing we say as lawyers is evidence. They presented no evidence. That is the burden they had. 
to present evidence by preponderance of the evidence to ask you for anything more that he be released on his own recognizance. He does, but I think it was, do they leave your passport? He does have a passport, and we will turn it in, Judge. At least one other issue that I need to address in a different cause number. Um, do we need to do something technically to address that? We can continue in this cause number or in this recording. Yeah. All right. Cause number 10 C01 2307 MC 1423, that being in the matter of the investigation by the Indiana State Police. Uh, I was also handed this not too long ago. Uh, there was a motion to unseal uh, the records in regards to the investigation. Uh, Mr. Wilder, do you We have no objection, Judge. We, we welcome the unsealing of all those documents for the public and for us to have an opportunity to read them. All right, then I'll order that matter to be unsealed. So. I expect the uh, clerk and the court will have a feeding frenzy from the media here in a short period of time. Uh, Mr. Hurdle, is there anything else that needs to be addressed today? Not for the state. Your Honor, is the, uh, the court's intent to, uh, to take a brief recess and make a decision, or are we going to adjourn for the day? I'm going I'm to take a brief recess. Um, I'm going to take a brief recess, and then I'll decide whether we're going to adjourn for the day. Thank so you. Just stick around. Mr. Walker? And Judge, so long as our client remains here, and he's not transported back to Scott County, why would we wait for your determination that we need? Well, I'll, I'll decide that in a few minutes. Yes. Um, and just for the public's knowledge, uh, I was assigned to the special investigation, and I signed, as I'm sure a lot of you folks know, the search warrants and subpoenas uh, because there was a new case filed uh, the setting judge had had to recuse himself and I had to wait until uh, I received notice from the Supreme Court that I had been assigned to this particular case uh, that uh, notice came at about 10 to 4 yesterday afternoon and thus I could not assume jurisdiction or take any action in regards to the issuance of the uh, arrest warrant until that occurred, and that's one reason uh, Mr. Wilder and uh, Mr. Noll uh, sat in the, uh, in the gallery here for a period of time, and uh, I assume if he had been arrested in Kentucky, he would have been probably a week before he could have been extradited, so that's probably good advice you give him to get back to Indiana, Mr. Wilder. Oh, yeah, dude. Your Honor, we, we met at Mr. We met at Mr. McMahon's office to come to Indiana for the purpose of making sure we afforded ourselves to the jurisdiction of the great state of Indiana. Anything else, Mr. Wilder? No, Mr. Wilder? Nothing, Judge. I'll be off record for a few minutes while I think about Thanks, what Judge. I need to do.
Wilder, I'll accept your offer. He will surrender his passport to you by noon tomorrow, and then you will surrender it to the court uh, <coughs> by 4 p.m. next Monday, because it's my understanding. Uh, the court here is closed tomorrow. Yes, sir. He will surrender all firearms except one shotgun of his choice to Indiana State Police. Uh, being from the country, or as Mr. Wilder said, Washington County, I keep my shotgun with a double lock near me, along with the 45, but uh, I think one shotgun for personal protection uh, is appropriate for him to maintain. He will not leave the state of Indiana without permission of the court, and he'll post $75,000 in cash. Mr. Dolph, this is a unique case. Mr. Wilder, I know uh, you wanted him released without posting any, any bond, but it's a unique case. And uh, if you don't like my decision, I'm happy for you to appeal it. It won't be the first time you've appealed me, and I, the Court of Appeals told you I was right, so uh, I'm happy for you to accept that challenge if you're so pleased. Um, I'm not going to have you report in. I think there's enough uh, media attention, there's enough public uh, eyes out there that if you do anything stupid, uh, it'll be brought before the attention of the court. So I implore you not to do anything stupid. Judge, if I may, uh, could we bring the firearms to the court to be inventory before we provide them to the state police? because the vehicles that were returned to my client were damaged and the brake lines were cut in one of those vehicles. So we would prefer to have an inventory of his firearms that the court staff sets up photographs of those firearms before we give them to the entity that's returned damaged property to us. And then the second question, Your Honor, is uh, obviously when money was, we're, we're going to post the $75,005 but that money obviously has been put in my trust account. Therefore, I will be, is it, is it sufficient to sign a trust check from my trust account to, cut, to pay to the bond? Because getting 75,000, walking around with $75,000 in cash bothers me, Judge, and it all went into the bank. I'm not sure what the, I don't have any, Concerned with your trust check, Mr. Wilder. Um, I, I don't know what the policy is for the for the court. They accept my trust checks, Judge, and that's fine. Um, Mr. Hurl, in regards to the issue of the inventory of the uh, firearms, what, what's your position? Your Honor, I. The state is prepared to to accept those either from the court to the state police or directly to the state police. I. Uh, I believe that uh, either one is, a, is appropriate. If, if it's going to assure him uh, some peace of mind that something's not going to be damaged, the, the state probably would contend that there was nothing returned to him damaged, but uh, that's for another day, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Wilder, I don't know that the court has the ability to inventory uh, the firearms. I don't even know how many firearms he has. Judge, could we allow the Jeffersonville Police Department to inventory the firearms, photograph the firearms, and then transfer them to the state police? I, I don't have jurisdiction over the... If the Jeffersonville Police would do that, Judge, is that sufficient? No. Here's what you may do. Yes, sir. When they're surrendered, have someone from your team uh, be there to monitor. Yes, sir. Take photographs of them as they're, as they're surrendered. To show the condition that they're in, I, that's fine. Yes, sir. You can do it one by one. But, uh, when can that be accomplished? And Mr. Nolf, yes, sir. You keep one shotgun, one shotgun only. Try to deceive me. You will not like the consequences. Yes, Understand? Yes, sir. Okay. And then, Judge, the issue of return of all other items seized, we can just take them in another hearing. Well, it wasn't set for today, so. No, I, yeah, we'll deal with that at another time. I assume uh, now that everything's going to be unsealed, uh, 
There'll be a lot of new things brought before the court that yes, sir. we'll address in, in due time. Thank you, Judge. Anything Thank you, else? No, Your Honor. Nothing else from us, Judge. Thank you. All right. We'll be off record. Thank you all. Court records just unsealed today. They reveal police took dozens of cars and more than $50,000 in cash from drawers and dressers after searching Jamie Knoll's home, properties he owned, businesses he ran, and those belonging to relatives. Following the initial hearing, Special Judge Larry Medlock issued his order, which said that the court advised the defendant of his charges, rights, potential penalties. The court enters the preliminary plea of not guilty. The court sets the defendant's bond at $75,000 cash, which he promptly paid. The defendant is ordered to surrender his passport. The defendant shall surrender all of his firearm except one shotgun. The defendant shall remain in the state of Indiana. The court may consider permission for him to leave upon request. The defendant is ordered to appear for a pretrial conference and that a jury trial was scheduled for May of 2020. An appeal was filed to this ruling on December 7th, 2023. Even when the defendant has posted bond in a criminal case, the amount and conditions of the bond are not moot because the public interest exception to mootness applies. The trial court abused its discretion by failing to make specific factual findings that supported the court's denial of Knowles' release on his own recognizance, and that the trial court abused discretion because the factors outlined in Indiana Code 3333-84B did not support the trial court's judgment on the amount and conditions of bond. There is an associated 25-page motion that I will post on Patreon for you to review if you so choose. The Court of Appeals ultimately upheld the trial court's original orders. As Jamie Knoll awaits trial in his theft and official misconduct case, investigators say he unlawfully paid child support to another politician. Investigators say over the summer, they were tipped off that Noel had a child with Brittany Faree, who served on Clark County County Council from 2019 to 2022. In a probable cause statement used to search her home in Sellersburg on December 29th, they say Noel initially denied being the father, but they found records of him being ordered to pay child support. They also found checks like this one for $2,200 from the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association doing business as New Chapel EMS and going to state collectors. Noel paid over $25,000 in child support and did not declare the payments on his taxes. It's unclear exactly how much of that came from his businesses. The special prosecutor said today he was prepared to bring criminal charges against Misty Noel, Jamie Noel's wife. The judge even hinted that she might be arrested in the courtroom on Tuesday. That didn't happen and they need to make sure they know how to bring those charges, but it led to a passionate response from the defense team that it was not the right way to bring it up. I could arrest her myself according to the statute. Seated just one row behind her husband, lawyers discussed how and when Misty Knoll will be brought into the case. And I find it a tad bit disheartening that this is how the government's approach to today's proceeding was. So far, the former sheriff has been accused of using taxpayer money to buy a plane, selling cars out of a volunteer firefighters association, and not declaring child support payments on his taxes. The state prosecutor didn't specify what kind of charges could be coming Misty's way. The state is now prepared to move forward on criminal charges um, against certain defendants, uh, primarily Misty Knoll. 
Rick Hurdle was looking for guidance on how to bring the charges because a special judge has been brought in for the Jamie Knoll investigation with no mention of his wife. The judge was willing to have a hearing right then and there. If you want to arrest her, she's sitting in chair two front row. Well, I got to have probable cause before I can do that. Defense attorney Larry Wilder objected to her being arrested when the jurisdiction and bond was not clear. Just to punish them in advance seems a little bit like a strategy that is outside the bounds of all of the trial rules that have been invoked by the Supreme Court. Hurdle didn't want to have a probable cause hearing Tuesday, and the two sides will make sure of the proper way to do it, but the charges could be coming any day. For breaking news at 5, WHAS 11 News has learned late today that the wife of the former Clark County, Indiana Sheriff, Jamie Knoll, Misty Knoll, you see her right here, has been charged in his ongoing investigation. Court records in Clark Circuit Court are showing she's charged with alleged theft and tax evasion. Well, Scott, you'll remember behind me on last week, Misty Knoll was taken into custody. Before she made her court appearance today, she did have a special request. It was to appear in court in her own clothing. As you're about to see, the answer was no, which meant she was brought to court today in handcuffs, shackles, and a green jail issue jumpsuit. She spent the weekend locked up at the Scott County Detention Center. The Indiana State Board of Accounts releasing its findings after an audit of the new chapel EMS and included photographs. Here's your first look. The investigation found Jamie Knoll had little to no oversight of his spending. In the report, they say there is no evidence the board of directors had any function. The four-person board did not approve contracts, didn't approve purchases, and reviewed no budget since 2019. The report also outlined more purchases made by Jamie Knoll, including more than $20,000 in political donations through the new Chapel American Express card. The report claims that he made them on the conservative website WinRed. We're also getting a look inside the Knoll barn, where these photos show he stored his classic car collection. You can see in these pictures, cars stacked up on top of each other. Those lifters also purchased using New Chapel funds. Under wraps right here, you can also see a vintage police car. That's not all. These household appliances, including double wall ovens and a new refrigerator, were purchased with $16,000 from the New Chapel EMS charge card. And then there's this single engine plane bought in 2022. Reports show Noel tried to transfer the ownership of the plane to New Chapel EMS after multiple search warrants were carried out by Indiana State Police in 2023. The daughter of former Clark County Sheriff Jamie Knoll remains in jail after her arrest Friday, charged with nine felonies. Casey Knoll appeared in court this morning, becoming the third member of her family to be arrested in recent months. Casey's charged with five counts of theft and four counts of tax evasion. Court documents allege she spent $96,000 over a three-year span on an American Express card from the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighter Association. Purchase describes as personal, including clothing, Netflix, and tanning. Investigators then said Casey failed to report that money as personal income. And while she has not yet filed this year's tax return, it's believed she spent another $12,000 during discussions of Casey's bond. The defense argued she's indicated she's not a high risk, even turning herself in. But the prosecution disagreed, hinting at a larger problem surrounding all three family members in this case. Casey spent a lot of the past week, the past few days, with me. Because we expected that by the end of this week, there'd be a warrant for her in this case. Your Honor, with all, all due respect, this is the third defendant charged in this matter, and each one of them knew specifically when the warrant was issued under seal. The state believes that there's, I have no idea even how Jamie Knoll, Misty Knoll, and now Casey Knoll know that a warrant drops in a confidential document under seal so much that they can turn themselves in when the warrant is issued. The state has some concerns about uh, that information somehow being provided to the Knoll family. A big question today. Casey's attorney says she anticipated charges in that case because a detective gave her a call earlier in the week. The family of Noel's late brother Leon has filed a petition to reopen his estate. They claim Jamie ripped them off and instead enriched himself and his daughter. 
Leon died in 2018 and Jamie was made the controller of the estate. Focus reporter Travis Breeze tells us what the family is hoping to get. They are in disbelief. What they've shared with me was that this was such a low point for them. They had just lost their father and, you know, he completely took advantage of them. Attorney Amy Wheatley in New Albany is representing the three children of William Leon Knoll. Leon died in 2018 and his estate closed in 2020. On February 9th, police said they were investigating the estate and had proof that Jamie profited as controller. He allegedly sold Leon's house to his own daughter, Casey, for $180,000 and gave her $36,000 of equity in the house. Police say that money should have gone to Leon's kids. Each one of the heirs received a distribution, but it is our contention that it was not all that they were entitled to. In March, contempt charges were filed against Jamie Knoll, alleging he failed to abide by the court's November 19th, 2023 order where it said that the defendant shall surrender all of his firearms to the Indiana State Police with the exception of one shotgun and being informed on the record at the initial hearing. The court, after reviewing the return for the search warrant number 45, shows that the Indiana State Police seized two Smith & Wesson MNP9 semi-auto pistols. A show cause hearing was scheduled. C01-2403 MC634. Um, while we were in the other room, we had these legal arguments and potential resolution of the issue. Um, you'll notice that Ms. Collada is not here, and with her permission, we are going to commence the uh, rule to show cause here. Mr. Herb. How about this? Anybody that's going to testify, please stand, raise your right hand. Anybody. got everybody? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah, All right. You can have a seat. Call your first witness, Mr. Hurley. Your Honor, the, uh, your Honor, before we begin, if you like, we'd like to make a <coughs> separation of witnesses, please. I think that would be appropriate. Granted. Except the state may have a representative to set a table. Just if we if we could just briefly, um, just to make a procedural question, we have um, and would like to raise with the court is uh, we'd like to understand and, and make sure that we are here relative to an indirect contempt filing um, on an issue today, and if that is correct. Um, we would just ask that the procedures in Indiana Code 34-47-3-7 um, and ask for the appointment of a special judge relative to uh, the requirements for indirect contempt findings in the state of Indiana. Thank you, Judge. And are you familiar with that residence? I am. Have you been there before? Yes. I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 1. Would you take a look at State's Exhibit 1? Okay. What is State's Exhibit 1? That's 3001 Otay Bridge, Jamie Knowles residence. Is that residence. the same address you just were speaking about, about assisting with the search warrant on March 13th? It is. Does that appear to be truly and accurately reflective of the outside of the residence on Otay Bridge? It does. No objection to State's Exhibit 1, Your Honor. So State's Exhibit Number 1 admitted without objection. Your Honor, State moved to admit. Thank you. Yeah. Admitted. <clears throat> Detective, were you um, in charge of the uh, search warrant or the scene at Old Tay Ridge Road on March 13th? I was not. And who were you taking direction from? Lieutenant Jeff Heron with the Indiana State Police. Did you have any contact with the uh, defendant, uh, Jamie Knoll, on that day? I saw him, but I didn't communicate with him. Did you have any conversation at all? I did not. 
What was your role once you got to Teddy Bridge and you went into the home? To help search. And do you recall what you were searching for? Uh, we were searching for uh, Tom James suits and apparel, shoes, belts. Were you searching for anything else with respect to Tom James clothing? Any receipts or documents associated with uh, those uh, items. Were you provided any type of lists of apparel items or things that you were specifically looking for? I was. Uh, who provided that to you? Lieutenant Jeff Heron. Was that prior to the search or uh, once you got to Tate Bridge? Once we got to the location. How was it decided where you were going to be searching specifically yourself? Uh, we just kind of communicated upstairs once the scene was secured and I volunteered to go downstairs and start in the basement. Can you describe the, uh, the basement uh, to the judge? Your Honor, when you walk down into the basement, um, it opens up into a large uh, living room type area, family room. Uh, there's another door that you, if you continue down the stairs, it goes into a back room, which is a movie theater area. And then I centered my, uh, focused my search to the left uh, when you walked into the back room, which was a table area where there was some Tom James suits and apparel. Was the basement a finished basement or a, uh, a concrete basement? Well, it was finished with the exception of one part, which was kind of storage. There were shelves in there. Was there any, were there any living areas in the, uh, the basement? I do believe there was at least one bedroom downstairs. Did you go to the basement alone or with any other uh, troopers and or other state police employees? I don't remember if I was down there alone at any one given time, and I don't remember who went with me. There were various people that came down with me during the search. Detective, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes. States exhibits two, three, and four. Do you recognize states two, three, and four? I do. What are they? Uh, these are pictures of the area. Um, when you come down the stairs and go into the back room to the left, this is the table and the area of the, where I focus my initial search in the basement. So two, three, and four are a basement area? Correct. Why did you go to this specific area? Were you searching uh, for something specific there? Well, when I first got to the residence, Mr. No took uh, Lieutenant Heron downstairs. I followed, and he was showing Lieutenant Heron where the areas are located, or areas in the house where there were Tom James suits and apparel, and that was one of the areas that he pointed out, and I was present when that happened. And that's why I focused my search down there, not to mention you could also see um, some uh, containers, uh, little shopping bags that contained, that were John or Tom, uh, uh, James apparel bags. So that's why I focused my search there. Did the defendant specifically show you and Detective Heron this location? He did. Do those truly and accurately reflect the, uh, the area in the basement where he directed you to? It does. Your Honor, we do not have any objection to State's Exhibit 2, 3, and 4. State would move to admit State's three, 2, 3, and 4, Your Honor. State's Exhibits 2, 3, and 4 admitted without objection. Your Honor, if I could use these with the you witness. You uh, I want to direct your attention to State's Exhibit 2, Detective. Um, did you take the photograph? I did not. But does it truly and accurately reflect uh, what you saw there? It does. Okay. I want to direct your attention specifically to a, a black object sticking um, out of a box. Okay. Did you see this object when you were conducting your search? I did. What is it? It's a shotgun. Okay. Was that shotgun examined in any way, shape, or form? It was. I looked to see if it was loaded. Okay. And how, why did you do that? Well, I mean, you know, I'm in that area searching and firearms are dangerous. <clears throat> Uh, did that cause you any kind of concern that there was a, a shotgun there? It did not. Okay. Now, the uh, states three and four 
these two photographs focus on a white box with a black box inside of those. Do you recognize those as well? I do. And is that how they looked when you saw them? They do. Okay. Did you look inside of that large white box? I did. Okay. For what purpose? Uh, we're looking for uh, any receipts, documents, belts, and other apparel. Okay. Did anything cause you any type of concern in that box? Well, when I moved the chair out, inside that box was two Smith & Wesson boxes, which Smith & Wesson is a firearm. And that's something you're familiar with, being a police officer for uh, nearly 30 years? I am. Smith & Wesson is a brand? It is. Okay. Uh, did you examine the contents of the box? I did. And what was inside the box? Uh, two firearms, okay. handguns. Did they appear to be loaded? I don't believe they were. Okay. Once you noticed these um, two firearms, what did you do? I notified uh, Detective Chris Hansen and Lieutenant uh, Jeff Heron. And just for the record purposes, um, Detective, you're talking about in State's Exhibit 2, the center of the picture, white box, black box, and inside of it with a, you can at least see it says Smith on it? Yes. Okay. And then in State's Exhibit 3, you're talking about the white box on the chair? Yes. Okay. Why did you notify uh, Detective Heron once you uh, located uh, these two firearms? Well, it was my responsibility to let him know, having been here for the initial hearing and hear the judge um, order the defendant to only possess a shotgun. When I found the firearms, it's my responsibility to notify uh, the lead detective, Lieutenant Jeff Heron, and I did. Obviously, those two Smith & Wesson were not shotguns. They were not. Okay. You saw a shotgun there and it didn't cause you any concern other than to make sure it was unloaded. Correct. You, were, you stated that you were here for a initial hearing with uh, this particular defendant, with this particular judge. I was. Were you present when he was, um, I guess, told what he could keep and what he couldn't keep? Yes. Is that why you contacted Detective Heron? It was. Did you physically take these guns into your possession at the time? I did not. Okay. Ultimately, did the Indiana State Police take them into their possession? They did. States 2, 3, and 4 that Mr. Wilder... Uh, Mr. Wilder, 4, 2. Oh, yes. States 2, 3, and 4. Um, the chair was partially pushed under a table at the time, or all the way under the table? I believe it was all the way under the table. Okay. The items that were located on top of the table, did you examine any of those items? I did. What, what were some of those items? Uh, there were, um, what, I, what I recall mainly was a cowboy hat, and uh, cowboy uh, western footwear, boots. Did they appear to be men's, women's, or you couldn't tell? Uh, I think men's. And this is the uh, area that uh, the defendant directed you to take the care to? Correct. Did you find any Tom James apparel, suits, belts, shoes, or anything like that in that particular area as well? I did. Your Honor, I don't have any other questions for Detective Mitchell. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Detective. I want to talk to you a little bit about your role. Um, you got on March 13th, you were asked to uh, get a search warrant together. Is that it? I did. Okay. And when you do that, how do you do that? You call somebody? I was called uh, by Lieutenant Jeff Heron okay. sometime that morning. He told me he was going to be executing a search warrant and asked me that if I would uh, get a couple troopers and a couple detectives. How and many that's... troopers did you go into that house with? Uh, two troopers. And how many detectives? I believe four. Okay, so you got six people plus yourself. Well, there was a crime scene technician as well, and I believe there was that's someone seven. there. Pardon me? 
So that's seven. Who okay. else? There would have been someone there from um, State Board of Accounts as well. Okay. Um, do you normally, when you execute a search warrant, you bring somebody from the State Board of Accounts? Uh, not in any of the cases that I've worked. Um, not in all the 29 years you've worked at the State Police, have you ever taken anybody from the State Board of Accounts in on a search warrant? Not me personally, but this isn't the first time that someone's from State Board of Accounts has been Okay, there. but there's at least seven to eight people going into that house, correct? Correct. Now, who was in charge of that search? You? Lieutenant Jeff Herring. Okay. So Lieutenant Heron is the one giving the orders? Correct. Is it, and that's how it works in the, your office? That is correct. Okay. And when Lieutenant Heron, he would have assigned, because it's a large house, isn't it? It is. Okay. How many rooms? I, don't, I do not know. More than 10? Yes. Okay. Finished, unfinished? Most of it was finished with the exception of the basement area where the dogs were at. Okay. And what you had for the request of the search warrant were for clothing, is that correct? Clothing and documents and receipts associated with those clothes. Okay. Well, I noticed in the return of the search warrant, there isn't anything listed where you got any of this material. In other words, let me look you and see if you could refresh your recollection and tell me on item uh, 2000, where'd you get it? I didn't fill out this. I didn't collect any clothing. I didn't well, fill this out. Well, let me understand something. You, you got all these people in there to search a house, correct? Right. Lieutenant Heron is in charge, okay? And you go to a closet to get something. Don't you document where you got it, how you got it? Take a picture of it? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me from that return? Tell the court what a return is. A return is a document that's completed by law enforcement after they execute a search warrant to notify the court of what items were taken during that search. Does it also supposed to indicate to the court where they came from? Uh, I do not, in my 29 years, I don't, I don't believe so. If you've it never is, put if it on, is, you've educated me today. Okay, you, you've never put on anything uh, in a search warrant where it came from. Like on, a, it, on a search warrant or search warrant return? Return. Sorry. On a search warrant return, I would, I've never put anything in there about where something was recovered from. So it's up to the court to, or anybody, we have to guess. I wonder well, where he got that. Well, from that document, you would, but there's a police report that should identify then where those but, items were but, found. But I'm only looking at what you file with the court, the return. Okay. So the court doesn't have any idea where you got any of this stuff, does it? With that document? Yes, sir. With the exception of 3001 Ote Bridge, you're correct. Okay. And that is true for every item that you seize that day. There's no indication where it came from. Well, I mean, I can look at it again, but sure. I didn't complete that document and I didn't seize any evidence. Okay. So but somebody gonna... did. Right. And somebody's required to fill out a return that says, A, where they got it, what it was. Is that correct? So this document that you have here for me to look at is an Indiana State Police property record receipt form, okay. um, which is uh, where you put the item down that you, you know, you, you give the item, and, uh, the item and number, okay. and then you give a description of item submitted, which is right here. Right. Um, but you don't give what, any description. That's what these are, but there's nowhere on this form um, for anyone to put, unless you, I guess you could, you could write in that you found this item here, this item there, but this form is for items submitted sure um, it's, it's like an inventory yeah and it would be helpful to know where you got it wouldn't it in a large house with all this items <coughs> certainly right. it'd be help, helpful but that's going to be documented please report well, it'd be for me it? it'd be very helpful to be technical and say exactly where i got something and what it was correct correct on a police report that's what would be there so you've got seven to eight people going through this house. And Lieutenant Heron is the one that directs where you go. Is that correct? Um, I mean, there's discussion in advance like, okay, we've got this house to search. We have a crime scene technician that's going to photograph everything. Okay. And then we're going to just kind of communicate and, 
and uh, go about it in an organized fashion. And I said, I will go to the basement. Very often what you do, don't you, is you go to a location, you see a piece of evidence, then the crime scene technician takes a picture of what evidence you found. Is that right? Is that correct? Well, yes, but like in this case, the uh, crime scene technician took photos prior to the I search. Understand that. Then the search is conducted, item is found, you notify the crime scene technician who comes down and photographs that item and then ultimately collects it. Did he photograph then uh, every item where it was located? Every item that's on that list? Yes. I do not know the answer, sir. Okay. So we don't have a series of pictures that you know about that would document where the clothing was. Correct? Each item of clothing, uh, I can't say that, no. I, I do not know the answer to that. Okay. And uh, what room did you go to and who was with you? I went to the basement um, as depicted in, in the state's exhibit there. State's exhibits. Okay. And uh, I, I don't remember who went with me initially. Um, what was your role? Just to look for Tom James, suits and apparel. I was provided with a list of uh, items um, with serial numbers next to them that was to be compared to the, uh, say for instance, we find a uh, box of shoes that came from Tom James. It would have a number on that box and we tried to compare that number to the list that was provided to me by Lieutenant uh, Jeff Heron. Um, and those were the items that he would then want to seize. And you indicated that our client, uh, Mr. Noah, was there and directed you into a particular location, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, take a look at the picture that's up on the screen. Uh, that's our state's exhibit number three. Is this one of the rooms you went into? I guess you could say it is a room. It's a, uh, it's a downstairs. Is it part of the unfinished part of that house? There, to the right of that is a um, movie theater. Okay. Um, Which you would say would be a furnished room. I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's a chair and a table in there that's okay. furnished, so it is furnished. Uh, okay. Uh, the walls look like, I don't recall, but from the photo, the walls look like they're concrete. Was the rest of that area as cluttered as this was? No. Okay. Would you call that a cluttered room? A lot of stuff in there. Correct. I would say, I, I, no, I would not. I would say on top of the table, it's yeah. cluttered, but yeah. not that room. I see pictures hanging on the wall. What about um, all those boxes I see some, there on well, the left? They're kind of stacked up. Um, okay. Certainly not as cluttered as what's on the table. Correct. What are the, in the boxes on the left? I don't recall. I believe those are the shoe boxes. Did you go through those? I'm sure I did. Do you don't know? I don't remember. Okay. What's all the stuff underneath it? Uh, don't know. Various items. Okay. And you said that on top of the table it was clothing, shoes, uh, a number of pairs of cowboy boots, a hat, all kinds of things there. Is that correct? I don't believe I said there were clo there was clothing items on top of the table. Um, I don't recall if there was clothing items. Certainly there's sh footwear. Uh, there were belts. You don't know what any of this is underneath the hats? No. Okay. Did you go through these boxes? Um, I may have. How about this black box here? What was in that? I, I don't recall. Okay. Let me ask you this. Did you make it an effort in your search to go through every box in that room. Yeah, so ultimately, after I found that firearm, a gentleman from the State Board of Accounts came down at some point, and someone else, I left the area and went upstairs. And okay. they continued to search uh, by comparing the numbers. So the State Board of Accounts is searching now? Everyone's searching, okay. as we've talked about. You don't know how long you were in here? I don't remember. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Noel told you to go in this room, correct? No, well, I mean, it's, he didn't really say you need to go in this room. He said there are some items here. Well, he's trying to be helpful to you by saying there may be some items. You've told him what you're looking for, and he's indicating where you could go, correct? Correct. Okay. And you indicate that one of the items 
that you were looking for was in that box? I did not. It just happened to be that you went to that box. I ultimately ended up going to that box as I was searching that area. I pulled that chair out, um, and there this box is that has two boxes in it that say Smith & Wesson, which I'm familiar with as being uh, firearms. Is that the way the box looked on State's Exhibit? Yes. Four. Exhibit 4? I believe so. The record. Yes. Okay. All right. And the stuff on the box, or the stuff above the box, was the same kind of stuff that we'd seen at a different angle from State's Exhibit that had been previously shown to you. Yes. Correct. All right. Now, let me ask you, where was Mr. Knoll when you were in that room? I think he had left the residence at that point. Are you sure? Pretty confident he had. Okay. Are you the only one down there when you're searching? Are you not, to, not through the whole entire event that I was down there searching, no. Okay. All right. <clears throat> when was the state police searching in that house before? I believe uh, August 16th. Okay. Uh, and what were they looking for then? Um, bank records. Okay. Was the search previously that you were part of? I was part of that search, yes. That was done the same way? In other words, a number of people went through the house looking for all kinds of items? Same thing, I got a call from Lieutenant Jeff Heron said I need your, your body to assist me in okay. searching. All right. And uh, there were a number of people. And that's what you did? That's correct. Okay. Now you indicated that what you found in that box, it had nothing on top of the box, it just was there, correct? Just like these other boxes. We're talking the box here. The box right there. Four. That exhibit that's seeing them. Right, I believe that depicts it how it was. Okay. And uh, so is that picture taken before you took the weapons out? After. So you take the box out, get the weapons, and then put the box back so they can take a picture? Yeah, so, Your Honor, uh, going through the search, you know, initially there were photographs taken of the entire scene. Uh, then we conduct the search. And as I'm searching, I pull the chair out and I look down and I see the boxes. I open it up, there's in fact a firearm there. Then I went up and notified Lieutenant Jeff Heron of that fact, as well as uh, uh, First Sergeant Merritt Toomey, who's our crime scene guy. We went back down, I pushed the chair back underneath, you know, put the box back. I don't think I took anything out of the box. I think I pulled the chair out, looked, and was like, okay, there's firearms in here, and then pushed it back under, notified them, and then he took that photo. My question to you is, does that picture show before the search or after? That picture there, Exhibit 4, I believe is going to be after the dis my discovery. You had already discovered something, showed Lieutenant Heron, brought it back, put it back and re tried to recreate the scene, and then had him take a picture? I'd like to add, I would like to answer that question, but you say I brought it back. What do you refer to by that? Did you bring the box up to uh, No, I did not. I left it right where it was at. I went and got Lieutenant Jeff Heron, okay. and he came downstairs. And then when you pushed the chair back, that's when you had the photographer take a picture. Correct. Okay. The two boxes that you found inside the large white box, there were weapons in there? They were, yes. Unloaded, I think you testified on. I believe they were. Correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, what was their condition? I think they were brand new. I mean, they appeared to be. They were in, a, they were in their, the box that comes from the manufacturer, it appeared to be. Well, matter of fact, they thought you had a receipt, didn't it? Show when it was purchased. I did not. I'm, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Did you ever look through that box when you turned it over to Lieutenant Heron to find out when they were purchased? I did not. Okay. And you don't recall independently ever seeing a receipt in that box? I don't think so. Okay. What color were those Smith & Wesson boxes? Uh, black and white. Okay. 
You never took a picture of those out of the box. You no. just left them in the box. In other words, you take them out of the box to photograph them that way. Well, I personally, sir, I never took a photograph. Okay. And you don't know what the technician did? Uh, I, I, I do recall him taking the fo photos of those firearms out of the box when they were laid on the ground after, you know, kind of put it in order. I start my search. I pull it out. I see the firearm. Open one up. There's a firearm. I immediately go upstairs and notify Lieutenant Jeff Aaron. He comes down with me as well as Merit, First Sergeant Merritt Toomey. We put it back like that and the photograph's taken. And then Lieutenant Jeff Heron makes the decision that those firearms are ultimately yeah. potentially going to be seized and they're photographed, taken out of the box. But we don't have that photograph. Uh, the one that you show, or at least testified to, that their guns were taken out of the box, put on the floor, and then photographed. I don't have that photograph with me, sir. Okay, and we haven't seen that yet. Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I've not seen it. Okay. I don't know if we have it or not, but All I right. don't. Okay. I'm going to get a new technician. I'm fired. <laughs> He's fired. I'm fired. This was provided. Oh, I wouldn't find you that. Did you not put those in? I did not put that in. Oh. No, I'll just have it. Okay. Yeah. Officer, I'm going to hand you what's been marked for purpose of identification. This is the defendant's exhibit now. Uh, and she's given it. One. Can you identify what's in that picture? I see uh, two Smith and Wesson uh, firearm uh, boxes, and I see two Smith and what, what appear to be Smith and Wesson firearms uh, with two magazines and two boxes, nine millimeter Luger ammo. Does that refresh your recollection uh, of what you saw that day? I believe so. This time, Your Honor, we would offer Defendant's Exhibit 1. No objection, Your Honor. So Defendant's Exhibit Number 1 admitted without objection. May I see you, Mr. Foles? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll give it right back. You can keep it. Well, thank you. <laughs> Two boxes that you previously identified that were inside the larger white box, did you recognize those as what you had seen that day? That certainly, that photograph that you just showed me certainly appears to be similar type okay. items discovered by me on that day. And so those boxes were inside the white box. Correct. And the weapons were inside the black boxes, which are the Smith & Wesson boxes that you testified to. That is correct. And I think the gun was in a cocked position to only show that it was not loaded. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I don't know if that weapon has a hammer on it or not. I, I'd have, I don't well, it looked like it was an automatic. Well, but I mean, well, did you look? At I can't the tell from the photo if it was cocked. The, the slide was back on, <coughs> uh, which would be in a, a safe position. Okay. Did you ever examine the weapons yourself? Um, I did look at them and. I do maybe I don't remember 100% if I remember if the slide was back on them or not, um, but immediately notified Lieutenant Jeff Heron, and then he took over from there. Okay. And the shotgun that you found was kind of standing up in that same room. It was. It was in a box. Okay. But in, uh, shot or barrel up. Right. Officer, I don't believe they. Officer heard. Mitchell, could you could you come to the screen and. Show me where the uh, shotgun was located. I will, Your Honor. Sorry to interrupt, gentlemen. Your Honor, there may, may be another picture that shows it more accurately. Okay. Your Honor, this box right here, there's a, there's a cardboard box here. Yes. Uh, the lid is shut on it on the day that I went, the 13th of March. Uh -huh. 
this if this is the same box. These, uh, they were opened up and there was a shotgun sticking down inside right here. All right. Mr. Hurley says there may be another picture that better shows it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Cross examine or redirect, Mr. Hurdle. Uh, detective, how close were the uh, the shotguns to the uh, two Smith and Wessons that you found? Three feet, approximately. I didn't measure, but very close. Detective, I'm showing you um, State's Exhibit 2. The, the State's Exhibit 2, the, uh, the black barrel, do you recognize that sticking out? Uh, the shotgun barrel sticking out there, I do. And I'm sorry, approximately how close is that to the chair with the uh, boxes of Smith & Wessons? A couple feet, two or three feet. Arms distance from you and I? Yes. That's it, Your Honor. Anything else, Mr. Boyles? No, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you, excuse. Thank you, Your Honor. See release? Yes, sir. Thank you. Officer, I'll remind you not to discuss your testimony with anybody, nor allow them to discuss their testimony with you until this matter has been completed. I understand, Your Honor. You. Call your next witness. Your Honor, say we'll call Derek to me. You may. I can try and retrieve him, Your Honor, but he stepped out. Well, I think he was asked to step out. <laughs> there was a motion. Were you sworn earlier, officer? Yes. You were? Yes. I'll consider you under oath. You may proceed. Proceed to the witness stand. Proceed. Sir, would you state your name for the record? Merritt Toomey. And probably for the record, if you spell, spell your first and last name? First name's Merritt, M E R R I T T. Last name's Toomey, T-O-O-M-E-Y. Uh, Mr. Toomey, where are you employed? Indiana State Police. And what is your current uh, position with the Indiana State Police? I'm a first sergeant in the crime scene section. I'm sorry, how long have you been with the State Police? 32 years and a few months. And has it always been uh, as a crime scene technician, supervisor there? No, I started out as a road trooper, I was a detective, and then I was a crime scene investigator, and then just uh, within the last year and a half, I became the supervisor. Is it appropriate to call you sergeant or first sergeant? What, what's the, I'll uh, answer to either one. <laughs> first sergeant, uh, uh, were you asked to be a part of a search warrant on Tay Bridge? Uh, on March 13th, 2024. I was. Who reached out to you originally? Uh, that would be Lieutenant Heron. Have you worked with Detective Heron in the past ever before or not? Uh, on previous search warrants, I have. Uh, were you familiar with the uh, residents on Tay Bridge? Uh, it was my first time being there. And what was going to be your role on March 13th of this year? I was there to document the, the property. Were you to collect evidence or photograph in any way, shape, or form? I, I was photographing the, the property primarily uh, until uh, some evidence arose uh, that needed to be collected. I want to direct your attention to uh, the basement area. And uh, were you brought down to the basement area to look at, <coughs> photograph, and collect some evidence? I was. And uh, what sort of evidence was that? Uh, there were two guns that were still in boxes. Uh, I'd have to refer to my, my notes to uh, tell you the particulars. Do you recall who uh, directed you to those guns? That would have been uh, First Sergeant Mitchell. Do you work with uh, First Sergeant Mitchell much? I do. Uh, did you photograph those guns? 
I did. Were they in a box or out of, bo of a box when you first saw them? Uh, they were in the, the box that they came in uh, from the company, and then both of those two boxes were inside of another cardboard box. So they were in a, their manufacturer's box? Correct. Inside of another box? Correct. And you photographed those? I did. I'm sorry, Your Honor, if I didn't have space. Two, three, four. I think they're over there. <coughs> we did not have them. We did not have them. Mark. Mark. I apologize. The court has possession of them. I'm showing you what's already been admitted as states two, three, and four were those photographs that you would have taken on March 13th of the area where the uh, two guns were located. Yes. And would that have been prior to you looking, you personally looking in the boxes or post you looking into the boxes? Um, these would have been prior to me looking in the boxes. Okay. And then, Your Honor, if I could have states five also. Oh, I'm sorry, it's defense in one. That, that I believe is with the defense. Oh, here it is. Your Honor, I promise I am not going to hold on to anything. Uh, states well, is, is Mr. Well. exhibit one. Would you have taken that picture with the guns out of the box then? Yes, I did. Thank you. Give them to the court reporter so I don't lose them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you collected those items, uh, First Sergeant? I did. Okay. Were they um, taken to the NSA State Police Post and can be kept in the possession of the State Police uh, since that time? <laughs> yes, sir. Did you bring them with you? I did. If you could please get them out of their um, boxes, please. I'm going to put a sticker on it marked States Exhibit 5 for the first one, the one on top, and States Exhibit 6 on the bottom one. Have those been in continuous custody uh, of the state police, you said, since March 13th? Yes, sir. Um, had they been altered or in any way, shape, or form? Uh, I just sealed the box. Okay, would you seal the box on that day or another day? Um, these would have been taken to the post on uh, the day that we collected them, put into secure storage, and then we uh, would have packaged everything up another day. Are they sealed currently? Yes, they are. Uh, is that with an evidence tape or seal that the state police uses regularly? Yes. Um, is it a lot of trouble for you to unseal them? I, you, you say to open it, open and I will. Please. Let's start with States Exhibit 5. I note that it's in some sort of blue plastic <coughs> bag. Is that something you would have done, or is that how you found that? No, this is the way they, they come from the factory. Okay. Could you take uh, State's Exhibit 5 out of the plastic? I'm going to put it in a safe mode here. Okay. okay. Gun is empty. So. Does that gun appear secure. to be in basically the same condition as when you found it on March 13th? Yes. Okay. If you could, please put it back in the box. and. Just for the record, if you could do the same thing to States Exhibit 6, uh, First Sergeant. Actually, don't put it back in yet. I want to look at it before you put it back in. Yes, sir. And Mr. Boyle may want to. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Your Honor, I'll let Mr. Uh, First Sergeant Toomey open that box while I show the uh, defense counsel statements. If you could do make that gun also safe for uh, first sergeant as well, the same as you did with the uh, safe exhibit five. And does State's Exhibit 6 to be appear to be in the same condition as when you collected on March 13th? Yes. If you could then please replace that back into the, uh, the plastic container, and I will uh, allow the uh, defense counsel to uh, review that as well. Officer Kimmel, was this fingerprinted, or did you intend to have it fingerprinted, or no, anything? Sir. So it's acceptable to touch yes. without contaminating it? If you could put it in the box, uh, first sergeant. Those items. So states exhibit five and six admitted without objection. serial numbers on those two weapons. Do you have that? Yes. Uh, let's look at the uh, first exhibit that you have there. <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay. Are you familiar with the Indiana State Police property record and receipt form? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are you the one that fills it out, or does that then filled out by Lieutenant Aaron? No, I, I took them into evidence, so I would have filled it out. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm looking at item number 2055. Yes, sir. It said that's a sealed cardboard box containing a Smith & Wesson MP shield semi-automatic handgun. Does it have a serial number? It does. And what is that, sir? H, as in Henry, N as in Nora, H as in Henry, 8324. Okay. And there's another item on there, uh, a 2056. Yes, sir. Uh, does that would be an indication of another weapon that was found? <clears throat> yes. And that would also be listed as a Smith & Wesson MP shield semi-automatic handgun? Correct. Does that have a serial number? It does. And what is that, sir? H. Henry and Nora J. John 5682. Now, when you fill out these uh, property record and receipt forms, do you ever indicate on there where the item was found? Uh, when necessary, yes. Okay, can you tell me from that form, to refresh your recollection, does that show where those items were found? Uh, on there, I just have from the basement, uh, from the Knoll basement. Okay, no specific indication that it was on a table, in a box, none of that, correct? Uh, well, 
we use complementary things. <coughs> the photographs work in tandem with the description of okay. things. But if you just had this, you wouldn't have any idea where it was found. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. Were you present on the August search? The August search, the mm -hmm. first? No, sir. You were not there. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for purpose of identification uh, is Defendant's Exhibit 2. I think Mr. Hurdle has no objection and ask you to take a look at this, would you, please? <clears throat> Tell us what that is, if you can discern it from the exhibit. It's a receipt from Midwest Gun Exchange Incorporated from Mishawaka, Indiana. What's it dated? The date is 10-28-2017. Okay. Does it have a list of serial numbers of weapons purchased? Yes. And would those two serial numbers that were purchased from the Mishawaka gun store in 2017 be the same as the two weapons that you previously identified in the state's direct examination? I don't have them memorized. I'd have to look at them again. You certainly can. You've got the weapons and you've got the receipt. So go right ahead. HNJ5682 matches this one. Okay. HNH8324 matches the other one. Okay, so the receipt showing the guns were purchased in Mishawaka in 2017 is supported by the identification both on the receipt and on the weapons with the serial numbers, is that right? Correct. Okay. Let me ask you, you testified on direct examination, something that you noticed was the fact that it was in a manufacturer's packaging. What does that mean? Uh, this box. This is what it came in. Okay. And what about the blue uh, kind of cellophane item that you had the weapon stuck in inside the box? What does that tell you? Uh, that's that's the way it, that's the way I found it inside of the box. So it appeared that that weapon had not been used and never out of the box since it was manufactured, or at least it was purchased. I, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Okay. It, it looks to be in good shape, but. Okay. Do you have the receipt? Or did you put it in the box here? Sorry. There you go. No problem. I've got to give this to the court. I'll get spanked here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Perry. You're welcome, Your Honor. Do you need these anymore? No, sir. You can put them back. All right. Um, And you're, how many people were doing that search, do you remember, at the house that day, for going through the house? I, there was multiple people there. I couldn't tell you an exact number. You went to the room where the guns were found, is that correct? I went through the whole house. So I was in each of the rooms. I want to ask you a question about the particular room where the guns were found in a second, as soon as we get it up on the screen. Taking a look, uh, First Sergeant, at State's Exhibit Number 3, did that appear to be the way the room looked when you were there? Yes, sir. Okay. 
And where did you believe the guns were found? Can you show us, like, from your uh, observation here? Uh, you can see the side of the white cork cardboard box. This one? Yes. Are you pointing to? Okay. And was the table in this array, as you saw it that day, all uh, kinds of other items on that? Yes, sir. It appeared that that's been there for a while, that all those items have kind of been uh, discarded down there? I, that's a possibility. <laughs> it could look like somebody was uh, not using that room a great deal, correct? Because they've got a lot of stuff on the table. It's not like it's being used every day. I've been in a lot of different houses in a lot of different states, sir. <laughs> well, they, they all don't look alike, do they? Correct. <laughs> this looks crowded, correct? Correct. All right. I don't believe I have anything further. Thank you very much. Redirect. No other questions for this witness, Sean? Yeah, and I'll show the Fins exhibit number two. Then. No objection to the uh, receipt uh, that was uh, provided by the defense. Right? Correct. Is this staying with the court or going back with me? <laughs> Officer Toomey, did you examine the shotgun? Examine it? Yes. Uh, we just took a cursory look at it because he was allowed to, to have that. I understand. Was it loaded? Um, I'm not the one who looked at it. Do you, do you recall who it was? No, sir. Do you know what kind it was? It was a police model, but... Most likely a 12 gauge? Yes, sir. You keep a shotgun for personal protection in the basement in this crowded area? Feel free to object to anybody. Is that where you'd keep one? If I, that is not where I would keep it, sir. Only if you're living in the basement. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. The court has no further questions. That <coughs> prompts questions from either side? Not on the court's question, John. No, Your Honor. Officer Toomey, thank you. Is he released from his subpoena? Yes, Your Honor. You're free to go. I'll remind you. Uh, do not discuss your testimony with anybody. Do not allow anybody to discuss their testimony with you uh, until this matter is completed. First Sergeant, I believe the guns need to stay. Yes. Who do I give them to? Miss Lori. Hi, Miss Collada. Do we need to take a break? A break. Three o'clock. We'll be off record. Sir, would you uh, state your full name for the record? Jeffrey C. Heron. And your, uh, spell your last name for the record? H-A-R-E. Uh, Mr. Heron, where are you employed? The State Police. What is your current um, rank or title with the State Police? I'm a lieutenant in charge of investigation for what we call Area 5, which is three different districts in the center part of the state, Buttonville, Pendleton, and Yale. Are you uh, in charge of, uh, I'm sorry, investigations? I am in charge of investigations. I supervise both the who is the lead investigator in the uh, Jamie Mill investigation? I am. And when did you become involved in the Jamie Mill investigation? I originally got the case.
baseball on uh, June 13th, 2023, and I started the investigation in July 13th, 2023. And since um, July of 2023, uh, have you been the affiant on uh, all search warrants? I have. How many are we up to now? 51. Have you been a part of every interview of every witness thus far? I have been, yes. And have you been a part of the arrest of all three individuals in uh, Jamie Knoll, Casey Knoll, and Missy Knoll? Yes, sir, I am. Let's, I want to have a brief discussion. The, uh, the August search warrant of Tay Bridge, were you a part of that? I was the author of that search warrant, and I directed that, but I never actually went to the Tay Bridge location on August 16th. Who is the owner and occupant of the Tay Bridge home back in August of 2023? Jamie Knoll. And was that verified at the time of the warrant? It was, yes. At some point in time, uh, was there an arrest warrant for uh, the defendant, Jamie Hill? Yes, there was. And was he ultimately arrested and had an initial hearing here in this courtroom? He was, yes. Do you remember uh, when the initial hearing was? November 9th, 2023. And at the time of the initial hearing, what was the defendant's place of residence at that time? 3001 Old Tay Bridge, Jeffersonville, Indiana. The same time or the same place that it was in August of 2023? That's correct. Is that the address that he provided to the court at uh, his initial hearing pursuant to the, uh, the IRAS Indiana Risk Assessment? Yes, it is. Were you present for that initial hearing? I was, yes, sir. Were you present when the judge gave Mr. Null his conditions with respect to firearms? I was, yes, sir. Okay, were you in the courtroom specifically then? I was, yes. Um, were you a part of the collection of any firearms? I was on the receiving end of those firearms at the post after they were collected. Now, let's back up just one second. The day of the initial hearing, November of 2023, uh, were you asked either by the court or the parties on that day approximately how many guns there were? I was, yes, by oh, the judge. How many were there? There ended up being, I believe, 82 approximately. And what was your understanding of the court's order at that initial hearing? That Mr. Knoll surrender all firearms except for one shotgun for home defense. And you state that some of those weapons were brought to the Indiana State Police Post. What district? District 45, the Sellersburg Post. Is that something you logged or inventoried personally? No, I was there when they were delivered, but I did not log or inventory them. When you were present, who delivered uh, their guns? So uh, Charlie Moon, um, Bradley Kramer, and also present to observe was a Matt Owens for a period of time. Was Jamie Knoll, the defendant, present? Time. He was not. Do you know where he was at that time? I believe he was still incarcerated or in the process of being released. So the turning over the weapons was something prior to him being released? That was my understanding at the time. Um, since my discussions with Bradley Kramer, I understand maybe he was released slightly early while that was still in the process of going on. And you were there basically as an observer with respect to those guns? Correct. Did somebody from the Indiana State Police log and inventory those? Yes. Do you know who that was or do you recall? So it was Sergeant Andy Taylor, Sergeant Merritt Toomey, and Sergeant uh, Phil D'Angelo with the Indiana State Police. They were the ones that logged those and provided and filled out the uh, property record receipts. And you said that was November 9th, 2023? Yes, sir. Do you know where the defendant moved back to when he was released from incarceration? I, it's my understanding it was 3001 Old Tay Bridge. Now, I want to direct your attention to the um, Tom James search warrant, for lack of a better term. Are you familiar with that search warrant? I am, yes, sir. Who wrote that search warrant? I did. What number of search warrant was that? 45. And just briefly for the court, Tom James is what? It's a uh, high-end uh, clother, clother, a uh, um, tailored custom 
um, outfits, clothing for men and women. And the search warrant itself was to collect what? So it was to collect the, uh, the, the items that were purchased, the men's suits, the belts, the, the shoes. I had, I had attached to the search warrant an exhibit, which was multiple pages of a history of purchases from Jamie Knoll uh, that I had provided the court. It was to re receive those. He had ultimately purchased, I believe, total $183,000 using Utica Fire Department money to, to buy, purchase clothes from Tom James. And, uh, and then I took the last five years for the statute of limitations and used those records in order to seize those items because they were purchased with, uh, ultimately with Utica money, with Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association money, and uh, I was seizing those because they were part of the case. Were you looking for any sort of uh, paperwork, receipts, et cetera, anything else the, for any of those uh, that items or apparel? Right, the documents and the uh, receipts that went along with those, those items. What day did you serve that search warrant? March 13th, 2024. Who was the uh, officer in charge at that scene? I was. Um, who was all present? Roughly how many officers were present uh, on March 13th? I believe we had seven plus the State Board of Accounts. We had two uniformed troopers, uh, four detectives, and then a CSI, and then a State Board of Accounts. Um, Is this agent. something you coordinated or somebody else? I coordinated all of that. Once you received the warrant, did you immediately go to the house? Explain how the uh, March 13th kind of went. So I had, I had, uh, as I was looking through the different American Express purchases, I had saw the $183,000, and so I had contacted uh, Tom James, and I ended up speaking to an attorney for for that business, and then he provided those documents uh, to me, and then he during that conversation he said that uh, Mr. Noel had purchased a a uh, suit of clothing, various clothing on, I believe it was December 22nd, 2000, I believe it was 23, and that those items had not been delivered yet. And then and, uh, he told me later that those items would be delivered on March 13th, 2024. Uh, in the morning, he told me roughly between 9 and 9.30. Let me back, back up one second. He was arrested on November 9th? Correct. You were provided information from Tom James that he used the Utica credit card on December 22nd? Yes. And the suit was going to be delivered on March 13th? Correct. Okay. Um, so, on March 13th, you're at the home or you're waiting for the defendant to be there? So we were told, so I'd, I'd written the search warrant the night before with the exception of the facts that were going to unfold that morning, so I didn't have to write the entire search warrant that morning. We were told that the suit was going to be delivered roughly 9, 9.30 in the morning, and I knew who the, uh, who the uh, salesman was, and that was uh, Jordan Yoakum, and Mr. Yoakum, I had been in contact with him and uh, over the phone, and he'd indicated about 8.50 that morning that he would be there in about 10 minutes, about 9 o'clock. He described the vehicle he was driving, which is a white uh, Lincoln Aviator, and uh, so we had sat, myself and Detective Hanson had sat in our car uh, down the street and we watched for the white Lincoln a Aviator. And as it had, had pulled up, uh, then once it had left, I confirmed that the suit was delivered and then I finished the authoring of the next paragraph of my search warrant and I sent it to the judge. Uh, while that was going on, I'd also called Dave Mitchell that morning and then Merritt Toomey and asked for detectives and uniform officers to stage uh, a couple of miles away so they wouldn't be seen in order to, when I executed the search warrants, they would meet me there at the scene once we decided to execute that and the judge had signed the search warrant. How long did you wait then before you went to the Tabor at home? So our, our initial plan was to wait, uh, obviously, until the search warrant got issued. So, so once it got, got, uh, got signed, we moved a little closer so we could see the front of the house to make sure Jamie Noel didn't leave with that particular suit in question. And so, uh, so once we got a little closer, uh, we saw him come out and, and open the door of a silver uh, Mercedes Benz, and when he did, we thought he was possibly getting ready to leave. It looked like he was getting into the car, and so I, I went ahead and pushed it up. My original thought was I was going to allow for a little bit of time to go by to not burn or to not uh, 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 put Mr. Yoakum uh, in front of, uh, of, of everybody having, having said that he cooperated with state police because he was concerned about it. Once you got to the, uh, the home, was there anyone outside then? 
So once we pulled up a, a little farther away door, at the intersection there to where we could actually see the house, we saw Mr. Knoll come out. When he did, he got in the car. At that point, I called uh, Detective Mitchell and, uh, and Sergeant uh, Toomey and said, come on, bring everybody down. We're going to go ahead and execute the search warrant. And so we, we me and Detective Hanson pulled in uh, to the driveway there. At that point, Mr. Knoll was still out by the uh, silver Mercedes Benz and we confronted him. I explained to him that I had a warrant that I wanted to read to him and then I, I, uh, I got relatively close to him and then I read him the warrant verbatim. Uh, so he understood what we were searching for and then I provided him a copy of the list of the items we were searching for. Was there anyone else outside the home from the, uh, the house? Not from the house, no. And did you, once you read him the warrant, provided him a copy of the warrant, did you go in? We waited, he said, uh, I asked him if anybody else were in the house. He said that both of his daughters, uh, Casey and Gracie, were inside of the residence. I said, would you please call them? He called them on the phone with, my, with me being present there. He asked them to get their belongings together and come on out. After about eight to 10 minutes, they still hadn't emerged from the house. I said, I think it's best that we go in. And so Mr. Knoll said, hey, let me, I will show you where these items of clothing are, where, where I keep them. Uh, and so he actually led the way and we went into the house. We entered into the kitchen. Uh, as we entered in the kitchen, he walked over to the basement door he opens the basement door. He yelled for Casey to come out. Um, he, I apparently didn't know where she was at. And then Casey and Gracie came down the stairs from upstairs. And then at that point, we asked them to get their belongings and leave, and they did. And then he, after they left, he walked us down uh, and showed us the suit that he just received, which was now on the couch uh, in the living room. And then he walked us into the master bedroom and walked us around there and showed us where his different closets were. And, uh, and then, he, uh, then he turned and walked out and then we walked down into the basement uh, and he showed us where other items were in the basement, which was over by that table that we've been talking to this, this afternoon. Did uh, you detain the defendant there at the time then or not? I told him he was free to go. Did he leave? He eventually did left. He left at, uh, we served the warrant at about 10.34, 10.35 in the morning and he left at about 10.50. So he, let, he stuck around about 15 to 16 minutes. Were Casey or Gracie detained at all? They were not. They were told they were free to leave. They actually went outside for a minute, and then they asked, uh, Detective Hanson went out, and they asked, uh, Casey asked if she'd get additional items of clothing, and he escorted her back in, and then she went back out and stayed until, I believe, Mr. Nolan came out and uh, got into his Mercedes Benz. Once you started the search, had they already left? To an error. He actually got into a BMW. Once we started the search, um, yes. Well. Merit to me, I had directed him to take photographs all around the house, which is standard procedure. And then once we got into the house, uh, once it was secure and we figured there was nobody else in there, then he had started his uh, photography throughout the house. Who determined who was going to search in which room of the home? We were all standing in the kitchen. We say, oh, that was the, the uniform detectives, or uniform officers and the detectives, and I broke them up into teams. Uh, I sent Detective Mitchell, and, uh, or, or First Sergeant Mitchell, and, uh, and uh, James Donahoe and Chris Hansen down initially with him into the basement. And then uh, um, the other detective, which your name escapes me, and then one of the, the uh, uniformed troopers into, the, into Mr. Knoll's bedroom to start doing a search. I provided both of them with copies of the list of the different items we were looking for and explained to them on those particular items. If I had been having gone actually to met me with the attorney, he had showed me that on the inside pocket, each one of these uh, particular suits uh, were monogrammed, it had Jamie's old name on it, it had a lot number and a series of other numbers, and a lot of those numbers correlated with those documents that we had, so we were able to seize what we believed to be those exact items on that list. And you provided them lists? I provided both of them lists, both teams list. Were you, did you designate yourself to a particular area, or were you kind of uh, monitoring what was happening? Because I was a supervisor, it was my, my crime scene or my, my case, I, I, I moved around throughout the, throughout the day. Roughly how long after the search started did Detective Mitchell contact you about uh, the basement? Uh, probably 20 minutes or so. He, uh, he uh, contacted me and said, hey, I, find, I found a couple of firearms down here. Uh, would you come down here and take a look? And did you go to the basement? I did. Detective, I'm showing you what's up in Mark for identification purposes, States Exhibit 7. Okay. Do you recognize uh, that diagram? This is a diagram I asked uh, Detective Hansen to make of the basement of the, of the uh, 3001 Old Tay Bridge, Jamie Knowles residence. And does it give a 
obviously not to scale, but does it give an accurate depiction <coughs> of the, uh, the layout of the basement? It, it, it does. It's not to scale, but it does to me that having been through that basement, it does lay out a, uh, and that's it is an accurate description of the basement. Your Honor, Your Honor. State, it states Exhibit 7. Yeah. I think I heard Mr. Boyle say no objection. No objection, Your Honor. States Exhibit 7 and maybe for motion purposes. Now, if, if you could, without the aid of uh, defend, defendant, I'm sorry, States Exhibit 7, walk the judge to the location of the uh, firearms that Detective Mitchell pointed out to you. As you walk down the stairs to the basement, um, the first room you enter will be uh, a, a finished uh, open room. There's a bar off to one side. And there's a there's a there's a uh, I'm sorry a, uh, um, a living room with furniture and everything. And then there's ultimately a, 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 an exit door and a patio out to go ultimately to the pool of the residence. And then if you continue to walk straight, and that's what I did, knowing I'd been down there just a moment before with Mr. Noel. If you walk straight, you go into your right is a movie room, and off to your left, there's like a little sitting area a table. Uh, with a lot of items on top of the table off to your left hand side and then there's like a, a curtain where there's some some uh, HVAC system and I think believe a sump pump and things like that there's one of those blinds set up there. Were there any um, bedrooms located in the basement? There was but uh, before when you enter that main living room as soon as you go down the stairs off to the left there's a bedroom and I believe that was Casey's bedroom is where that was where, off to the left. And um, from the base of the steps in the basement Approximately how far were the was the table, chairs, and firearms ultimately located? So the room is probably 15 foot wide, maybe a little bit wider. So 15 feet from the base of the stairs, then into that room where the table is, and so then another five or six feet. And once you enter into that room, off to the left is the table. Once Detective Mitchell got in there, did you observe the? Uh, the firearms and the boxes that they were contained in, I believe, states exhibits five and six, the Smith and Wessons. I did. He he showed me and said, "Hey, I look. I, I pulled this out, meaning the chair out. I saw I saw this white box, and on the top of that box, uh, you could clearly see uh, a Smith and Wesson box, which I recognized as being a a uh, firearm box." four pages titled States Exhibits 8 and 9. You stated that you were present for the initial hearing of the defendant on November 9th. Yes. And do States Exhibits 8 and 9, what are they? Uh, so States Exhibit 8 is an order directing the transport and retention of certain firearms of the defendant. States Exhibit 9 is order on initial hearing. The firearms that were collected on March 13th, roughly a, a month ago, um, were those shotguns? No, we collected two pistols, two semi-automatic 9mm Smith & Wesson pistols. Did you collect those based on these orders and the verbal order from the judge on November 9th, 2023? Yes. So I was present in the court when that order, order was issued by the judge. As During the search for our items of clothing receipts, we found those two firearms. I immediately thought that that would be contraband, so I asked for further uh, instructions from you. Uh, but uh, it was all my intentions because of hearing the judge's order, I uh, was going to seize those items. And I did ultimately direct that those be seized. No objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, I believe probably the court could probably take judicial notice, but the state would move to admit states exhibits eight and nine, the court's orders and the felony clause. So states exhibits eight and nine admitted. Did you also note a, uh, a shotgun located in the basement? I did. Is that something that uh, you collected? I did not collect. I did not have an order to be collected. I, again, I was present for the judge's order that <clears throat> Mr. Noel retained one shotgun. Uh, before we left, I made sure we did not find any other firearms 
and therefore that was the shotgun that I believed he was legally entitled to own or by the court, so I, I left that. Can you describe the shotgun to the court? I believe it was a pump shotgun, still had a tag on it, uh, was not loaded, and it was sitting, uh, it was in a box, and you could see the barrel sticking out, and I believe you had a picture of it earlier. So the, the exhibit that was admitted through uh, Detective Mitchell, you would agree that that appears to be uh, true and accurate of how you saw it that day also? Yes. The, uh, the two Smith & Wesson in the boxes, do you know if they were loaded at the time? They were not loaded. Uh, did you physically take them out of the boxes, examine them at all, and look at them? So Sergeant Toomey initially took them out. I did pick them up while he had them out after he was done taking photographs, and I, I got the serial numbers off them, and then ultimately called um, who I believe to be the seller of that firearm in order to verify that those were owned by Mr. Knoll. The defendant uh, admitted an exhibit or receipt uh, for those two weapons, and, and you were in the courtroom here just a little while ago when, when that happened. Yes. So is that your findings as well? They were purchased from, uh, I believe, Midwest Guns? Midwest Exchange, yes. And I, I got all the paperwork associated with that, including the 4473s, which is the federal document which the purchaser has to fill out, including their name and, and a list of questionnaires, and it including this, included the serial numbers that were mentioned today included those two firearms. Was there any ammunition found at the home? There was. Was that ammunition um, seized as well? It was not seized. Um, to my knowledge, the judge didn't say anything about not having possession of, of uh, ammunition, so I did not seize that. It was nine millimeter ammunition uh, is still in the box. How long have you been with the state police? 35 years. And can you just tell us the, uh, the different roles you had with the state police or ranks? So I started out in, uh, in uh, November of uh, 2000, 1990, 1988, goodness, goodness. <laughs> sorry. I started out in November uh, 1988. I was a road trooper until uh, out of the Indianapolis Post, and then ultimately out of the Putnamville Post until uh, um, October of 95. Then I became a detective, a district detective, worked Putnamville District, three counties. Uh, and then from there, uh, 2000, I got promoted to investigative squad sergeant in the Indianapolis Post until 2005. And then I got, I got promoted to uh, district investigative commander of the Putnamville Post until 2016, and then I've held the current position, which is Area Investigative Commander, from 2016 until now. And, and so 29 years of being a detective, and then uh, seven years as being a, ish of being a, uh, a uh, road trooper. How many people did you say report to you? I believe it's 25, I think. I'd have to add up. 25 plus three civilians. Um, as a supervisor and 30 plus years on the, uh, the state police, um, have you ever been asked to enforce court orders? Yes. Do you ever disregard court orders? Uh, not intentionally, no. What if your employees disregard court orders? Uh, they are instructed that's part of their duties, and if, if we, depending on the situation, they ultimately would get written up, and then we possibly look into the situation, and they could face disciplinary action, depending on the degree of what they, they did or didn't do. Is a subpoena to come to court a court order? Yes. Somebody would disregard a subpoena, would that be important? Yes, they can get in trouble. Disciplinary possibility? Possibly. You worked the road for a period of time. I did, occasionally still put on the uniform. Ever stop anybody for a uh, traffic violation? Hundreds, if not thousands. Judge, I'm gonna object to the relevancy now. That doesn't do much to do with the March. Yes, sir. Your Honor, the relevancy is um, the, the issue of the defendant being a law enforcement officer for nearly 30 years working the road, stopping people. And I'm sure at times there were people who denied ownership of contraband, who said it wasn't mine, who point to somebody else in the home, or I didn't know it was there. And I'm merely trying to uh, 
elicit that from this witness. Judge, those are relevant because we don't know any of the facts of those cases. <coughs> it's, it's speculation, clearly. Well, many of the years he was supervisor, he wasn't on the road. He's only been on the road seven years. But oh. as it contains this issue for this court, he has no evidence that he could indicate to the court. It's all speculation of what he may have done or what somebody may have done in the past. Mr. Erdahl, I'll sustain that objection, but I get the point. All right. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Did you examine the other items on that table, uh, Detective? Some of them. Did they appear to be men's, women's, or could you even tell? A lot of them were men's, and a lot of them were items that were listed on our on the documents that I provided. Was there Tom James uh, apparel, shoes, clothes, etc., located in that general area by that table? So there were items. So when you say Tom James, so on that list there was like different brands of shoes that weren't specifically Tom James, but they were sold by Tom James. And there was belts, seven eight hundred dollar belts or eight hundred nine hundred dollar shoes that were were listed on that itemized list that were sold by Tom James. I don't recall there being a suit that was specifically a Tom James brand suit on that table around that. But again, those other items were around. I don't believe I have any other questions for this witness. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Please, the court. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, let's go back a little ways in time. August 16th of 2023. Uh, did you have an occasion to be involved in the search of uh, Mr. Knowles' home on that day? I was the author of the search warrant and was directing that. Uh, Bill Dalton was ultimately in charge of that, and I never went to Mr. Knowles' house. You never went there that day? That day. But you were in charge of either getting the search warrant or putting items that you thought would be appropriate in that search warrant to be asked to be seized. Is correct. That correct. Yes. Uh, was one of those items weapons? No. You didn't ask for any weapons at that time, did you? You asked for books and records. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, how many people went on that search? On August the 16th? Yes, sir. Approximately 40. In different locations. We had four different locations. Mr. Knowles. Let's talk just about the house. I would have to go back and look at my notes, but I believe I, I sent four or five in each team. Okay. Um, and when you send a team to a particular location, because now you've got four locations, 40 people, do you suggest to the team what they're supposed to look for and where they're supposed to look for it? I give them a copy of the search warrant. I had a briefing that morning, explained to them what the search warrant entailed at each location, made sure there was an OIC officer in charge of, of each scene, and explained the process of processing the, processing the different house, the whole barn, whatever, the fire stations, and what items were allowed to be seized and what I was looking for. Were you looking for boxes that had receipts? We were looking for anything that had bank records. I mean, if, if a box had a receipt in it or You'd a bank record. You'd wouldn't it? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be an item that you would want to look at, correct? Sure. Okay. Uh, and on August 13th, you took pictures of areas in the house, or somebody within <coughs> this team of 40 people took some pictures, or the evidence technician at some point took pictures. Not on August 13th, on August 16th we did. You got the date wrong, Mr. Wells. Yeah. Did you take pictures? They did. Okay. Who suggested that? It? it wasn't a suggestion. It was I was telling them to do it, and they did it. Okay, and uh, you asked them to be thorough in their process, didn't you, about taking pictures and getting those receipts and things that the warrant requested? Yes. Okay.
May I approach John? You may. Lieutenant, ask you uh, to take a look at this photograph, which has been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 3. Ask you, can you identify that? That is a picture of the basement at Jamie Knowles Residence 3001 Old Tate Bridge. That's a picture of the basement as you come down the stairs and look to the left and the table that I've been explaining. Is that the picture that you sent to uh, Mr. Stewart on uh, August or April the 8th? It's one of the pictures, yes. And so that's a picture you're familiar with and you, uh, I think we requested it and you sent it over. I did? Okay. Yes. Uh, could you look at that picture and indicate, is there a white box located in that picture? Uh, yes, it's uh, okay. on top of the chair, uh, it's pushed in under the table. Okay, and that's the white box that we've talked about that was the white box where the weapons were found in March, is that correct? That appears to be correct, yes. Okay, so on August the 16th with all these people, uh, some of which were directed to go to the home of Mr. Knoll and search for documents, correct? Correct. And you indicated to me earlier that boxes were important, that they may contain receipts and all kinds of things that you thought or that people doing the search would be interested in to comply with the search warrant, correct? Yes. Okay. And that white box was there on August the so when that search was conducted, on August, August the 16th, based on the picture, I wasn't again at the scene, sure. based on the picture and what I've been told. It, Did anybody ever tell you that they went through the box on August 16th to look for receipts? And oh my gosh, we found Smith & Western weapons. Uh, I had a discussion with both uh, First Sergeant Mitchell. No, just to answer my question. Well, I'm trying to. Did anybody ever tell you that they went through that box on August 16th to look for receipts? The answer would be, they told me they went through multiple boxes, multiple okay. rooms, and they found multiple weapons. Sir, and so multiple boxes would be really all the boxes that would be important that are hiding receipts in that very crowded room, correct? Could be, sure. Okay, but you're not there, so you're trusting them to do a complete search. Right. Okay, and were weapons located in the house that day? I was told yes. Okay, and where were they? Throughout the house. Okay, and were they picked up? No, it was not subject to my search warrant. Okay, so the weapons were left in the house? Correct. Okay. But all the receipts that you believed were in the house that were important were taken on that search? Unless we missed some, yes. Sure. Well, you would assume, would you not, that that box, that white box sitting on the chair which was there in August, would have been looked through by somebody in order to look for receipts. It's a box, it's open, it's along with other boxes, and we're looking for receipts, so you never know where receipts go. You would have looked through that. Wouldn't the team have looked through that? I would assume so. Okay. Did anybody ever tell you on August the 17th, the next day, oh, by the way, we found two Smith & Wesson's weapons in that box? No, but the box didn't come up. Okay. And again, they told me that there was multiple firearms throughout the house. They told me a, a number of different things. They described the inside of the residence because I wasn't there. Well, if they had found a weapon, the rest of the house, they would have said something to you. Oh, by the way, when we're looking through receipts, we found two Smith & Wesson boxes in the basement in a white box on a table with all kinds of other stuff. No, they would not have. Okay. They wouldn't have told you that. No, they wouldn't have. Yeah. It was immaterial. It's just a Smith & Wesson box, and we're only looking for receipts, so we're not going to mention it to the lieutenant. Correct. But you did find weapons. Well, again, they mentioned it to me. They said, hey, there's a bunch of firearms in the house. Throughout the house, there were firearms. Okay. So you said leave them there. No problem. Correct. We're not looking for guns. We're looking for receipts. Right. Okay. So you were asked on direct that those weapons were purchased in 2017, correct? I don't believe you asked me when the exact purchase was, but it was, they were. October of 2017. The firearms were purchased according to the receipt I, I received from Mr. Morrison at Midwest Gun Express Exchange, said that they were purchased on October 28, 2017. In uh, what city? 
of Mishawaka, Indiana. However, I believe, and I haven't verified that yet, um, some of the firearms, especially the ones he bought with the American Express Utica card, were shipped to Keesler's police supply, even though they were purchased via the phone and paid for, they were then shipped to Keesler's police supply and then they were ultimately paperwork was done there and then they were receded over to Mr. Knoll. But the two we're interested in were identified by, by First Sergeant Mitchell as being purchased on the 17th, 2017. Correct. Those were purchased on 2017, but ac actually where they were obtained from, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure. They could have been obtained actually from Keesler's <coughs> police supply here in Jeffersonville, Indiana. I know they were bought at, at up in Mishawaka. And you know that they were still, according to Lieutenant Mitchell, in their original supply packages. It appeared to be, yes. Okay. You believe that to be true, and so does Lieutenant Mitchell, or Sergeant Mitchell. I didn't yeah. mean to promote him. <laughs> That's Carter's problem. Uh, is that correct? That he was promoted? Or what was the question? <laughs> the question was that First Sergeant Mitchell testified to the court that it was his opinion from his firearms experience or background as a documenter of material for the state police that those appeared to be in their original packaging. They did, yes. That's the that's the picture. Has this been admitted? It's, it is the same. It's the same. Yes. Your Honor, just for the record, I wanted to be clear that this is a picture taken from the August Correct. search. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. And not from the March. Correct. Okay. I have no objection to that, Judge. All right. Show me. <coughs> Lieutenant, I'm going to have you look at the screen. Uh, that is a picture that has been introduced by the state. Is that white box that was picture taken in March of 2024 appear to be the same white box that was in your picture in August of 2023? Yes. I have no further questions. Thank you, sir. Redirect. No other questions, Your Honor. Officer Heron, you got to remember I'm from Washington County. Yes, sir. What in the hell does an $800 belt look like? Um, I was a little surprised at that myself. But, um, he had a number of those. It looked pretty normal to the same kind of belt that I wear, which is about 30 bucks, but uh, didn't look a whole lot different. And uh, Mr. Boyle suggested that the shotgun in the basement would be an appropriate place if someone lived there. Did it appear as if Mr. Knoll was living in the basement? No, it appeared he lived upstairs in the bedroom because that's where his <coughs> personal effects were, his, his uh, clothing was, his, his coat that he retrieved from in there. It looked like he was living upstairs in the master bedroom. That prompts questions from anyone? Not from the state, Your Honor. I have one question. Yes, sir. The shotgun still had a tag on it. It was brand new, didn't it? It did, yes. When was it purchased? I don't know the answer to that. Where did it purchase from? I, I would have to look at my records and see. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Oh. Mr. Hurdle? Your Honor, the state doesn't have any more witnesses. No. Do oh, you sorry. have any other I'm, questions? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <coughs> I have no other questions. You. you didn't happen to ask him where the shotgun was that I allowed him to keep for personal protection, did you? I did not ask him that, no. Uh, that prompts any further questions? No, Your Honor. Officer Heron, you may step down. Thank you, Judge. Any other witnesses, Mr. Hurl? No, Your Honor. Just a moment. Break just go, a moment? Just a moment before we go forward. How do you define a moment, Mr. Love? Judge, I'm a lawyer. You know that. I know. So as go much, back. As much go, as a go moment. Go to the back. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we can just have a moment to check and follow it. All right. Thank you, Judge.
Yes. All right. Back on the record. Call your next. Call your first witness, Mr. Wilder. Your Honor, we call Brandon Kramer. Mr. Kramer, you were sworn earlier, correct? Pardon? You were sworn earlier? No, sir. You were not? Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury testimony about to give and leave the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Your Honor. Have a seat. Thank you. Answer counsel's questions, and the court may Thank have you. some questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Kramer. Good afternoon. So you're here, and you understand why you're here to ask some questions or answer some questions regarding some events that took place uh, back in November 19th, 2023, correct? Yes, sir. So prior to did that we, day, did we have him identify himself for the record? Well, I thought everybody knew Brad. Did you state your full name for the record? Bradley Kramer. And uh, I'm not asking any other person. That's fine. That's fine. So Bradley, you're here as a result of some things that took place on November 9th of 2023, correct? Yes, sir. And that was a day that uh, Mr. Knoll was arraigned, his initial hearing occurred in this courtroom, right? Yes, sir. And you were here? Yes, sir. And as a result of your being here, you were asked uh, to go to the home that he lived lives in with his wife on Old Tate Bridge Road, right? Yes, sir. And you were asked to go there. Uh, to uh, retrieve the firearms that were in the home, right? Yes, sir. And you, why did you need to go retrieve the firearms? At that point in time, I believe it was the, the court's order that all of his firearms needed to be removed from his home aside from uh, one shotgun, I believe. And uh, I went to the house to retrieve those items. In, in fact, the one shotgun that you were aware that Mr. Noll was allowed to keep, you saw that in the basement? Objection. Did you see the shotgun in the basement? I saw a shotgun in the basement, yes. Yeah. Okay. And that was on November 9th? Yes. Okay. And you left it? Yes. Because you understood the judge allowed the shotgun to be left? Yes. And when you say you saw it in the basement, We've heard a lot of testimony. There's an area in the basement that's kind of unfinished, right? No, it was not in that room, no, sir. Okay, where was it? Uh, it was in the finished portion of the basement. Where the table? Near near that the, the table, yes. Near the table where all the boxes are. Yes, sir. Okay. If, if I could, Ms. Fleming, could you put the... See, I've never seen that before. So. I, I, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out how we end up with this show. But we need to. Okay. So this has been put in. This is a photograph that's been put into evidence, Mr. Kramer. Uh, is can you tell us? Are you familiar with, or is that something that you recognize? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what it is that you recall that to be. Um, it it is a table with stuff on it. Where at? Uh, in the basement of of Jamie Knoll's house. Okay, and this is is this the area where you saw the shotgun that you left? Uh, yeah, I believe so. It was in that general vicinity. Yes. Okay. And so you, your purpose was to to go to gather up the firearms. Yes. And you went with somebody, right? Yes, sir. It was Mr. Moon. Yes, sir. Somebody you didn't know. No, sir. And. You and Mr. Moon went in the house. Yes, sir. And you were going through the home to get the guns. Mm -hmm. And while you were doing that, Mr. Noel, Jamie called you on the phone as well. Yes, sir. Telling you where guns were located. Yes, sir. Where did, when you went down there in that area, were there guns other than that shotgun that was left down in that general area? Yes, sir. Can you tell, tell the judge about what guns were just there. Um, I don't recall exactly how many the quantity. I didn't keep an inventory of where I found uh, what guns, uh, but there were several boxes of unopened, I don't know, 
I guess, rifles. I, I don't know if they were rifles or shotgun, but uh, longer guns. Um, and I don't specifically remember if there were handguns near or, or around that, that area, because there was quite a bit of guns that were retrieved that day. And when, you, when there was a box with a, a gun in it, shotgun, you said? Box there was a boxes, unopened boxes with long guns in them. I don't know if there were shotguns or rifles. Did you open the boxes? No, we just took the boxes. Took the boxes. Yes. And then uh, Detective Herod previously testified there were about 82 guns that were brought to the state police post. Okay. And, and you, you and Mr. Moon brought those guns to the state police post, correct? Yes, sir. Do you have a recollection of when you were there? Retrieving those guns, if you saw this white box? No, sir, I don't. I understand. Mr. Kramer, when you were asked to assist in collecting all of the guns in the house, you knew that was a pretty important request. Yes, sir. Why was it important, in your opinion? Because uh, the court ordered it. <laughs> and when you were there trying to get all the guns that were in Mr. Knowles' house, you looked for them and tried to find them, right? No, sir. I didn't search for anything, if that's the, the correct verbiage. I was directed towards areas where guns may be. Okay. And, and when you say you didn't search, you didn't search in your in the professional sense of search. Y yes, sir. It's not something if in a professional capacity, being a law enforcement officer if, in the past, like it's not like how I would necessarily I wouldn't consider what I did a search. Thank you very much, Mr. Kramer. Mr. Herbert, cross examination. Who directed you, uh, Mr. Kramer, uh, to the locations of the guns? Uh, Jamie did. And that was via telephone, yep. FaceTime, Zoom, what, what, what was it? Just telephone, yes, sir. Okay, so if he told you to look in a closet, you looked in a closet. If he told you to look in a drawer, you looked in a drawer. If he told you to look um, in the bedroom, you looked in the bedroom? Yes, sir. I think that's all I have. Mr. Wild, redirect. Yes, sir. And when you were being directed to where the guns were, Mr. Null told you there were guns up in the bedroom, right? Yes, sir. And you went up to the bedroom, and there they were. Yes. And you got those. Yes. And he directed you that there were guns in that area as well, right? Yes, sir. And you went there, and you found guns there. Yes, sir. So. Where Mr. Knoll directed you and told you there were guns, there were guns there. Yes, sir. And you collected them. I collected the, the guns that I saw, yes, sir. And you felt like you got them all? I felt like I got the guns where he directed me to find them. Yeah. And he directed you and told you that there were guns here. Objection. Take your objection. He didn't state. Told to go there by Mr. Knoll. I, I think there's a mischaracterization of the testimony. If you could rephrase the question. Thank you. So, when Mr. Knoll was talking to you about where the guns were, right? Yes, sir. Did he tell you there were guns down in that part of the basement? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Knoll directed you to where the guns were and you found guns in that area? Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And no further questions. Mr. Hurdle? No, Thank you, Mr. Kramer. You're, is he excused? You're, you're on a wheel, though, quick. Nothing from the state, Your Honor. You're free to go. Thank you, sir. Uh, if you leave the courtroom, I will direct you not to discuss your testimony with anybody, nor allow them to discuss their testimony with you or anything else about this matter until this matter is completed. I would very much like that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Lyle. Thank you, Jack. Call your next witness. <coughs> uh, Your Honor, we don't have any further witnesses.
Yes, sir. No further witnesses? None, Judge. State? Any rebuttal? Yeah, yeah. You like to make argument? How, how could I imagine? You me. You can go first. I'll let Thanks. you start the proceeding. Your Honor, um, the state's exhibits that were put into uh, evidence, specifically the orders by the court, they didn't direct Brad Kramer or Charlie Moon to do anything. They directed Jane Knoll to do what needed to be done. To remove all weapons out of that house, out of his property, except one shotgun. The court was abundantly clear. It was court order. It was recited in a number of documents, order on initial hearing, and then an order directing the transport and retention of certain firearms. Designee, surrender all firearms. He was the one subject to court order. Not Kramer, not Moon, not anybody else. Him. The initial hearing was in November. The search warrant for Tom James was March 13th. 125 days, and the evidence today was that he was living there. So for 125 days, he's in and out of that house. And so when he's in and out of that house, not once did he look around and say, I wonder if Brad Craven got all the guns. I wonder if Charlie Moon got all the guns. For 125 days, he could have picked up the phone, called his lawyer, picked up the phone, called it, called community corrections, called the court and said, hey, I've got two guns here. They missed them. I don't want to get in trouble. This guy's a law enforcement officer for 20-some years with the state police, two terms as the sheriff. He knows what a court order is, and the responsibility is on him and no one else. The evidence was, was rather clear. The shotgun was right by these weapons. His clothing was there. He directed him to there. He directed him to the bedroom where the Tom James clothing was. Did he forget? It doesn't matter if this gun was brand new, five years old, an antique gun. The court did not specify in its order that the gun had to be in good operating order. The gun had to be loaded. The gun had to be unloaded. The gun had to be in his bedroom. The gun had to be in his dresser drawer by his bed. None of those things happened. It was his responsibility, and the court, again, made it clear that that's what he was responsible for and no one else. The defense wants to talk about the issue of didn't they look at these boxes back in August? Didn't they see these Smith & Wesson boxes? And it really doesn't matter. These firearms were not subject to a search warrant and maybe they did open up the boxes and they see two firearms in it. The detective's going to say, put them back. Who cares? It doesn't matter because they were not subject. He was in lawful possession of those firearms at that time, not until the court issued its order in November did it become a violation of the court order and subject to contempt possibilities. The court filed this sua sponte, the court filed a rule to show cause based on a warrant return by Detective Heron. He's been entitled to due process, that's what this hearing is for. He's had his due process, he's had his chance to say, this is why I shouldn't be held in contempt. That's not happening. Willful, intentional disobedience of a court order. That, that's what's happened here. Not an oversight, not an overlooking. Maybe, maybe there was an oversight on Brad Kramer. So what? It doesn't matter. The responsibility bears on him and him alone, and uh, the accountability bears on him and him alone. So I'd ask the, uh, the court to find him in indirect contempt for the violation of the court's order, that the burden has been met, 
and the state would ask the court to uh, to choose how best to deal with the uh, the violation and the, uh, the contempt. Thank you, Mr. Hurdle. Please, Please the court. Are Thank you, you from the team that's going to argue? Yes, sir. Proceed. Thank you, Judge. I think it. Mr. Hurdle says it doesn't matter, but it does matter. Uh, willful intent to violate a court order uh, is exactly what it means. A willful activity on his part to violate the court order. As I recall that when Mr. Uh, Noel was incarcerated and before the court permitted him to be out on bond, he would have had to assure this court that all weapons we're out of the house except for a shotgun. So he wasn't free to go to his house and go through all of those weapons. And so he did what, under those circumstances, would be a reasonable, ask people who, one of whom was in law enforcement, one of whom was a gentleman that Mr. Moon, who Mr. Kramer did not know, but they volunteered to go out and assist Mr. Noel in his responsibilities to this court in getting all those weapons. And they did that. Uh, and all those weapons were turned over to the state police. Now we know that in August, the state police had the photograph of the exact box in question in this case. Uh, and Mr. Hurdle may be right that they went through and they noticed, but nobody at least made note because the weapons apparently weren't of any interest to anybody until after Mr. Knoll was being arrested and required to turn them into the court. But if the state police knew that those weapons were in the house, they could have said, wait a minute, I think that theirs were missed because we're counting all the weapons and those Smith and Wessons were in that box downstairs when we're looking for documents, weren't there. Do people make mistakes? Of course they do. But we know that those guns have been purchased since 2017 and they're in the same box, haven't been disturbed, haven't been out, haven't been touched, or at least no indication that they have by the state police themselves. We know that the court permitted him to have a shotgun, brand new, sitting in the basement. This does not rise itself, in my mind, to a fact that this is a willful contempt of this court order. I think that it was an inadvertent, would I have done it differently? May very well have done it. I may have had someone else that I thought would be better, an independent person, to go to the house to make those choices about what was there and what wasn't there. Obviously it's a room that doesn't get much attention because everything in the room was packed as if nobody has been in that room for quite some time. So I think that the argument that we're making would be that this is not a willful attempt of Mr. Knoll to violate this court order. Was it inadvertent? Yes. Did he apologize for having those weapons there when he thought all of the weapons in the house had been accounted for except the one that this court permitted him to have? I don't believe, Your Honor, this has risen to a level of contempt of this court order. And we would respectfully ask the court to not find so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. <clears throat> Determination whether the alleged contemptuous act was committed with the intent to show disrespect or defiance as a factual matter. to be determined by the court. Our Supreme Court has held that the respondent, Mr. Knoll, has the burden of establishing that his failure to obey the order was not willful. I told Mr. Knoll, don't do anything stupid. Do not try to deceive me, defy me, you will not like the consequences. Today is that day. You are not the law. 
You don't interpret the law. You don't enforce the law. You're not above the law. I find that you have, that you are in contempt of this court. Take him into custody. No, that's enough. I'll find you guys in, dis in contempt for disrupting the proceedings, and you'll be there right there with him. Now, what is an appropriate sanction? The question is, I can sentence him up to 180 days without a trial, or I can sentence him to a day, or I can release him. You know what I think the answer is? 60 days in. That's what I think it is, the answer is today. Now, Mr. Wilder. Yes, Your Honor. Or Mr. Boyles. I apologize, Mr. Boyles, your lead. Before he is released, I, I'll take your suggestion. I want an independent individual to scour that household to determine that there's no further weapons. I find it. Mr. Hurdle's original argument that he's trying to make that I sustain, an officer, an officer of the law, every time I go into court, I hear, I didn't know it was there, I didn't know it was there, it really didn't. You've heard that a million times. You've heard it a million times and yet you still take him into custody would be my guess. Every officer in the world has heard, I didn't know it was there, it's my friends. I'm not buying it. It was your burden. It's your responsibility, and today the court will enforce that. Take him away. Anything else, Mr. Hurdle? Nothing to say. Mr. Boyles? No, we'll be approached. You may. Last time on Corrupt Sheriff and Friends. I told Mr. No, don't do anything stupid. Do not try to deceive me, defy me. You will not like the consequences. Today is that day. You are not the law. You don't interpret the law. You don't enforce the law. You're not above the law. I find that you have, that you are in contempt of this court. Take him into custody. No, 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 no. no that's enough. Yeah. I'll find you guys in, dis in contempt for disrupting the proceedings and you'll be there right there with him. Now, what is an appropriate sanction? The question is, I can sentence him up to 180 days without a trial, or I can sentence him to a day, or I can release him. You know what I think the answer is? 60 days in. That's what I think it, the answer is today. Damn! Greetings, my friends, and welcome. We are back today in the great state of Indiana, Clark County to be exact, where corrupt Sheriff Jamie Knoll has made a mess of things. It's what we like to call around here a dumpster fire. If you missed yesterday's episode, I suggest you go back and watch it, at least the first third of it. Get a little background on the case, because it's pretty messy. There's 133 cars involved. You need to know about that. Today we carry on and learn how widespread the corruption is, how much of the family was involved, and things get kind of nasty. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the bell, the solid one, 
So you don't miss tomorrow's episode because the hearing with the mistress gets really nasty. Let's go to court. Thank you, Good afternoon, Your Honor. Thank you very much. C01 2403 MC 634, that being in the criminal contempt of Jamie No, and 10 C01 2311 F5 297, that being State of Indiana versus Jamie No. You may have a seat, thank you. Um, Mr. Boyles, it's my understanding you have the gentleman here that conducted the search of uh, the No properties. I do, Your Honor. Uh, let the record reflect that on April 17th, after our original contempt hearing, uh, I requested this court to consider uh, appointing an independent person to uh, do a complete, thorough search of both of uh, all four of the houses that Mr. Noel uh, had control over. Uh, the court accommodated us and issued that order uh, providing that. Um, we have contacted Mr. Todd Brown, a retired uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation officer, uh, who we asked to conduct the search. Uh, Mr. Brown uh, conducted the search, and pursuant to the court order, we filed on May 1st uh, a copy of the report, along with a exhibit that identifies all of the items that Mr. Uh, Brown located in the house, uh, and we would like to call him as a witness, Your Honor, to have him detail for the court the location and the items that were taken. You may. Thank you. Mr. Brown? Will you have a seat? Very, very high. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury? Testimony we're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Have a seat. <coughs> Your witness, Mr. Boyle. Thank you, Your Honor. State your name for the record, please. Todd Brown. And Mr. Brown, are you retired from the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Yes, I am. How long have you been retired? Since October of 2022. Okay. And when you were an agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, where were you stationed? I was stationed first in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And then after uh, 10 years, I was transferred to the New Albany Resident Agency in New Albany, Indiana. Okay. Uh, do you have any specialized training in your job as an FBI agent? I do. I received uh, basic uh, training uh, at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, uh, basic new agents training, and then uh, received additional training uh, once I was out in the field. Uh, and I was also a uh, member of the uh, evidence response team while I was assigned to uh, the Louisville Division. Okay. Mr. Brown, when I contacted you, I asked you if it would be within your capacity to do an inventory of all our client, Jamie Knowles, properties that he owned for the purpose of securing any additional weapons that might be there, uh, even though the court didn't authorize that, also to indicate whether any ammunition located in those locations. Is that correct? That's correct. Also, I've asked you that you were aware at the time that you were going to do the search that Mr. Knoll was given permission by this court to have a shotgun at the residence. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, let's start with uh, what properties were you assigned to search? I was assigned a residence at uh, Old Tay Bridge and a pole barn with a uh, cabin next to it at I believe 709 Old Salem Road in Jeffersonville. The residence was also in Jeffersonville. Okay. Then uh, a green barn at 711 Old Salem Road and then a house on uh, Turnberry, I believe it was 2408 Turnberry. Also, they were also located in Jeffersonville? Yes, all the, all the properties were in Jeffersonville. In order to properly conduct such a search, what did you do? How did you prepare yourself? Uh, af after receiving the, the specific uh, locations, um, once, once I got to uh, the, the first location, 
Uh, I took kind of what I would consider entry photos, which is just general photos uh, of the outside of the property. And then once I uh, entered the residence, I took photos as I moved through the residence. Okay. Um, and did you conduct it in what I would call an orderly manner, starting on one floor and went to another floor? Is that kind of how you did it? Yes. Yeah. Was anybody there to assist you? Uh, Paul Meyer uh, was present, but I, I, I completed the search myself. Okay, who is Paul Meyer? Uh, he, he's a, a individual that uh, is working on this case, I believe. Is he also retired from the Federal Bureau of Investigation? He is. He and I, he and I were assigned together in New Albany. Okay. And he's the one that contacted you on my behalf to see if you would independently do the search. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Well, let's start with the uh, first property that you talked about, which would be 3001 Old Tay Bridge in Jeffersonville. Is that the residence? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, were you able to locate any weapons in that home? I did. And what did you locate? <laughs> Located a uh, Glock 26 pistol, semi-automatic pistol, a uh, Sig Sauer 1911 semi-automatic pistol, and a, uh, a shotgun. Okay, let's be very specific on the first, the uh, Glock 26. Did you also take a photograph of where that was located? I did. Okay, could we have... We have a picture up on the screen, which would be uh, for the purpose of having you identify the area where that weapon was found. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And what room of the house is that? That is a closet next to the uh, laundry room. As you're looking at the photo, the laundry room is in the background of the photo and, and the closet is the main part of the, the photo. And that's on the main floor of the house? Yes, sir. Okay. And I noticed that there's a lot of material in that closet. Was that there when you went through it that day? Yes, sir. Where was the gun located? It was located... Uh, Why don't you come off the stand, if the court would permit, and point to the uh, photograph? <coughs> it was located with all these items that, that are... are shoved into the closet area here. Was it on the floor? Was it on in an item? Or where was it? Actually, at the time that I located it, I was pulling items out of the closet, and there was a nylon zip case. And I opened the nylon zip case to see what was in it. And uh, that's when the, it was a gun box inside the zip case. I opened the gun box, and the gun and one magazine was uh, in the box. Was the weapon loaded or unloaded? It was unloaded. Okay. Can we show the second photograph, please? We're now showing a new photograph of a picture weapon. Can you describe that, please? Yes, that's the Glock 26 pistol that uh, I found, and that's the manner in which I found it. It was in the box, locked back, and uh, the magazine was in the box also. And that's the one that came from the closet? Yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You can stand there because we're going to move to the next location. Did you also, as part of your search, uh, in searching all of the house, uh, went to the master bedroom? I did. Okay, and is that the photograph of a closet located in the master bedroom? Yes, sir. Okay, and was there a weapon located there? There was. And what was the weapon? It was a six-hour 1911 semi-automatic pistol. Okay, and where was that weapon located? It was located in this area of the floor. There was a, a pile of stuff on the floor. Was that the pile on top of it? I'm sorry. I couldn't see. Well, I'm sorry, sir. If you'll do that again from the other side. No, I'm sorry. I located it in this area of the closet. There was a, there's a pile of clothes and all sorts of stuff there on the floor, and I found it as I was pulling stuff out. Was that located in a bag itself, or was it just loose? The, uh, the firearm is located in uh, what I would call a utility uh, belt and a holster. Okay. 
thinks he's reaching for a pointer. And again, that's in the master bedroom. Yes, the, the master bedroom, then when you were facing the master bathroom, <coughs> there are closets on either side of a hallway leading from the master bedroom to the master bathroom, and this was the right side closet. Okay. You can return to the witness stand, please. <laughs> And is that the photograph of the weapon that you found in the master bath or master bedroom closet? Yes, sir. Okay. Was that loaded or unloaded? The uh, the weapon was loaded with um, a magazine in the magazine well, but there was no round in the chamber. Okay. You secured both these weapons. Is that correct? I did. Okay. And you have them uh, under lock and key now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Assume that was a 45. Yes, sir. <laughs> Judge, if we could have this marked and we'll offer that into evidence. And it's a photograph of all the pictures you took in all the properties. Any objection from Mr. Hurdle? No, Your Honor. How are you marking that phone? You want to state to do it one. I'm sorry. Stating that it won. Not state to do it. How many <laughs> So it's been blue exhibit red. one and then right. yeah. Sorry. We're always blue state. state. <clears throat> Mr. Brown, I'm going to hand it with Mark for identification as defendant's exhibit one. And ask, can you identify that? Yes, sir. What is that? That's a thumb drive that uh, contains the photographs that I took from examining all four properties and also photographs of all items that I located. Okay. This time, Your Honor, we would offer Defendant's Exhibit 1. No <coughs> objection, Your Honor. So Defendant's Exhibit 1 admitted without objection. Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. As part of your responsibility, Mr. Brown, did you also uh, inventory uh, what I requested, any kind of ammunition that may have been the house while you were there? Yes, sir. And the report that you filed as Defendant's Exhibit A lists all the ammunition from both the master bedroom, the garages, the theater room, master bedroom, basement, unattached garage, and then you also went to 709 Old Salem Road for the purpose of examining it? Yes, sir. And you found no weapons in that location, correct? No, sir. But you did find ammunition which you categorized? Yes, sir. You found it in the loft living room and loft first bedroom and the loft storage tote and the garage entry, is that correct? Yes, sir. You then went to 709 Old Salem Road and that location, nothing was found in that location? Correct, that was the cabin. And then you went to 2408 Turnberry Drive, Jeffersonville, is that correct? Yes, sir. And nothing was found there? Correct. And all the ammunition that you did, you have it under lock and key under your custody, is that correct? Yes, sir. <coughs> Mr. Brown, I also advise you that this court, after the initial hearing, had permitted Mr. Noel to keep a shotgun, is that correct? Yes, sir. Were you able to locate such a weapon at the house? Yes, sir. Okay. Describe what it was. It was a uh, Remington 1187 police model uh, auto-loading shotgun. And was that weapon loaded when you discovered it? No, sir. I don't believe it was. Okay. Is that weapon still at the house? No, sir. To the best of my knowledge, it is not. Did someone in the uh, house indicated they wanted it removed? Yes, sir. Okay. And was it removed? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay. And it's currently located in Mr. Wilder's office under uh, his protective custody. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
<laughs> so those are the entire amount of weapons that you found when you searched all four properties. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Could we show the picture? Uh, I think Mr. Wilder has it up. Is that the shotgun that was at the home? Yes, sir. And is that the Remington weapon? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and that's no longer at the house, is that correct? That's correct. So based upon your testimony and your experience and an independent examiner of all properties that Mr. Noel owns, there are no weapons in any of those properties, is that correct? To the best of my knowledge, that's correct. Okay. <coughs> I have nothing further. Cross-examination, Mr. Hurdle. If he was allowed to have the shotgun, why did you oh. remove it? At the request of uh, his wife. Was she present when you were there? She was not. You spoke to her, though? No, sir. Uh, Paul Meyer spoke to her, and uh, Paul Meyer advised me that she wanted the, the weapon removed. And you said Paul Meyer's working on the case. He works for the defense? Yes, sir. And he's also retired FBI? Yes, sir. And the two of you work together? For the, with the FBI, yes. I'm sorry, you said you retired from the FBI in October of 22. When did you start? Started uh, April 15, 1991. Uh, approximately how many rounds of ammunition did you find? It would be a really rough estimate. I've detailed it in my report. Um, approximately 5,000 rounds. <clears throat> what caliber? Various calibers. They're uh, nine millimeter, 45, 380, 5.56, 7.62. That's uh, 22. And there, there could be others. That's what I recall. The two guns that you found, the Glock and the SIG? Yes, sir. Were you told where to look for those? No, sir. Nobody told you to look in the master bedroom closet or the laundry room closet? No, sir. Did you have any contact with the defendant, his wife, or his daughter? With his daughter. Which daughter? The grace. What was the extent of that contact? Uh, just to advise that I was at the home. Had you ever met any of them before? No, sir. Had you ever met the defendant before? I do not specifically recall ever meeting the defendant. Even though he was in law enforcement for about 30 years, that overlapped the same time that you were in law enforcement? That's correct. I don't, I don't specifically recall meeting him. Did you search any vehicles? I did. Ammunition or weapons found in any car, cars, trucks, or other types of vehicles? No, sir. Do you recall off the top of your head what vehicles you searched? There was a Trans Am and a uh, BMW 
at the residence. Then there were uh, several, what I would call classic cars, older cars, uh, at the, um, the pole barn at 709 Old Salem Road. Several, more than 10, less than 10? I would say 10 to 12. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Nothing else. Mr. Wells, anything else? I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Brown, um, you retired in 2022. Yes, sir. Were you able to keep your service revolver or sidearm? No, sir. Do you have one you typically carry? I do. You know where it's at at all times? Yes, sir. Did you always know where your service revolver, service sidearm was? It's probably not a revolver, was it? No, sir. Yes, sir, I did. So to find a service revolver, revolver, I keep saying revolver, service firearm in a duty belt with other mags, that's not, a, that's not too far-fetched to believe that one would know where that was at, would it? Rhetorical question, you don't have to answer. Yes, sir. Just reinforces my decision to impose sanctions. If that prompts any further questions. None for me. No, I, I do have another question or two. The uh, Remington shotgun, was it in a box when you found it? No, sir. Was it near a box? A Remington firearm box? Not that I recall. Did it still have tags on it? No, sir. Where was it at? I located it in uh, the basement, uh, what I generally term the uh, theater room. And not loaded? No, sir. Not much use for self-defense, is it? No, sir. You were in the upper area and you needed a firearm for self-defense. Where would you go of the ones you found? The closest one would be the um, 6 hour 19 Okay. No other questions. That prompts any questions. One, one question, Your, Your Honor. Mr. Brown, was there any 12-gauge uh, ammunition found? Yes, sir. That's all, Judge. Mr. Boyles, uh, I'm not going to impose any further sanctions today because it was not certified to me that there was no further firearms. But after today, if there's any further firearms found, there will be additional sanctions. So if your client needs to tell you something, he needs to tell you right now. You need to take a few moments and ask. I'd be happy to, Your Honor. Why don't we go off the record so we can speak with his client? One thing we would add, Your Honor, is the duty weapon. Let us get back here. Okay, we're back on that. Okay. Go ahead. The only thing we could add, Your Honor, is there's no uh, weapons in the house uh, now, and the duty weapon was seized on the original search. It was in the console of his car. Okay. So, so the one that was found was not the duty weapon. Okay. Thank you. I have no questions. Why was it in a service holster with additional mags? And you don't have to answer that. Well, because I don't carry guns, so I don't know, <laughs> Judge. I got a BB gun. <coughs> That's all right. Mr. Brown, thank you. And thank you for uh, conducting the search for me. I appreciate it. Thank Excuse you. Me. Thank you. Anything else we need to address? No further evidence, Your Honor. Mr. Nothing, Hurdle? No, Your Honor. Is there anything else we need to address while on the record? I don't believe so. I think a chamber's meeting on discussing trial dates and other things is appropriate, the court suggested. Mr. Hurdle? 
Your Honor, I know the, uh, the court made its decision not to issue any more sanctions, but uh, from the state's perspective, uh, the finding of two additional weapons, one a service weapon, one that was loaded, easily accessible, is still concerning and troubling to the state. I know it is to the court as well. Um, I don't know that the state has anything to offer other than that. The, uh, the, the court issued a sanction last time and uh, would uh, reiterate uh, its position before that uh, the, court the court orders are something to be followed, and um, hopefully that doesn't happen again. Well, Mr. Hurdle, uh, if it had been certified to me that there was no further weapons, and then these additional weapons were discovered, I promise you there would have been additional sanctions. But because that certification had not been made, um, I don't think it would be fair um, to do so. But I did give Mr. Boyles and his client warning, should any further weapons be found, there will be more sanctions. Thank you, Judge. Well, Judge, it was our position, as I told the court at our uh, bench conference, uh, that we wanted to do an independent uh, to make sure that there would never be any ramifications on such. Uh, this court issued its order uh, and we're abiding by it. We would respectfully ask the court to possibly reconsider the amount of the uh, time on the, uh, because we're going to need, obviously our client as we proceed to go through the discovery uh, and it makes it a little easier if he's available, but I'll leave that decision to the court. Uh, Mr. Boyles. I know you have a job to do on behalf of your client, but uh, as, as I indicated, finding these additional weapons just reinforces my decision. And a matter of fact, I wish I'd have made it longer. So, but I'll stick with the 60. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll be up further. On May 10th, 2024, two civil actions were filed against Jamie Knoll by Indiana State Attorney General Todd Rokita. These were both filed in an attempt to recover some of the funds that were siphoned from publicly available monies that were associated with the Sheriff's Department and also the nonprofit organization. It's now all in the family. The former Clark County, Indiana sheriff, three of his daughters, and his wife all in court today as part of a lawsuit. The Indiana Attorney General is trying to get back millions of dollars in taxpayer money the state says Knowles' family and his associates spent on personal items. Here's Focus reporter Travis Breeze tonight and photojournalist Elijah McKenzie with more on the state's efforts to freeze their assets. This was the first time that we saw Gracie or Josie Knoll in an official courtroom proceeding. Five Knoll family members had to verbally agree to having the temporary restraining order extended for 30 days. That will prevent them from selling any of their assets. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Washington County. Have a seat. Thank you. All right, clause numbers 88, pardon me, habit, 10 C01 2405 PL 37 and 38. 37 being State of Indiana, X Real, Todd Rakita, Attorney General versus Jamie Nettle, Auto Owners, and Kenneth Hughbanks. Uh, 38 being State of Indiana, X Real, Todd Rakita, Attorney of Gen General of Indiana versus Jamie Noll, Gracie Noll, Josie Noll. Uh, Kevin Wilkerson and Misty no, Prior to coming on the record, uh, counsel for the parties had the opportunity to have discussions in regards to at least a possible temporary um, agreement. Mr. Stewart, it's my understanding that you're going to outline for everyone what you believe to be the agreement between you and the state of Indiana and all other parties. That's correct. Would you be so kind? Yes. Um, oh, by the way, uh, this is Lauren. She's my intern for the summer. You guys be nice to her, okay? And, and Judge, this would apply universally for all the parties, but I think there'll be some testimony elicited relative to that, each of the individuals. That's my understanding of how this is going to work. So as to the specific agreement, um, 
the parties would waive any issues related to the 10-day requirement contained in Rule 65B2. Um, the TRO would stay in effect until and unless the agreed order, an agreed order is filed with the court where a hearing is held, whichever is earlier. Um, such hearing would be deemed an emergency matter. Uh, we would stipulate to that, and the court would retain jurisdiction over any and all emergency matters, including uh, the preliminary injunction request uh, filed by the state. Uh, in addition, uh, all of the parties would turn over signed and verified under oath uh, PAQs, which I'm still unsure what the terminology is, but um, those would be due Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, and all of this would be reduced to written format and filed with the court. <coughs> But that's my understanding. And because we have so many lawyers here representing different parties, just for the record, can we clarify who who is all here and who, who represents whom? Judge, my name is Larry Wilder, and I'm a lawyer from Jeffersonville, and I represent Mr. Noel. How, how did I know you'd be the first to speak? I'm the oldest here, Jay. <laughs> Mr. Noel's is absent. All right. Zach Stewart, also on behalf of Jamie Noel, you're on. Sonny Rashad Judge, on behalf of Casey Noah, Flores, Gracie, and Josie Noah. Your Honor, Barton Mack, on behalf of Missy Noah, Gracie Noah, and Joseph. Okay. Mariel Riedel, along with Dane Kirk and Lydia Golden from uh, the state, on behalf of Plaintiff. Thank you. All right. Um, whoever's going to testify, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you. You may have a seat. Mr. Stewart? You'd like to Mr. Mr. Bob? No, thank you, Judge. On both causes. On both cases, yes. So, Mr. No, you understand that you're under oath. Yes. And you understand that we're here regarding two case numbers that you've been named in, right? Mr. Wilder, let me interrupt yes, just sir. a second. What's his name? Right. Um. Charlie Myers. Mr. Myers, are you with us now? Mr. Myers? Take me difficult. Not here. Okay. Tells me again, I'll let you know. All right. Proceed. No problem. So, as we were saying, so Mr. Noll, you understand that you're here as a result of being named in two cases, correct? Yes. Sir. And you heard the judge call those cases, right? Yes, sir. And you under you heard Mr. Stewart outline the agreement that has been uh, reached among the parties uh, contingent upon the court's acceptance, correct? Yes, sir. And you understood your rights as a, a defendant in this civil case. We explained those to you, correct? Yes, sir. You heard Mr. Stewart discuss timelines that we were willing to waive, right? Yes, sir. And also that we were willing to enter into an agreement where any and all emergency matters would re be retained in the jurisdiction of, of Judge Medlock, correct? Yes, and nobody made any threats, promises, or coerced you into agreeing with this in this case and these two cases, did they? You're correct. No. And it's within under your own free will that you uh, ask the court to consider accepting the agreement in both of the cases we're named in, right? Yes, sir. Judge, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilder. Did you need anything? Just one follow-up, yes, follow clar clarifying follow-up. Uh, sir, do you also understand that uh, until and unless a stipulated injunction or a hearing is held, that the temporary te uh, restraining order that is currently in place would maintain as an order? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Judge, he's back. Are you with us, sir? Hello, this is Charlie Myers. Okay, Mr. Myers, uh, we are on record now, uh, so you'll be able to hear what's going on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Bart, are you or Sonny going to? Yeah, I'll go ahead uh, first with Ms. Noll. Uh, Missy, you heard the agreement that Mr. Stewart recited? Yes, sir. And you understand we're here today because you are a respondent of civil action filed by the state of Indiana. And also, there is a temporary um, emergency restraining order that has been sought. Yes, sir. And you understand the terms of that and the agreement that we have would mean that you must abide by that as an order of this court. Yes, sir. And we are waiving timelines that may otherwise apply for an emergency temporary restraining order and to allow Judge Medlock to retain jurisdiction under those terms. Yes, sir. Nobody has forced, threatened you, or promised you something other than the fact of what we've discussed on record here today. No. 
and it is your intention to abide by this agreement and enter this agreement subject to Judge Medlock's approval. Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Um, council approach. <coughs> Ms. Stone, uh, you read the documents that were filed by the state of Indiana, correct? Yes. And there were some allegations that uh, would make a casual reader believe that you were in the process of trying to sell automobiles or other assets. Yes, ma'am. You, you have never listed an automobile for sale. No, sir. You have never contacted a seller's agent. No, sir. You have never talked about selling anything, correct? Correct. You applied for duplicate titles to know what all was in your name or the family name solely without the view of trying to secret assets from the state of Indiana. Is that true? That's true. Yes, Your Honor, I hope that satisfies the inquiry. State. Good morning, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Satisfied. Um, <clears throat> Joseph, uh, would you stand, please? Or actually, come up here. I was going to say, why don't you get her closer to a microphone? <clears throat> uh, young lady, please state your name. Josie Knoll. And you likewise are a respondent in this action that's filed by the state of Indiana. Yes. And you've read the documents filed against you. Yes. And you understand that you have certain rights and timelines that we've discussed. Yes. And you understand by entering the agreement that Mr. Stewart recited that we are waiving certain timelines and we are allowing by agreement that Judge Medlock, his honor, can retain emergency jurisdiction over this matter. Yes. You understand that you cannot sell any property? Yes. You cannot secret any assets? Yes. You don't intend to do that, do you? I do not. And we want to cooperate with the state of Indiana going forward to try to resolve this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you wish the judge to enter, uh, agree and enter the agreement as uh, announced before the court? Yes. Nothing further for Joseph. Just to clarify, because I don't know if it was uh, explicitly said, you understand that the temporary TRO that is in place will remain in place until and unless a stipulated injunction is agreed upon or a hearing is held on the matter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I apologize for opening that. Please state your name. It's Gracie Knoll. And, and Gracie, uh, you have been served with papers filed by the state of Indiana as well, correct? Yes. You've read those papers? Yes. And we've had an opportunity to discuss those papers. Yes. And you likewise are willing to uh, waive timelines and hope that Judge Medlock enters the agreement as announced by Mr. Stewart? Yes. And part of that is you know that you cannot sell anything, you cannot hide anything. We have to make an adequate, honest, and forthright disclosure of estates, or pardon me, of assets and debts. Yes. And you also know that the court retains jurisdiction over this until we have an agreement or a hearing is reached on this matter. Yes. And no one has forced you, threatened you, or otherwise made you do something you don't want to do today. Your Honor, that'd be all my questions. Just to clarify, I know that you mentioned that uh, it would maintain jurisdiction, but you understand also that that temporary TRO is in place until those things uh, come to play. Is that correct, ma'am? Yes. Thank you. Correct. Gracie, did you just graduate from school? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. I know it took a lot of hard work. Okay. Next. Casey, can you state your name, please? Casey Lou. Okay, so you understand that you're here because you've been named as a respondent in this present civil case, correct? Yes. All right, and did you hear the agreement that Mr. Stewart outlined? Yes. All right, and is it your wish to enter that agreement today? Yes. And you understand that the temporary restraining order that's been discussed will remain in place? Yes. And you understand that you will make a disclosure of all your assets? Yes. And you understand that we're waiving certain things like time limits and some jurisdictional matters due to that, correct? Yes. All right, I believe that's it, Judge. Just to explicitly state, you understand that the court would remain uh, uh, in jurisdiction of this matter as an emergency status um, while this uh, preliminary injunction matter is pending. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Council approach.
Is all parties satisfied with the uh, testimony and stipulations and agreement uh, that's been? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Who's going to reduce it to writing for for me and distribute it to all parties? State will do that. Okay, very good. Is there anything else that needs to be direct addressed while on the record? Oh, Renee. June the 21st, Clark County at 1 p.m. Unless there's anything else, we'll be off record. We have nothing for Mr. Knoll, Judge. Nothing for my insurance, Your Honor. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right, we'll be off record at 4.06. Good evening, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, this is cause number 10, season of 1, 2307, and C1423. That'll be any matter of business by the Indiana State Police. Uh, you to the Volunteer Fire. Fighters Association doing business with New Chapel UMS filed a petition or a motion to intervene on May the 23rd. And I'll cut that matter of preparing here at 1 30 this afternoon. I'll directly this now. 144. Um, it's my understanding that the parties may have something of a resolution um, that. They'd like to recite? Yes, Your Honor. Would you Would you like to do so, Heather? I, I can do that, Your Honor. Your Honor, we filed our motion to intervene to address property that belongs to my client that is currently in the possession of the state police. Mr. Hurdle and I have talked extensively over the last week. Uh, we would ask that that be continued out 90 days. Um, in the meantime, we are working with the state police to have our staff go check out the 18 vehicles uh, that belong to my client. They're in their possession. Just make sure they're running. They're in good order. Um, and then we're also going to work with the state police to find a storage unit that would be accessible only to ISP to maintain the care, custody, and control of the vehicles, uh, but yet be undercover instead of right now we're currently in an ISP lot that's chain linked. Uh, it's their car it has special car covers on them, but they're still outside exposed to the elements. Uh, should the car covers come off. So I think that we can work on a resolution within the, the next 90 days, and then I would withdraw our motion after that period of time, Your Honor. In the interim, you will not be getting access to anything that may be sealed? No, Your No Honor. prior notice of the search warrants? No, Your Honor. Uh, you going to go get the refrigerator, the cooking unit, the HVAC? Uh, if the state police and the prosecutor and the attorney general's office say we could do so, I'm sure that... Uh, Chief Owen would make some kind of effort to go out there and get those. Mr. Hurdle. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think Ms. Peters accurately um, described the agreement uh, between the state and um, Utica at this point in time. The state's not prepared to concede that they should be allowed to intervene nor should there be a return of property at this point in time, but we're not going to get into the merits of the case, as uh, Ms. Peters um, suggested, and we're just going to ask this be moved um, approximately 90 days for um, some potential negotiation, as well as allowing them to, to review the property under the guidance and, uh, I guess, supervision of the Indiana State Police. And at this point in time, we're not prepared to return anything uh, at this point in time, as it's potential evidence of criminal conduct. Understand. Well, not... I assume you understand that also. Yes, Your Honor. We work pretty closely with the state police and the state board of accounts throughout this process. We understand. Have any use for an eight hundred dollar belt and a bunch of suits? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Anything else? No, Your Honor. I Mr. think that's Hurdle. all, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you be so kind to prepare the entry for I will and send it to Mr. Hurdle for yes. review and, and sign off on? I will do so. All right. We'll be off right there. Unless there's anything else that needs to be addressed in this matter. No, no. Not from the state, Your Honor. And it's my understanding the parties would like about a five minute break before we start the next hearing. Yes, Judge. All right. We'll be off right there. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. We'll be back in about five. Oh, we didn't know you were finished. We just got back. Oh,
This will be a little bit right. Yeah. Hey, Maury. I think we're ready now. All right, clause number 10, Caesar 1, 2311, F5, 297, State of Indiana versus Jamie Knoll. Mr. Knoll, this is your initial hearing on six new criminal charges. For the record, would you state your full name? Jamie John Knoll. And your date of birth? 12, 18, 70. That make you how old? 53. Well, last four digits of social security number. 2558, Your Honor. What's your address? 3001 Old Tay Bridge, Jeffersonville, Indiana, 47130. And are you under the influence of any drugs, including alcohol today? No, Your Honor. Read and understand the English language? Yes, Your Honor. If I say something you don't understand, will you let me know? Yes, Your Honor. I'll go through these counts. Good. Before yes. we... Uh, go into the initial hearing. I just want to, for the record, um, I want to note an objection based on the statute relative to amended informations, um, specifically under subsection B2. Um, I believe we're past the omnibus date. I think it's clear that the charges are additional counts, some of which alter uh, defenses and or evidence that might be adduced in trial. So I think it's clear that they tend to affect the substantial rights of the defendant. Um, in that case, um, I just want to note that we believe that under subsection D, we should have been permitted adequate notice, opportunity to be heard prior to the court entering an order on June 3rd, accepting the charges. I understand the court has set this for an initial hearing. I just want to note that. Do you like to respond? Well, a couple things, Your Honor. Um, I guess first of all is uh, there is a provision uh, within the statute that, that allows for the amendment or the additional charges to be filed based on newly discovered evidence. Um, as the court knows and certainly the defense knows, this is an investigation that has basically continued on since probably June or July of last year. so almost 12 months of continued investigation. And many of these things were recently brought to light through search warrants through American Express. Sam's Club and a number of, uh, of other entities. So that newly discovered evidence allows for the additional uh, evidence. Further, the, uh, the state would show that we're not set for trial until November. Um, this certainly um, gives the defense ample time to review the new additional charges, the newly discovered evidence, and time to prepare for a trial in November, which is um, five-ish months away from now. Mr. Stewart, anything you'd like to say in response? No, Judge, I, I, I just want to know that the normal remedy would be, if, if done close to a trial, I do understand the normal remedy would be a continuance of that trial date. Um, we're not saying that it's impossible for us to prepare at this time. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know, depending upon what may be turned over in the near future. But again, I think under that subsection D, despite the, I'm not exactly clear where it says there's a basis that's solely about new evidence. I mean, there is procedure to follow in every amended information. And subsection D provides that the defendant is entitled to adequate notice and opportunity prior to the setting of an initial hearing on that and basically to address these types of issues. So, no, well, that may be partly the, uh, the court's issue, uh, Mr. Stewart, just in the interest of a judicial economy. Um, Everybody was available and could get it done today. So you have a formal objection. Feel free to file it. And if you need additional time to prepare for trial, I'm not not opposed to granting that. Um, you might want to talk to your client, see if there's anything else that may be discovered. Thank you, Judge. All right. Count 26. 
I, the undersigned, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35 44 point one dash two dash one that between June the 4th, 2019, and August the 21st, 2023, in Clark County, state of Indiana, Jamie Knoll did knowingly or intentionally acquire or maintain an interest in, receive, conceal, possess, transfer, or transport the proceeds of criminal activity and or conduct, supervise, or facilitate a transition involving the proceeds of criminal activity and or invest, expend, receive, or offer to invest, expend, or receive the proceeds of criminal activity or funds that are the proceeds or funds of criminal activity and the person knows the proceeds of uh, or funds uh, are the results of criminal activity and said proceeds or funds have the value of at least $50,000. It's a level five felony. Count 27. I, the undersigned, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1 that between June the 26th, 2019 and December the 31st, 2022, in Clark County, State of Indiana, Jamie Knoll did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Clark, Clark County Sheriff's Department with the intent to deprive said entity of any part of its use or value of the property, said property having a value in, in having a value in excess of fifty thousand dollars. That be doing. December 31st, 2019, five lawnmowers in the amount of $18,651.65. And or July the 20th, 2022, HVAC system in the amount of $6,539.12. And or June 26th, 2019, a Dodge Ram in the amount of $11,000. And or December of 2022, shipping containers in excess of $25,000. Count 28. I, the undersigned, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1 that between March the 31st, 2020 and November the 29th, 2021, in Clark County, State of Indiana, Jamie Knoll did knowingly or intentionally exert an unauthorized control over the property of Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive said entity of any part of the use or value of the property and the property having the value in excess of $50,000, that being child support payments in the amount of $50,968. Count 29, I, the undersigned, and these are all signed by Richard J. Hurdle, do under, I, the undersigned, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1 that between December the 2nd, 2019 and January 21st, 2023 in Washington County, Clark County, State of Indiana, Abbott, Jamie Knoll did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive said any of any part of its use of its value of the property and property having a value in excess of $50,000. That being January 21st, 2023, a BMW in the amount of $21,000 and or May 1st, 2022, a 1957 Chevrolet in the amount of $40,000, and or August the 13th, 2022, a 1966 Pontiac in the amount of $33,919, and or January the 6th, 2020, a 1979 Pontiac in the amount of $20,000, and or December the 2nd, 2019, a 1966 Plymouth Roadrunner in the amount of $52,500 and or May the 20th, 2022, a 
2020, a 1970 Dodge in the amount of $45,000, and or July the 28th, 2020, a 1959 Corvette in the amount of $45,000. Count 30, theft, level five film. I, the undersigned, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury or specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1 that between February the 17th, 2022 and May the 10th, 2023, in Clark County, state of Indiana, Jamie Knoll did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive said entity of any part of the use or value of the property and the property having a value of at least $50,000, um, that being May the 10th, 2023, an HVAC system at the Turnberry Mansion in the amount of $2,700 and or March the 22nd, 2023, chimney repair at the Turnberry Mansion in the amount of $11,200, and or February the 17th, 2022, airplane purchase in the amount of $25,000, and or September the 9th, 2022, airplane repair in the amount of $16,616.63, and or July 13, 2022, a Cub Cadet mower purchased in the amount of $11,000. <clears> Count 31. I, the undersigned, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1 that between November the 9th, 2023, and March the 29th, 2024, in Clark County, State of Indiana, Jamie Knoll did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive said entity of any part of the use or value of the property, said property having a value in excess of $50,000. That being, American Express credit card purchases in the amount of $37,151.40 and or Sam's Club credit card purchases in the amount of $15,667.16. These are all level five felonies, which have a range of imprisonment from one year to six years with the advisory sentence being three years and up to a $10,000 fine. Do you understand what you've been charged with? Yes, Your Honor. And do you understand the potential penalties? Yes, Your Honor. My next question is usually you intend to hire a lawyer, but we've got a stable of lawyers, so uh, I assume you intend to enter a uh, not guilty plea, Mr. Wilder? Yeah, Your Honor, uh, at this time, Mr. Noel, how would we wish to enter our plea this Not guilty, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Judge. I need to tell you, you have a right to a speedy public trial by jury in this county. You have the right to face all witnesses against you. See here, question and cross examine those witnesses. You have the right to have witnesses brought into court to testify on your behalf. And at your request, the court will issue subpoenas requiring those individuals to come into court to testify on your behalf or to bring evidence. You have the right to have the state prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the right to remain silent. You cannot be required to give any testimony or make any statements against yourself to anyone. You do have the right to be heard in your own defense at any hearing or trial concerning the charges against you. Anything you say, however, may be Do you have any questions concerning your wives? No, Your Honor. Uh, I'll enter the not guilty plea on, on your behalf. Thank you, Judge. Now, State of Indiana, with the issue regarding bond, Yes, Your Honor. Um, given this matter is uh, in the same cause number, the state believes that the appropriate statute for the court to consider is 3533.85, alteration or revocation of bail. And the state is asking for the court to alter his bail today. Um, I think a couple of factors that the uh, court should consider in determining whether or not to alter uh, the defendant's bail today is that back in November when we initially filed these charges and he had his initial hearing, many of these things 
were not known to the state at that time. Had the state known about these things, we probably would have charged at that point in time and probably would have affected the bail either request by the state of Indiana or the bail set by the court at that point in time. So many of the things that have now been charged either back with the 10 counts and now with these six counts were not known at the time. So I'd ask the court to consider that. Um, I'd ask the court to consider also um, back at that November hearing when the same day that the initial hearing was, the defendant posted his bail that day and part of his requirements that he not commit any new additional crimes. And if we look at the statute a little closer, bail can be altered, potentially even revoked, based on the commission of a, an a misdemeanor or another crime. We have alleged through the state that he has committed six felonies. Probably the key one of those is count 31, which is the, uh, the theft. And the theft that that encompasses is what happened after the November 9th hearing to March 17th and March 29th. Because at that time in that three or so month time span, maybe four months, the defendant is alleged to have used the credit card, American Express, as well as the Sam's Club credit card, both owned, operated by the Utica Volunteer Fire Department. So in excess of $50,000, approximately $52,000 was charged on those two credit cards as alleged in count um, 31. Commission of a new criminal offense can alter a defendant's bond, or at least the court can consider that. That combined with the contempt that the defendant had approximately 50 or so days ago when there was blatant disregard for the court's order to remove all weapons, the court obviously took that into consideration. But the use of these other credit cards is furthering this whole same entitlement, greed, lack of um, basically disdain for the court's authority. And so that's what I, the state believes is key in altering his bond today. And the state would ask you to, uh, to alter his bond. Um, so these additional crimes post-arrest are, are the key factors. And the other five counts also were not completely known at the time back in November when he was charged. Um, so based on these factors, based on the statute set forth, and primarily, Your Honor, the 41-page uh, the probable cause affidavit outlined by uh, Detective Heron, the state would ask the court to take judicial notice of that filed in this cause number. Court will do so. I'm sorry? Court will do so. Thank you, Judge. Um, that, that that is the, uh, the evidence that the court needs to alter his bail. And uh, the amount, um, the state requested a uh, $25,000 bond at the at initial hearing, and the court saw fit to um, set bail at $75,000. Based on the, his actions since November, Member, the state believes that it certainly needs to be elevated at the court's discretion, but uh, certainly a, a significant amount higher. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Hurdle. Mr. Schiller or Mr. Wilder? Judge, I think again, I just want to note that the specific requirements and the alteration of bail, similar to the requirements to modify um, or amend the charge, require adequate notice and opportunity. I mean, Vasendak, which is the case that prosecutors cite to, to hold people without bail until that hearing can be held, they have to specifically outline which pieces of the Indiana Code that we are alleging to have violated under the bail statute. Under Indiana, and I agree that we are under the exact code that Mr. Hurdle recited, but we're citing to specific sections that deal with alterations um, to increase bail, and then a separate section dealing with uh, specifically outlined pieces relative to full revocations of bail. So I'm, I, I think that they're mixing two different pieces and that's problematic because there's a different standard of proof that is specifically outlined in the revocation pieces of the statute and it's clear and convincing evidence. And a probable cause affidavit, despite the fact that the court may agree that there's a probable cause, that's, that is a very low standard in comparison to clear and convincing evidence. So 
I mean, that, that's the standard we use to take people's children away, not the standard that we use to, again, without notice, revoke somebody's bail. When you look specifically at the s sections of the statute that deal with applications to the court for modifications for increase, what it notates is that if they present substantial evidence that indicates he is a high risk to not appear for court, or if they present additional evidence, evidence relative to new charges, that evidence, I mean, it specifically specified DNA evidence. Those are the times when you can increase bail. And I think that this process of trickling charges every couple weeks or months, it sets a bad precedent and it's bad policy to allow that to occur because at this point, any prosecutor in the state of Indiana can file initial charges, wait a little bit, see if they like what the court's order is on bail, potentially defendant posts, file new charges that they knew of. And, and there are pieces of this that, that the prosecutor uh, has known since prior to the first event. So, and again, I do think that count 31 relative to the issues, you know, is something that the court could consider but it's an evidence-based process, and the standard is laid out for revoking based on a felony charge, and it's clear and convincing evidence that that happened. So I would just ask, I'd ask that the court take judicial notice of the IRAS assessment that was done at the initial hearing. Um, I don't believe any of the information contained inside that document has changed. Mr. Knoll's ability and desire to show up for court has not changed. Um, and there's been no evidence presented to the contrary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Well, question for anybody. Does Mr. Noel still have access to the Utica Township credit card? No, Your Honor. He hasn't for a lengthy period of time. I'm sorry. He has not for a lengthy period of time had access. Your Honor, my client cannot vote for her. We cannot get any. Um, this judge, Ms. Peters, I'm, has no standing. He said anybody who wanted to answer, I'm trying to answer. Your Honor, I do not believe that at any point the court says anybody who wants to answer includes anybody sitting around that may or may not have involved. All right. Um, and I agree with that. Thank you, Judge. I'd like to call you as a court witness. I don't swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury testimony about to be the truth, the whole truth, and not the better truth. Yes, Your Honor. I'll see. For the record, tell me your name and your position. Heather Peters. I am a general counsel for New Chapel. And I asked a question to the counsel out there, I guess not for the general public. I, you, 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 you have a responsibility to your client in regards to whether Mr. Null still has access to these credit cards. Can you enlighten me? Your Honor, as to the American Express card, we did receive um, a notice in the mail from American Express that that account had been closed due to fraud, that there was a balance on it. We have not been able to receive any other information regarding that account. The Synchrony Bank, we have never had access to. Um, our chief on my direction had called Synchrony several times. We could not get information. That's why we filed a declaratory judge, uh, judgment action in fact in uh, Floyd, I guess it's in Clark County, but in being heard by Floyd County Judge. Um, so we have not been able to ascertain if that account's open, if there are a balance, if there is a balance on it, and who has cards. I believe that uh, Lieutenant Heron at some point did get a copy of a card that was Misty's baby. I don't know if he has a physical card. Good. So we the one problem I have at this point is that Ms. Peters, who should know the rules of the court, is turning to people and basically asking them to give her answers. Yeah, while I'm she's not testifying. asking to give me answers. I'm, at, I'm just acknowledging that. Yeah, trying to right. confirm. All right. Right. You know, you can't ask, yeah, sure. ask anybody else to help. Sure. All right. Has Mr. Noel used those cards lately? Not to uh, my knowledge. I did have a conversation with Chief Owen, and he has not seen any 
and our company he has not seen any charges come through in the last few weeks. Council Lofton, a couple questions. You may, you may. So, ma'am, the Amex card we're talking about. Yes, sir. Mr. Wilder. Never, never will that ever be something anyone will get to see. You haven't got a left to get though. I will never run. Mark them down. So, the Amex account we're talking about, you're familiar with it. Yes. And the Amex account we're talking about had cards issued to other individuals whose last names were not known, correct? Uh, that... Correct. Uh, I have to think. Yes, yes. And one of the individuals was a fellow whose last name was Wilkerson, right? Correct. And it's already been determined and established through the State Board of Accounts audit that Mr. Wilkerson's credit card was used in a manner which was not consistent with the law, right? Um, I don't know that that was the exact wording of the State Board of Accounts. The State Wilkerson. Board of Accounts determined that there was $40,000 spent on the Amex card we're talking about. Correct. Right? Correct. And in addition to Mr. Wilkerson, there were other individuals who had Amex cards, correct? Correct. Mr. Owen had an Amex card, right? Correct. There are other folks whose names are on and who possess Amex cards that have the ability to use those right up until that account was closed, right? Correct. We don't see an itemization in this new charge of whom used this credit card and made what charges, did we? In the information, um, I, I didn't review the information that they filed. We don't see the credit card statements. We don't know who used the card during this time frame and how much they charged, do we? I, I know from looking at the statements, yes. We it's agree. Issues. My question is simple. Of this $53,000 that is alleged that was spent, the Amex portion of that is whatever, because it's gone away on my screen. We do not know whether or not, based on the charge, those charges were made on a credit card of Mr. Knowles, do I can't say that if you're asking based on the information because I haven't seen the information. Synchronicity of it. What is it? Synchrony. Synchrony. Synchronicity is what we should all be experiencing, right? Synchrony. There were other cards issued to other folks from that account, wasn't there? Yes. So Mr. Noll is not the only individual who had access to a card, right? Not on the secret account, no. Mr. Eubanks had a card? I don't know. Mr. Wilkerson also had a card? I don't know that. Mr. Owen had a card? Yes, I don't have a card. So other people have a card, mm -hmm. and that charge doesn't reflect whether or not the, the charge that Mr. Noll is facing whether or not the number presented is just part of their alleged teammate, right? I can't I can't say that. I haven't seen the information. I just know what Judge Mallock read it that was the account. And we also know and agree that the American Express account was in fact guaranteed by Mr. Noel personally, correct? That's my understanding, yes. So had, had anyone defaulted on the American Express a car? Mr. Null would have personally been responsible for paying it, right? In addition to my client, whose EIN was also listed on the account. I'm not for a regret. Yes, thank you. Mr. Herber? No questions. Mr. Eubanks had Mr. Eubanks, I, I don't know. Well, Mr. Wilder said Mr. Eubanks had a card. And I don't know that. I don't know if he had a secret in my well, I'm looking forward to getting acquainted with Mr. Eubanks. Right. Court has no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peter. Anything else you remember? Mr. Stewart? I would just go back to, I think, the court's initial question. Ms. Peter said she has no evidence one way or another. Um, and the state has not presented any additional evidence relative to high risk for non appearance um, or specifically DNA evidence tending to prove the defendant committed some type of new charge that they did not know about at the time of filing of the initial information. And for those reasons, the specific subsection dealing with bail increases, th those are the reasons. So thank you, Joe. Anything else, Mr. Hurdle? Only briefly, Your Honor, with respect to the American Express card and, uh, and who used it, who had it, um, while Ms. Peters may represent uh, Utica, 
the criminal investigation conducted by the Indiana State Police, specifically uh, Detective Heron, um, she's not privy to that investigation. Who used what card, when, and as page seven of the probable cause affidavit denotes, there's a credit card number with a specific name of Casey Knoll, Utica Township uh, Fire Department uh, listed on that. Um, had there been evidence that um, Casey Knoll was continuing to use that credit card, there may, may have been additional charges on her. However, the allegation is that the defendant, Jamie Knoll, in this cause is the one who has used that. Miss uh, Miss Peters may not know um, exactly what the investigation entails, so I would ask the court to just to consider that as it's making its determination of who had which credit card and who was charging it. The allegation is that the defendant was using it with his card. Mister, anything else? I think you can just judge. It's, it's an allegation at this point, and it's it's information tending to demonstrate probable cause. Just an entirely different standard than the one that the court is required to consider for full revocations. Now, as to modifications or alterations of increases, like, again, similar circumstance where the probable cause is not the same. So, Stuart, I, I want you to know I have the greatest respect for your legal knowledge and knowledge procedures. They're in the path. I'm going to reiterate this again. I told Ms. Cole not to do anything stupid. Not to deceive me. Not to define me. He would not like the consequences. Didn't seem like you listened the first time. You released. And thus I sent you 60 days, days for contempt. Your behavior since you were released seems to fit into all these categories. You know, I'm just a country boy from Washington County with a public school education. But when somebody warns me not to do something, I try to heed that warning because we say what we mean up there. So this is my analysis. With the information and the affidavits that were filed and it appears that you had, or at least did have, an airplane, a train that was hidden, a stable of exotic motor vehicles, a harem of women, at least three mansions, three thousand, at least three thousand dollar suits, eight hundred dollar belts, which you get personally delivered. I still seem to think that the Utah Volunteer Fire Department's your personal piggy bank. All the while, every day, individuals are trying to survive working paycheck to paycheck. With their own money that you that they've worked hard for while you're out flung elections. Acquired allegedly at the expense of taxpayers. So with all these luxuries and all the money that you've allegedly taken. I'm thinking about $1.5 million in bond ought to be appropriate. You should be able to post that with no problems with everything that you have. If you don't listen to that, post it. I don't know where we're going. That's Just the increase by 1.5 million or the total of 1.5 million? Oh, do you have that much in the bank while they're okay? I was just trying to figure out my math over here. We'll make it 1.5 even. Thank you, Jack. Shall we hold it until you go get it? 
Uh, I would say Mrs. Wilder probably would have a question about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anything else? I think I'm going to Mr. I may be wrong, but my responsibility is to the citizens of Clark County, state of Indiana. And I think this is what must be done in order to continue to protect their interests and restore their faith in, in the rule of law. So Thank you. that's my order. Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. We'll be off of Former Clark County Sheriff Jamie Knoll was expected in court this afternoon, but we learned this morning that his hearing was canceled. That hearing was about the Indiana Attorney General's case against him. The state of Indiana is suing Knoll, saying it hopes to recover public money related to the criminal charges pending against him. We've learned agreements have been reached that resolve those hearings, but the results are confidential by order of the court. Knoll is charged with theft, tax evasion, corrupt business practices, and ghost employment. Indiana has also asked the judge to freeze Knoll's accounts and his ability to sell stocks and bonds or property. Noel is currently in jail on a bond of $1.5 million. Another hit for the embattled former Clark County Sheriff Jamie Knoll. His wife filed for divorce today. And that's not all. New search warrants tie a current Clark County councilman to Knoll's alleged lavish spending. Lindsay Allen here tonight to walk us through all of it. Yeah, guys. Well, first, the divorce petition. Misty Knoll claims that her marriage is irretrievably broken and says the couple has been separated since April. Jamie Knoll will be served at the Scott County Jail, where he remains on a one and a half million dollar bond. This is, are we on, Laura? Yes, sir. 10 C01 2403 F6 230 State of Indiana versus Casey. No, um, I've had several motions filed. It was last Friday, Sonna. And I think I initially filed several motions on Thursday, then filed by followed by more motions on Monday and okay. yesterday. All right. Um, so we'll take up some of those motions. All right. Hey, hey are sitting here at the moment so Sonny would you like to argue? I would, judge. Yeah. I would if the court would allow I know we're here for several matters most of which were filed by me I'd like to begin by arguing my motion to continue Casey's jury trial does that please the court no objections thanks judge judge I primarily filed this motion to continue because the present course of Casey's defense did not present itself until it became clear that Jamie Knoll would not be returning to the family home at the beginning of June, and that instead he would remain incarcerated in the Scott County Jail. Since then, with Casey and her mother and her sisters away from Jamie's physical presence and his physical control, a much clearer picture of the control and the manipulation and the relationship that he had with his immediate family has emerged. As I began to realize that during the month of June after Jamie remained in Scott County, I started looking for an expert in the area of coercive control. Coercive control is essentially a pattern of controlling behavior and abusive manipulative behavior that can change the way that a person processes information and change the way that they're able to respond when that person tells them to do something. And I think it's very important here. Judge, I was able to find Dr. Lisa Fontes, who is an expert in that area from the University of Massachusetts, and I engaged with Dr. Fontes in July of this year. I believe that Mr. Matt Mahan has also engaged with this Mrs. Dr. Fontes on behalf of his client, Misty. Judge, I disclosed that she was going to be an expert in this case formally last week. I'm asking for a continuance so that Dr. Fontes has the time that she needs to get into this case to look at the evidence, to look at the types of communication that Jamie had with his family, with his daughters, with his wife, and to look at the ways that he controlled and manipulated them and what their life was like. I'm also asking for continuance for another related reason, Judge, and that is because in the past week or so, I have received additional discovery from the state of Indiana. On July 31st, there was a discovery disclosure filed into Casey's case. I believe that the information in that disclosure will be forthcoming from Mr. Hurdle. I do not have it yet, 
However, I know that it does involve some recent search warrants that name Casey, and it's clearly very important that I get that and I'm able to review it. But secondly, Judge, and perhaps more importantly, I requested at a status conference in Washington County that I be provided with all of the jail phone calls that Jamie Knoll has made while incarcerated in the Scott County Jail. I'm entitled to those as a piece of discovery. The state police are listening to them. And someday, two days ago, I began to receive those calls. The format that I'm receiving those voluminous calls in is that I'm getting forwarded emails from the Scott County Jail. Attached to each email are approximately three telephone calls. And so far, I received probably 250 emails. So 250 times three are the number of calls that I believe I have right now. Due to that formatting, I'll need to download those calls, organize them, and before I can even begin to understand what they are or how to use them. I also think that those phone calls are going to be some of the most important pieces of evidence for Dr. Fontes to review in her evaluation. So those things are very important to me, Judge, and I'm here to ask for a continuance, not for the sake of delay, but so that I can present for Casey the best defense that exists, and that's what I'm here to do today, Judge. That's why I filed the things that I filed and why I'm asking for this continuance. As the court is aware, I also filed, among my other filings, a request for a discovery deadline. Judge, we know this investigation is ongoing. I know the state police continue to do search warrants. I know they made some calls regarding Casey's case last night. And all of these things result in additional discovery. And additional discovery forces me to ask for time to review that. I don't want this to be something that continually happens, Judge. And so today, I'm asking for a discovery deadline prior to the trial date so that there is a cutoff for the state of Indiana to provide discovery to me that I have to review and prepare to defend. Judge, I think it's important that we realize that at some point, the investigation has to cease and a resolution must be had. That resolution can be had in several different ways. It can be a trial, it can be via negotiations, but these charges were filed in March and this is not a situation on behalf of Casey, because she shares my thoughts on this, that we want to continue indefinitely. We want this wrapped up one way or another, Judge, and I'm here to ask that her case be set with Misty Knoll's case in October, which is, I suppose, approximately two and a half months away at this point, and we have a further motion to order regarding Joinder. Uh, Ms. Bush, I'll tell. At, at our status conference in Washington County, uh, I indicated that I would not be inclined to continue the trial date unless there was significant movement on one or both sides. I, I haven't heard that there's significant movement one way or another. So why, why did you wait so late to uh, retain the expert? Judge, movement as far as negotiations? Yes. Judge, I would note Not that, that I'm entitled to know the state in the I, negotiations. I but I'm happy to give a brief outline to discuss that. Judge, there has been some movement regarding negotiations. There have been some further conversations. I did make Mr. Hurdle aware that the expert would be forthcoming. However, there is a process that governs us right now through the Attorney General case regarding any money that may be spent for Casey's defense. So there is a process I have to go through to make the Attorney General aware of any requests that I'm going to be making. So everything in that case has the ability, to some extent, to delay the things in this case because we are working very cooperatively with the Attorney General regarding that injunction. Okay, but apparently they've authorized you to expend funds to obtain this expert witness, correct? Judge, I have sent the request to them. I would leave it at that for now. Some of our negotiation discussions with the Attorney General are confidential. I do not want to violate that. I understand. But I would stay on, stay on the record that Ms. F Dr. Fontes has agreed to be our expert in this case as well as Ms. Misty's case. Mr. Hurdle. <laughs> Your Honor, with re uh, respect to the, uh, the motion to continue, um, 
Candidly, the state has, has no objection to the, uh, the continuance. Uh, the state, as well as a defense, I think doesn't want to prolong this case indefinitely. I know the court doesn't either. Um, if the court told us way to be prepared, we would be prepared. Um, maybe as the court had mentioned before, Casey Knoll and Missy Knoll's case maybe is not quite as complicated as uh, Jamie Knoll's is. Uh, dealing with um, tax issues as well as the expenditures on the American Express card. Um, but we do see some value in um, moving this and allowing for the continuation of discovery. The state would have serious concerns, though, about trying to try this in a couple of weeks, given the fact that an expert for the defense was just disclosed and a, um, a defense of sorts is being, I guess, proposed at least to the court and to, uh, to the state right now with uh, Dr. Dr. Fontes. Um, and I think the state was going to need some time to at least um, maybe depose her or at least have an uh, informal conversation with her, uh, whether that be via Zoom, whether it be telephone or in person or all the above, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but having just received her name last week puts the state in, in, a, in a bit of a bind. Um, so with that, the, the state has no objection to the continuance. Um, oh. And just, I know um, Ms. Bush discussed the uh, discovery deadline. Um, you know, all due respect, the defense wants and is entitled to what we're finding in search warrants, in interviews, and everything else, because some of them may be exculpatory and some of them may not be exculpatory. They may not realize that my duty is anything exculpatory has got to be turned over because of Brady. And if I don't, then I'm subject to ethical violations and et cetera. So I think for the court then to cut off all discovery puts me in a trick bag that if I get something, say a jail call, say Jamie Knoll makes a phone call that is exculpatory to Misty Knoll or to Casey Knoll, and are we saying, okay, you can't turn that over, Mr. Hurdle. Discovery deadline's passed, we're finished. And it's something of significance to them. So it's, it's as they want to maybe have their cake and eat it too, you want this information, but you want the deadline nailed down also. So I'm not sure what the result is, but I feel like I have a duty to turn this over, and I will continue to turn it over until the court says, Mr. Hurdle, stop turning things over. And I, I don't know that I, that ever ends, um, as long as it's potentially exculpatory. So I know those were the two things that um, Ms. Bush brought up in her, her argument on the continuance and then on the discovery deadline. Um, I don't believe we got into the um, motions in limine or the joiner at this point, but uh, I'll address those as, as they come. Um, Mr. Hurdle, there's been 67 search warrants, which is a large number of search warrants for a particular matter. And I, I've signed all of them, and I'm aware that the last several have mentioned uh, Casey Knoll as someone you're seeking information about. And I don't know whether you've got that information or not. Um, is there possibilities that there may be additional charges against Casey Knoll? Your Honor, in complete candor to that, I, I don't know. Uh, there have been discussions with the state, uh, as the prosecutor's office, with the Indiana State Police, saying, guys, do we have, maybe we need to turn this spigot off at some point in time and say enough is enough and we play the hand that we're dealt right now in a very um, figurative sense that we deal with the charges. But there is a little bit of an obligation that I think the state police believe as well as the, uh, the state of Indiana the prosecutor's office believe that if we're presented with potential additional criminal charges, do we have a duty or responsibility to file a criminal charge based on those? Um, I know that's a long way getting to, to what your question was. Are there going to be additional criminal charges? The, the answer is I don't know. I think it depends on what these warrants or what information still can surface um, at this point in time. And um, while the case itself may not be super complicated, there are enough layers here that there are things that have been hidden by 
the defendants um, that the state has not uncovered at this point in time, and, and there may be still some uncovering at this point in time. Ms. Bush Saltel, would you like the last, like the last word? Excuse me. Thank you, and I would just note that Mr. Hurdle used the phrase "turn off the spigot." I think with my motion for a discovery deadline and, and exactly what that looks like, I think we could discuss. But right now, Casey's been charged since March. No further charges have been filed against her since March. I am preparing for a trial, Judge. I'm retaining expert witnesses. I'm preparing to schedule depositions. And my request, just as Mr. Hurdle put it, is to turn off that spigot in some way or another so that we can proceed. Thank you. Mr. Hurdle mentioned something about the court uh, saying, we're going to have a trial, get ready. Well. I denied the motion to continue summarily uh, last Friday, indicating that I wanted to hear further argument in regards to that matter. And as requested, um, I got the motions in limine and the proposed um, preliminary instructions, and I appreciate the uh, prompt response. So. Since the state does not object, I will grant a continuance. I'm not sure how long, and I don't know whether it'll be at the same time as Misty's. I want to hear your arguments in regards to Joinder. So Thank you, may, you, Judge. You may proceed. And, Judge, if it would please the court, Mr. McMahon and I have filed nearly an identical motion in Missy Knoll's case and Casey Knoll's case regarding the joinder, we'd ask to argue those together to expedite the court's time and Mr. Hurdle's time and the time of the witnesses and everyone any, present today. Any objection to Mr. Hurdle? No, Your Honor. Mr. McMahon, any objection? No, thank you, Your Honor. So, whoever would like to proceed? Uh, Judge, I'll proceed since Misty was a defendant before you before Casey was. Uh, as the court is familiar, and actually we are in the state as, the allegations against both Casey and Misty, we have failure to pay income taxes related to the allegation that there were abuses of the uh, New Chapel American Express card where purchases were made and they were not claimed as income and were unauthorized with the state of legends. That is what we have with these two women. And it's the same American Express account. The only difference between the cases are that we have two defendants and we have different sets of income tax returns that, that will show what was claimed, what was not. Otherwise, the American Express statements are the same for each. And the most compelling reason for showing her, Your Honor, I think is to ease the burden on Clark County, Indiana. I am happy to be an attorney who appears in Clark County regularly and knowing the notoriety of this case, Finding two juries is going to be difficult. Uh, I don't know how many jury summonses will go out. You know, typically in a high-profile case, 150 go out by my experience in this area. Last time I had a high-profile jury trial was last year in Floyd County, Indiana, and 150 summonses went out. Um, I would expect it would be more so here because we have um, the no name attached to this. That's significant, and Your Honor is aware that Jamie O was uh, a respected law enforcement officer, the Fusion Arm Chair, and more importantly, the chair of the Republican Party for the 9th Congressional District here in Indiana. So his name is recognized substantially. And when we consider judicial economy, it's the idea of saving the state, the taxpayers, the community, the burden of having two trials when one would suffice. I would expect that if you join these two cases, Your Honor, uh, a four-day trial for Misty or a four-day trial for Casey may turn out to be a six-day trial for both. And it eases the burden on the court staff, Your Honor, who travels from Washington County, Indiana, and also for the defendants. And we know that we are sacrificing something by asking for this because we have to combine our jury strikes, things of that nature. Um, the only complicated would be and so far as Misty is charged with a level five felony, she's entitled to a 12 person jury. Whereas Casey, looking at level six felony, she would get a six person 
Sure. And I think that's something that could be resolved on the back end by agreement, or I imagine that bridge has been crossed somewhere, although I've not researched it yet, Your Honor. But looking at Joyner, there's one person who has the discretion to say yes or no, and that's you. You, be, you are able to say, yes, I'm going to do this, or no, I'm not going to do it. And it's a discretionary call, and it's one that we think the facts of this case support it, right? Because the charges are so alike. It is out of the same PCA and search warrants that the state has filed against Jamie They are, for lack of a better term, derivative defendants in that investigation. And the proof overlaps so much with hand and glove. We think that joint was wrong. Thank you, sir. Mr. McMahon. Yes, sir. You, you brought up one point that was of great concern to the court that uh, Misty has level five felonies and Casey has level six felonies. I don't disagree that they're charged with similar offenses, except they occurred on different dates and times and for different purposes. I'm not sure exactly how to make it fair to either one of them by joining them with Casey's being a level six, which is a six person jury, and, and Misty's being a level five. Uh, I, I don't disagree that prop, the state's probable witnesses are the same, but they were not charged as code defendants at the same time. So that's some of the court's concern. Can you help alleviate that? Judge, the, the, the simplest solution to that concern, I think, would be that uh, the court and panel, six person jury and a 12 person jury. You have a Misty Null jury, you have a Casey Null jury, because otherwise, the state and or Casey Null would have to agree that a 12 person jury would be proper, proper for Casey Null's case. And, and I know that that's unique, it's different, <laughs> but I do think that that would still serve judicial economy and serve the interests of Clark County, Indiana, as far as the cost and the expense, and also make it easier to suit a jury in these cases. Because once you have one trial, I'm looking at our friends from the media, and I'm counting four cameras right now. It's going to be harder to set a second trial. And so I do think that Joiner makes sense in this regard, Your Honor. And how we solve that problem is something that we would have to look into and try to do that. And I hope I've answered your question. I'm not trying to be flippant or smart, but it, it's a unique issue, as you just mentioned. Thank you. Well, and I give you credit. I think that's an innovative idea. I'm not sure it's allowed, but we'll find out. I'll, I'll consider it. Mr. Hurdle. Your Honor, I mean, joinder for trial purposes means the same jury. Um, the, the second proposal, while innovative as it may be, the state believes that's a mess. If we're going to see one jury to listen to Casey, six person, a 12 person to listen to Misty, are they supposed to talk amongst each other? Are they allowed to talk amongst each other? Are they going to deliberate together? Are they not going to deliberate together? The state believes that is a, uh, a disaster um, right for any appeal purposes down the road. Um, the, the state would, would certainly object to that. The, the other issue is whether or not six person or 12 person, whether one of them would waive the 12 person, Misty, or whether Casey would waive or ask the court to allow her a 12 person is something the state uh, would need to consider. Um, I, don't, I don't know at this point in time in complete candor again to the court. I know the court has brought this up. Mr. McMahon now has brought it up as well. Uh, a level five, a level six, two very different, at least in the state of Indiana, jury pools and uh, six versus 12. And the way it was set up, uh, whenever it was, six versus 12 was done for a reason. And uh, um, I don't know that I want to be the test case for uh, a waiver of that. Um, so I guess, uh, Your Honor, the, the state would ask for a, a short period of time, whatever that may be, to look into this issue five versus six 
um, level felonies, 12 person versus six person. And I'll just leave it at that, Your Honor. But the state is certainly not prepared to agree to uh, two separate juries hearing this case because I, I believe that's logistical uh, a nightmare. Mr. Hurl, how much time would you like to request to research uh, that issue? Your Honor, a week or less. So, by counsel for defense? Because I think today is Tuesday. I think if we could have an answer to the court next Monday, that would be appropriate. Mr. McMahon? Judge, uh, that's agreeable. Thank you. Thank Perhaps you. it might make sense, Judge, right. if the court would like to set a telephonic status conference or something to that effect next Monday to discuss with all parties? Well, I'll give you till next Tuesday at noon. That'll give me time to look at it, and then uh, we can have a telephonic status conference uh, sometime shortly after that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Ms. Bush Saltel, do you have something else? I do. I, I have more, Judge. First, I would address. Per the court's order on Friday, I complied. I filed several motions in limine. I filed preliminary jury instructions. With the court's granting, at least to some extent, my motion to continue Casey's trial, I would request that a further date be set to hear those, as well as any additional that may be filed due to the recent discovery. Is that agreeable to the court? Mr. Hurdle? Your Honor, um, as long as the state may have an opportunity at some later point in time to either object or agree to the motions in limine that the uh, defense has filed, I, I, I no objection. Just moving that uh, to the next hearing date uh, that we have prior to the trial. And that is my request, Judge. Not to have them granted today, but to leave them pending and set them for another date. That's fine. Um. All right. I believe the last thing that I have pending, Judge, that I filed recently is a motion to slightly modify the terms of Casey's bond. And Judge, if the court is aware, since March, Casey has had a term of her bond that she must remain in the state of Indiana. There have been no violations of that. There have been, been no violations of any sort of Casey's bond. However, Judge, I'm asking to modify that slightly for several reasons. The first of those is that Casey and her mother Missy and her sister Gracie are all employed here locally full time. They have varying hours. Sometimes Casey works late. Sometimes she has to be there earlier. The same for her mother and sister. And as I stated before, we are working under the Attorney General regarding some things, regarding assets and those sorts of things. And currently, the three ladies are sharing two cars. Gracie currently works in Louisville. Missy and Casey work here in Indiana. However, they had to work out a schedule to pick each other up, drop each other off, all of those things. And it would greatly ease the strain on the three of them if Casey were able to drive to Louisville to pick up Gracie, to drop off Gracie, to do those sorts of things surrounding their employments and the ways that they're having to work together considering the current order from the Attorney General. Secondly, Judge, and perhaps more importantly, uh, yes. One moment. So you're telling me out of the hundreds of cars that was under the control of the Knoll family, I guess, there's only two left? Judge, there are two cars that are the type of cars that Misty Knoll, Casey Knoll, and Gracie Knoll are comfortable driving. They have no desire to drive around in Jamie Knoll's collectible car collection. They would not be comfortable doing so. It would not be appropriate to do so. Why? Which I think the women of the Knoll family are attempting to avoid public attention and public scrutiny. And also many of those cars, Judge, are old cars. They don't know if they're functional, those sorts of things. Perfectly. Thank you, Judge. And secondly, and again, perhaps more importantly, due to the geographic nature of our area, our larger metro area is local. Our health centers are there. Our hospitals are there. Our mental health services. Many of them are located in the Louisville metro area. Casey has need of mental health services and health services. 
And being able to go to the Louisville metro area would greatly open her ability to have access to more providers and more specific providers. And so primarily, I am asking that the bond be modified for that reason, Judge. And I would ask the court to note that due to the geographic nature of our reason, of, of our region, many people who are charged in southern Indiana actually live in Louisville. I believe, due to my practice in other surrounding counties, that all of the counties that run along the river have bond terms that allow people to at least go to the Louisville metro area due to that. And so I'm simply Ms. asking... Ms. Bush, I'll, tell, I'll yes, tell you, I don't care what other jurisdictions do. No consequence to me. So you might as well forget that argument. That, that is just fine, Judge. I was done with it anyway. And so, Judge, I, I'm simply asking for that slight modification. It's certainly at the court's discretion whether to grant it or not. I saved it for last today because I do believe it is the least important thing that we had to address here. But I wanted to put it in front of the court. Thank you. Um, she won't be going to any Irish pubs for celebration? That would not be the intent, Judge. Mr. McMahon. <sighs> Thank you, Judge Medlock. I, I filed a similar motion on behalf of Ms. Dino, and it's one she's been a defendant for about seven months right now, Your Honor. And she, there's no allegation that she has violated bonds whatsoever. Um, I think she's shown proper respect to the jurisdiction of this court. I, I have no reason to doubt that, Mr. McMahon. Yeah, it's one she works here in Clark County, Indiana. Um, the court's been gracious enough to allow her to visit me in my office in Louisville without having to ask for permission because the court noted that gets into the Sixth Amendment privilege that she has quite a bit. And your honors also allow her with approval to go to Louisville for medical appointments. Uh, th this is one of the most unique cases I've ever and, been And go to her daughter's uh, celebration. So, and, and Judge, we do not thank you enough because that was very important for the family under a hard time. And thank you, sir. Um, and I did not mean to make short trip to that or, or not acknowledge that, sir. Um, well, I thought it was important that she'd be able to attend. And the family values that, Judge, thank you. Uh, the No family lives in a bubble here, in Floyd, Clark, even Harrison County. Uh, we're, we're not asking for a party pass under any circumstances, Your Honor, at all. It, it's just to take care of Gracie, and I think the court is aware that she is uh, a child on the spectrum, and to make sure that she's okay, because if there is an issue, we need to help her. And I know that because I have an autistic child. Um, it matters to be able to take care of her. Um, and this family loves Gracie very much. They want to take care of her, make sure that she has that invisible safety blanket that she needs. Um, and Judge, we're not asking for to go to sporting events, to go to parties, to go to bars. It's just to be a regular person. And we understand that they are, there are terms of bond. Um, these women have posted their bond. Misty has done so. And if anything, they want privacy. They want a quiet life. Because if they were to go to dinner tonight at Texas Roadhouse off Veterans Parkway, people will take their photos. That happens to them. They have no privacy. They are a spectacle wherever they go. And so they are living in isolation within their own community. They get a little bit more anonymity in Louisville, but I'm not asking that they're allowed to go and live as though they're on spring break under any circumstances. And the other point I would like to add, Your Honor, with regard to the bills at the pole barn, I had the pleasure of touring the pole barn a couple of months ago. There's a 1959 Cadillac that does not have a door handle to open it. Uh, there is a antique Clark County Sheriff police car. All of these are hot rods. Um, you know, it, it is something that looks like later in life, somebody who loved hot wheels and matchboxes were able to buy them. They're not functional cars. We've asked the Attorney General for leave to purchase a car so that there's more reliable, um, modest transportation. And we're just asking that they have a little bit of liberty for the purpose of the family. And that's it, Judge. We don't want to um, create a spectacle or show disrespect to the court or the state of Indiana. 
but I think that these women have lived um, in public scrutiny that is unusual, and it's one that they want to make sure that Gracie, who works over in Louisville, has the safety net that she needs. And that's the nature of the promotion, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Herbal. Your Honor, the, the state is not without empathy toward Misty or Casey or Gracie. Um, and I know that the court is not either. If there are doctor's appointments, if there are medical issues, if they need to see their attorney or there's some other issue other than Gracie's work that the court would deem appropriate, the state's position would be file the motion, let the court make that decision. Now, I, I'm not trying to bombard the court with motions to go to and from Louisville, but how often are doctor's appointments, how often are dentist appointments, chiropractors, things of that nature. I, I wouldn't think that many, and the state certainly is not going to object um, to those situations, much like it didn't object to the family going to Gracie's event in um, Louisville when uh, it was a work situation. Um, I, I would point out to the court that on 318 of this year, the court issued an order clarifying terms of bond. Defendant shall remain in the state of Indiana. Defendant shall not consume illegal drugs or alcohol. That the defendant shall not consume or commit any new offenses. Restrictions were not mentioned in the defendant's initial hearing. And without the court's knowledge, did not appear in her bond form. Additionally, the state may consider, the court may consider permission for the defendant to leave the state upon request by the defendant in writing. And I think that was done as a, if to avoid this issue here of the back and forth to Louisville at, uh, at a whim. And so the state would ask the court to kind of follow those original conditions of bond. And if there are issues that come up, then we deal with those. Maybe if they're that often, then we deal with those via Zoom or a conference call or something like that. Um, and I don't think the state's going to stand in the way of those certain things. I would point out that both defendants do work in the state of Indiana. This is a benefit for younger sister or daughter, Gracie. And, and, and while she may need some assistance or help, I don't know, I'm without knowledge whether or not she has a valid driver's license. I know that there was a graduation recently from a, uh, a university. So I, I don't know what limitations um, are prohibitive of her being able to go back and forth if she has a valid driver's license. Um, but uh, bond is supposed to be restrictive, um, and it is restrictive on those two. The fallout is on younger sister or daughter. But that's because of this position that they have put the court in and themselves in, nobody else. I'd ask the court to consider that. I'm not unsympathetic to to Gracie, as Mr. Hurdle said, I'm quite sympathetic. And I also agree with Mr. Hurdle that these ladies have they made decisions that brought themselves here. And there has to be some type of uh, restraint. Uh, counsel, if you will file with the court the list a list of automobiles identified by make model and year that they have available to them and the the vehicles they currently utilize for transportation and under seal where they would be going to in Louisville I'll, I'll review that and then make a decision. Thank you, Judge. In, in regards to the scrutiny uh, and getting their photographs taken, well, they're not the only ones that that happens to. It seems to happen to me on a fairly regular basis. It's my understanding that uh, some scammers are now using my name to try to collect funds uh, from unwitting citizens. So, we're all under scrutiny. Anything else, Ms. Bush, I'll tell? Judge, I believe that concludes everything that I can file for today's date. Mr. McMahon? Nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you for giving us your attention. Mr. Hurdle? 
Your Honor, the, the issue of the, uh, the continuance, it's taken under advisement as far as a, a rescheduling date at yes. this point in time. And the, uh, the discovery deadline will also be taken under uh, advisement as well, Your Honor? It will. Okay, that's all I have. Once, once we determine what the new date will be and or whether it's going to be joined, uh, then we'll establish those dates and times. Unless there's anything else, we'll be off record. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, oh. The uh, the time for the uh, filing or uh, position of the parties on the joinder um, will be noon next Tuesday. Is, yes. And is that something that we will handle via phone call to your office or uh, are we to come back here? I would prefer that both parties, all three parties, file a brief with the court and then we'll have a discussion after that. Okay, thank you. Depending Jeff. on the arguments that are that are made. Um, I don't know that I necessarily will require an additional hearing, but I would like your your uh, supplemental arguments uh, filed with the court by next Tuesday at 12. Thank you, Judge. Anything else? No, sir. Okay, we'll be off record. Thank you all. Several weeks ago, the fourth civil action was filed against Jamie Knoll. This one, by his nieces and nephews, related to the estate of his deceased brother, William Leon Knoll. They're alleging that Jamie Knoll, as personal representative for the estate, sold his brother's home located in Jeffersonville to his daughter, Casey Knoll, for $180,000, despite the property being worth more. After the mortgage on the home was paid, $112,000, closing expenses were deducted, and defendant Casey Knoll was gifted $36,000. A check in the amount of $25,545.78 was issued to the estate of William Leon Knoll. Defendant Jamie Knoll then deposited the check into the estate checking account at Fifth Third Bank. Defendant Jamie Knoll, as personal representative, did not reimburse the estate for the $36,000 in equity that he gifted his daughter, thereby depriving the plaintiffs of part of their rightful inheritance. Jamie sold another home for just under $120,000, depositing that money in the Fifth Third Bank account. Jamie Knoll, as personal representative, wrote a check from the estate account to Paul Lockhart Construction in the amount of $8,000 for basement work on the property prior to the sale. He paid Paul Lockhart Construction another $8,232.30 via a PayPal account that was linked to an American Express account for the Utica Township Volunteer Fire Department. On May 29, 2019, defendant Jamie Noel wrote himself a check for $16,000 from the estate bank account to reimburse for basement work on the home, despite having actually not paid for any of the work. Defendant Noel improperly paid himself that $16,000, depriving the plaintiffs of part of their inheritance. In October of 2019, as personal representative, he filed a verified closing statement with the probate court asserting that all assets have been collected, deeded, administered upon, and were ready to be distributed to the heirs. The verified closing statement also asserted that the personal representative had provided all statutory notice to all interested parties, along with a copy of the closing statement. However, the plaintiff never received any paperwork concerning the estate or any asset therein from defendant Noel. In October 2019, Noel distributed $30,000 to his nephew. Then in December, he took $52,000 from the estate and didn't give them anything. He went and bought a 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner. Then in December, he wrote 
checks to the remaining two children of his brother, totaling $36,000. However, those checks bounced due to insufficient funds. In January of 2020, Noel took $52,500 from the Utica Township Firefighter Association bank account and deposited it into the Noel estate checking account. And then he obtained two cashier's checks for his niece and nephew. Wow, this guy is a total piece of garbage. A fifth lawsuit was filed civilly against Jamie and Misty Knoll. This one by the Board of Fire Trustees, Utica Township Fire Protection Division District. And it was also against the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association doing business as New Chapel Emergency Medical Services and New Chapel Volunteer Fire Company. This is an attempt to recover some of the funds that Jamie Knoll so kindly dissipated. A joint motion and tender of conditional negotiated plea that purports to be signed by you. Is that your signature? Yes, Your Honor. Now, before I can accept a guilty plea, I must be satisfied you fully understand your constitutional rights, that your plea of guilty is being made freely and voluntarily, and that you've in fact committed crimes. Therefore, it will be necessary to ask you certain questions and hear some evidence. If you don't understand the questions that I ask or the words that I use, please let me know and I'll try to explain them to you in a manner you can understand. Feel free to speak with your attorneys at any time. Uh, for the record, state your full name and age. Jamie John Knoll, 53 years old. You ever been treated for any mental illness or emotional disability? No, Your Honor. To the best of your knowledge, you now suffer from any mental illness or emotional disability? No, Your Honor. Are you under the influence of any drugs, including alcohol, today? No, Your Honor. Do you read and understand the English language? Yes, Your Honor. And it's my understanding that you wish to withdraw your previously in a plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty pursuant to the terms of this document. Yes, Your Honor. I need you to understand you have a right to a speedy public trial by jury in this county. You have the right to face all witnesses against you. See here, question and cross-examine those witnesses. You have the right to have witnesses brought into court to testify on your behalf. And at your request, the court will issue subpoenas requiring those individuals to come into court to testify on your behalf or to bring evidence in. You have the right to have the state prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the right to remain silent, cannot be required to give any testimony or make any statements against yourself to anyone. You do have the right to be heard in your own defense at any hearing or trial concerning the charges against you. Anything you say, however, may be used against you. Do you have any questions concerning your rights? No, Your Honor. And do you understand that by pleading guilty, you're going to give up and waive each and every one of those rights? Yes, Your Honor. And if you were to have a trial and you were to be found guilty and sentenced, you would have a right to appeal your conviction and or the sentence to the Supreme Court of the Court of Appeals. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. And do you understand that by pleading guilty, you're going to give up and waive that right also? Yes, Your Honor. And you understand these convictions? may be used against you in the future to enhance a charge or to enhance a sentence. Yes, Your Honor. Level 5 felonies have a range of imprisonment from one year to six years with the advisory sentence being three years and up to a $10,000 fine. Level 6 felonies have a range of imprisonment of no time in jail if it's treated as a misdemeanor to two and a half years at the Indiana Department of Corrections with the advisory sentence being one year and up to a $10,000 fine. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Anybody offered you anything of any value to get you to plead guilty here today? No, Your Honor. Anybody threatened you, coerced you, forced you, or anyone else to get you to plead guilty here today? No, Your Honor. When you were charged, were you out on probation, parole, or on a, on a uh, suspended sentence? No, Your Honor. Were you out on a bond on any other case? No, Your Honor. And you've been represented by very competent counsel throughout these proceedings, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Satisfied with the advice of counsel and the outcome of the case? Yes, Your Honor. I'm not saying I'm accepting this. I'm not saying I'm not. Uh, because this is a level five felony, the court um, is required to have a pre-sentence investigative report uh, before you can be sentenced. you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Wilder, would you like to establish a uh, factual basis? Mr. Noll, would you stand? Raise your right hand to the best of your ability. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury? Testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Your Honor. You'll take a seat at the witness stand, please. And, Mr. Hurdle, the way I traditionally do it is I have defense counsel do a factual basis and then give the chance, the state an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions they may ask. Thank you, Judge. 
Thank you, Judge. Mr. Wilder. Mr. Noe, you've been previously sworn, correct? Yes, sir. And you're here today to change your plea that you originally entered in this case from not guilty to guilty, correct? Yes, sir. Prior to today, you met with your attorneys. Yes. Uh, we have met and explained each charge that has been filed against you. Yes, sir. We've explained the possible minimum and maximum penalties for each of those charges uh, to both your freedom and your finances. Yes, sir. We've also explained the difference between consecutive sentencing and concurrent sentencing. Yes, sir. We've explained to you that there's a potential that if you were to go to trial found guilty that you could be sentenced consecutively as well as concurrently as some of the charges, right? Yes, sir. And we met throughout the time this case was pending. We reviewed the discovery provided by the state. Yes, sir. We reviewed thousands of pages of financial documents. Yes, sir. We reviewed a multitude of documents that were related to vehicle transfers and purchases. Yes, sir. We were provided hours of taped statements of witnesses. Yes, sir. We listened to those statements. Yes, sir. And we, in addition, had written transcripts that we reviewed. Yes, sir. Um, after reviewing the evidence, the documents, and listening to the statements, it has been your conclusion that the trial in this case would not be in your best interest. Yes, sir. And after reviewing the evidence, the statutes, and the law in this matter, you are before the court to admit your guilt and set out as set out in the plea agreement, right? Yes, sir. And you are prepared to admit that you knowingly and intentionally engaged in illegal conduct as set out in the charges that I'm about to go through with you, correct? Yes. Mr. Noll, as it relates to count one, corrupt business influence is a level five felony is that your admission here today that a period of time between November 9th, 2018 and August 16th of 2023 in Clark County, you knowingly or intentionally through a pattern of racketeering activities acquired or maintained either directly or indirectly an interest in or control of property or an enterprise contrary to the form of the statutes set out in Indiana Code 3545 6.2 as against the the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. And you admit those crimes. Yes, sir. As it relates to count two, theft, the level five felony, do you admit that on the third day of May of 2024, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over the property of the Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive Utica, the fire association, of any part or use of the value of the property, more particularly that you traded a Utica-owned Chevrolet Corvette, and that's in 2021, I apologize, Mr. Noll, that you traded a Utica-owned 2020 Chevrolet Corvette valued at $92,000 for a 2020 Mercedes-Benz, and that the red, and registered the Mercedes-Benz in your name, all of which is contrary to the form of statutes as provided by Indiana Code 354342, Subsection A, 3543-42, subsection A, subsection 2, subsection capital A, as against the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. And you admit that you violated those statutes and committed that crime. Yes, sir. As it relates to count three, theft, is it your admission here today that between January 2nd, 2019 and October 10th of 2019, in Clark County, Indiana, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over the property of the Volunteer Fire Association, hereafter I'll refer to as Utica, with the intent to deprive Utica of a, any part or use of the value of the property, more particularly the property had a value of $50,000 or more, and, it, you, and on January 2nd, you traded a Utica-owned 2017 Chevrolet 3500 Silverado for a 2019 Challenger SRT Hellcat and that you titled the Hellcat in your name. And on October 10th, 2019, you personally sold the Hellcat for $83,000, all of which is contrary to the form and statutes in, set out in 3543.42 and 3543.42 subsections A2 and capital A against all the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. And you admit that you committed that crime. Yes, sir. As it relates to count four, theft is a level six felony. You acknowledge and admit that between April 30th, 2021 and September 14th of 2022 in Clark County, Indiana, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over the property of Utica with the intent to deprive Utica of any part or use of the property, said property having the value of $750 or 
greater than $750, less than $50,000, then on or about the 30th day of April 2021, you traded a Utica-owned vehicle, a 2012 Porsche Panamera, and titled the Porsche in your name. And on September 12, 2022, you sold the Porsche for $32,000 and the, to a car dealership and deposited the funds into your personal bank account on the 14th day of September 2022, all of which is in derogation of Indiana Code 3543-4 and of the subparts. Yes, sir. And you admit that you committed that crime. Yes, sir. As it relates to count five, theft is a level six felony. You admit that on or between the dates of December 2nd, 2020 and September 28th, 2022, that in, U in Jeffersonville, Clark County, Indiana, you exerted unauthorized control over the Utica property with the intent to deprive the Utica property. The value of said property you took control of had a value of at least $750, less than $50,000. More particularly, on the second day of December, 2020, you traded a Utica-owned vehicle, a 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air, and the Chevy was in your name. And on September 27, 2022, you sold that Chevrolet for $39,500 to Kenny Eubanks and deposited said funds in your personal bank account on the 28th day of September 2022, all of which is contrary to the forms and statutes of the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. And you admit you committed that crime. Yes, sir. As it relates to count six, theft is a level six felony. You acknowledge and admit that on the, in between the 31st day of August of 2022 and the 14th day of September of 2022 in Clark County, Indiana, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over Utica property with the intent to deprive Utica of the use of that or the value of that property that had a value greater than $750 but less than $50,000. More particularly on August 31st, 2022, you obtained control of a Kubota tractor it was purchased in 2017 for $40,600 and sold it to James Boo Bishop for $31,000 on September 14, 2022 and deposited the check of $31,000 in your personal bank account. Yes, sir. And it's all in derogation of Indiana codes and statutes set out 3543-4, correct? Yes, sir. And you admit that you committed that crime. Yes, sir. As it relates to count seven, obstruction of justice, you affirm under the penalties, you affirm and acknowledge here today uh, that on or about the 16th day of August of 2023, you knowingly or intentionally altered, damaged, or removed records or documents or things with the intent to prevent it from being produced or used as evidence in an official proceeding, more or less, and in particular, you reset your iPhone. Uh, upon the arrival of the Indiana State Police to obtain your property, and that is count seven, obstruction of justice. Yes, sir. And you acknowledge and admit that you committed those offenses. Yes, sir. And you admit your guilt here today. Yes. As it relates to count eight, you acknowledge that on, the, on and between the 9th day of November of 2018 and the 31st day of December 2022, and your capacity. Mm -hmm. No, you're fine. So, Judge, the next several counts, we're going to use the factual basis to establish the basis for the plea to the, uh, the predicate accounts of official misconduct. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. So, as it relates to count eight, you acknowledge and admit that between November 19th and 2018 and December 31st of 2022, you did, uh, as a sheriff of Clark County and a public servant, knowingly or intentionally assign Michael Bowling, an employee of the Sheriff's Department, duties which were related to the operation of governmental agency uh, that the defendant served with. You assigned Bowling to do duties on your personal property, rental properties, father-in-law's property, pole bar property, and you could fire department property contrary to the forms of the statutes that sit out in Indiana. Yes, sir. As it relates to count number nine, you also acknowledge that between November 9th, 2018 and December 31st, 2022, and acting in your capacity as sheriff, you knowingly and intentionally signed Donald Jones, who is an employee of the Sheriff's Department, uh, to do duties related to the operation, and his duties were to, to work for the government, that you assigned him duties for your personal property, rental property, your father-in-law's property, the Polar property, and Utica Fire Department property, and that's contrary to the statute of the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. 
You acknowledge in count 10 that in fact between the 18th day of November 2018, 31st day of December 2022, likewise you were the sheriff of Clark County. During that time you assigned Rodney Hubry, an employee of the sheriff's department, to do duties while he was working for the sheriff's department. Uh, those duties were upon your personal property, rental properties, father-in-law's properties, pole barn, and property that was owned by the Utica Fire Department. Yes, sir. And then you acknowledge that in count 11, the same date and times between November 9th of 2018, December 31st of 2022, you in fact were the sheriff of Clark County. You did uh, assign duties to Brent Fisher, an employee of the sheriff's department. Those duties while he was on government time clock, there were duties for request in orders to do work on your personal property, rental property, father-in-law's property, pole barn, and property of the Utica Volunteer Fire Department. Yes, sir. And then as it relates to count 12, you understand that between the dates of November 9th, 2018 and December 31st, 2022, you were the Sheriff of Clark County, which is a public servant. You understand that? Yes, sir. And in fact, as you testified previously, during that time frame, you engaged in conduct as it relates to Mike Bowling by assigning him those duties while he was an employee working on the county's clock. That is uh, actions that constitute ghost employment, correct? Yes, sir. Then you acknowledge and admit that that is official misconduct as defined by the statutes in the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. And that is against the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana, and you admit that you are guilty of that as well. Yes, sir. As it relates to count 13, again, between the time frames of November 9th, 2018 and December 31st, 2022, you acknowledge and admit that Donald Jones was an employee while you were the sheriff. You assigned him duties while he was on the time clock for the sheriff's department that included the duties that you described for personal property and other properties that weren't sheriff properties, right? Yes, sir. And you acknowledge that that is, in fact, also the violation of Indiana Code related to the crime of official misconduct, and you admit that today. Yes, sir. And you acknowledge that that is a violation of law and you admit your guilt. Yes, sir. As it relates to count 14, once again, between November 9th, 2018 and December 31st of 2022, you acknowledge you were the sheriff of Clark County. Yes, sir. And in fact, during that period of time, you assigned Rodney Hubry, who was an employee working on the county clock to do duties and to undertake tasks at your personal property, your father-in-law's property, pole barn, as well as the Utica Volunteer Fire Department, and that also is in derogation of Indiana law, correct? Yes, sir. And you acknowledge and admit your guilt in count 14 to the offense of official misconduct, correct? Yes, sir. As it relates to count 15, you acknowledge and admit and agree between November 9th, 2018 and December 31st, 2022. In Clark County, you were the sheriff of Clark, of Clark County, Indiana, correct? Yes, sir. And in fact, during that time, you, uh, Brent Fisher was an employee of Clark County. Yes, sir. And it, while he was an employee and while he was working on the, the county's time clock, you assigned him and directed him to do duties on your personal property. Yes, sir. And property of the Utica Volunteer Fire Department and other entities that were not the government's entities, correct? Yes, sir. And you acknowledge and admit your guilt to count 15? Yes, sir. As it relates to count 16, theft is a level five felony. You acknowledge and admit that between February 5th, 2019 and December 20, 30, excuse me, December 31st, 2019, while in Clark County, Indiana, you did exert unauthorized control over the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association uh, property, which was the American Express card that you utilized. And then on that American Express card, you made charges in excess of $50,000, correct? Yes, sir. And that you did that knowingly and intentionally with the intent to deprive the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association of the value of the money used to pay the bill for those items that you purchased. Yes, sir. You admit your guilt to that. Yes, sir. Count 17, that you acknowledge and admit that between the dates of January 1st, 2020 and December 31st of 2020, you in fact exerted unauthorized control over the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association's property more particularly, and again, the American Express card, and that you utilized that card in excess of $50,000 for charges that were unrelated to the Utica Volunteer Fire Department and Fire Firefighters Association. Yes, sir. And then as a result of that, the funds used to pay those bills 
or funds that you exerted unauthorized control over without the consent of the Volunteer Fire Association? Yes, sir. You admit your guilt to those? Yes, sir. As it relates to count 18, theft is a level five felony. Once again, you acknowledge that between January 1st, 2021 and December 31st, 2021, you utilized the American Express card that was the property of the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive them of the use and value of the property, their funds that they used to pay bills that you uh, charged in excess of $50,000. Yes, sir. And that they did not have the benefit of the money that was used to pay those bills for items and things that were not items and things that benefited the fire department, correct? Yes, sir. And you admit your guilt to that? Yes, sir. As it relates to count 19, you also acknowledge between January 1st, 2022, and December 31st, 2022, you knowingly or intentionally un exerted unauthorized control over the fire association's property, once again, in the American Express credit card where you made charges without the consent or authority of the, Amer of the Utica Township Volunteer Fire Association in excess of $50,000. Yes, sir. Then Utica paid those bills with their money. Yes, sir. As a result of that, they lost the use and benefit of those funds. They didn't yes, have the money to spend. And in fact, the things that you purchased were for your benefit and did not benefit the Utica Volunteer Fire Association. Yes, sir. And you acknowledge and admit that that is a crime in the state of Indiana and you admit that you committed that crime. Yes, sir. As it relates to count 20, theft is a level five felony between the January 1st of 2023 and September 28th of 2023. You acknowledge that you exerted unauthorized control over the property of the Utica Township Volunteer Fire Association with the intent to deprive the entity of the part of use or the value of that property, more particularly that you utilize the American Express card and charges were made in excess of $50,000. Yes, sir. And once again, uh, that was done with the intent to deprive Utica of the value of the funds that they used to pay those bills. Yes, sir. And you did not have the authorization or the authority to spend it on the items that you purchased. Yes, sir. And that those items were, did not benefit the Utica Township Fire Department. Yes, sir. You acknowledge and admit that you're guilty of that criminal offense. Yes, sir. Count 21. You acknowledge and admit on the sixth day of March of 2019 that you made a false 2018 tax return and or you made a false statement in a 2018 tax return with the intent to defraud the state of Indiana, evade payment of taxes or any part thereof and that is imposed by Indiana Code 6.3 and that's contrary to the form of statutes in such cases made and provided for in 63611A and against the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana. Yes, sir. You acknowledge that in fact what I've said in a long way is that you engaged in tax evasion and that you admit that you committed that crime. Yes, sir. Count 22 as it relates to the time frame between April, about, on or about April 6th of 2020. In fact, you made false 2019 tax return or made false statements in your 2019 tax return, correct? Yes, sir. And that was with the intent to defraud the state of Indiana or evade payment of taxes and all in contrary to the form and statute of Indiana Code 6.3.6.11, correct? Yes, sir. You acknowledge that is a crime as well and you admit those things. Yes, sir. Count 23. On, on or about May 16th of 2021, you acknowledge and admit that on that date you filed a 2020 tax return that was a false tax return. Yes. Correct. And that you made the false tax return with the intent to defraud the state of Indiana or evade payment of taxes or any part thereof as defined by Indiana Code 63611. And you acknowledge that that's against peace and dignity of the state of Indiana that you admit that you committed that crime. Yes. As it relates to count 24, on or about the 18th day of April 2022, you acknowledge that you filed a tax return, correct? Yes, sir. That was your 2021 tax return? Yes, sir. And there were false statements in that tax return? Yes, sir. And those false statements were filed and created with an intent of defrauding the state of Indiana in order to evade payment of taxes, all of or any portion thereof in violation of Indiana Code 63611A. Yes, sir. Relates to count 25. You acknowledge that you filed your taxes on the 17th day of April 2023, correct? Yes, sir. That you filed a false tax return on that date and that that false tax return was a false statement for the purpose of defrauding the state of Indiana or to evade payment of all of or any part of your taxes that were due, correct? Yes, sir. And you admit that that's a crime in the state of Indiana and you acknowledge you committed that crime? Yes, sir. 
as it relates to count 26, that it set out between the dates of June 4th of 2019 and August 21st of 2023, knowingly or intentionally acquired or maintained an interest in, received, concealed, possessed, transferred, or transported the proceeds of criminal activity, and or you conducted, supervised, or facilitated transactions involving the proceeds of criminal, criminal activity, or invested, expended, received, or offered to invest, expend, or receive the proceeds of criminal activity, or funds that are proceeds or tax funds of criminal activity, and the person, and you knew the proceeds or funds were the result of criminal activity, and that exceeded the value of $50,000. Yes, sir. You acknowledge and admit that as a result of those facts that pursuant to count 26, you are admitting that you engage in money laundering. Yes, sir. Count 27, you acknowledge that between the period of June 26, 2019 and December 31st of 2022, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over mm -hmm. property of the Clark County Sheriff's Department with the intent to deprive the Sheriff's Department of any part of value or use thereof, and that these values are in excess of $50,000 particularly of December 31st, five lawnmowers in the amount of $18,651. On July 20th, 22, an HVAC system in the amount of $6,539. On June 26th, 2019, a Dodge Ram in the amount of $11,000. And on December, in December of 2022, 22 shipping containers in excess of $25,000. And you acknowledge that in fact, those things did occur, correct? Yes, sir. And in fact, you understand and admit today that you engaged in the criminal conduct as set out in count 27 as theft, a level five felony. Yes, sir. As it relates to count 28, that between March 31st of 2020 and November 29th of 2021, in Clark County, you knowingly, intentionally exerted an unauthorized control of the Utica Volunteer Fire Association property with the intent of depriving the Utica Volunteer Fire Association of the value of that property, property that was uh, unlawfully and in, in, in intentionally utilized for your benefit was child support payments in the amount of $50,968. Yes, and you acknowledge and understand that that is a crime in the state of Indiana and you admit that you committed that crime and that is theft as a level five felony. Yes, sir. Count 29. You acknowledge that between December 2nd, 2019 and January 21st of 2023 in Clark County, you knowingly or intentionally exerted an unauthorized control over Utica Volunteer Fire Association property with the intent to deprive the association of the use or value of the property and the value of that property exceeded $50,000. More particularly, in January 21st of 2023, a BMW that had a value in the amount of $21,000. May 1st of 2020, a 1957 Chevrolet that had a value of $40,000. August 13th, 2022, a 1966 Pontiac that had a value of $33,919. January 6th, 2020, a 1979 Pontiac that had a value of $20,000. December 2nd, 2019, a 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner with a value of $52,500. And on July 28, 2020, a 1959 Corvette with a value of $45,000. You acknowledge and admit that you exerted unauthorized control over that property and that the Utica Township Volunteer Fire Association were the owners of that property and you deprived them of the use and value of that property. Yes, sir. Mr. Yes. Wilder, I think yes. there was one that needed yes. overlooked on May 20th, 2020, 1970 Dodge. I'm sorry. As Mr. Hurls pointed out, in addition, in count 29 of May 20th, 2020, 19. 70 Dodge in the amount of $45,000. Yes, sir. And you understand that that is a violation of the law of the state of Indiana, and you acknowledge and admit that you're guilty of that. Yes, sir. As it relates to count 30, you understand and acknowledge that between the dates of February 17, 2022, and May 10th of 2023, in Clark County, Indiana, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over property of the Yuka Township Volunteer Fire Association with the intent to deprive the entity of the value or the use of that property. More particularly, the property had value in excess of $50,000. On May 10th, 2023, an HVAC system that was installed at the Turnberry Mansion in the amount of $2,700. March 22nd, 2023, a chimney repair at the Turnberry property in the amount of $11,200. March 23rd, 
February 17, 2022, an airplane purchased in the amount of $25,000. September 9th, 2022, an airplane repair in the amount of $16,616. And on July 13th, 2022, a Cut Cadet mower purchased in the amount of $11,000. You acknowledge and understand that those are properties that you exerted unauthorized control to the detriment of the Utica Volunteer Fire Department, and you did that with the purpose of uh, prohibiting them from having the benefit of that, correct? Yes, sir. And you acknowledge that uh, and understand that that is crime in the state of Indiana and admit that. Yes, sir. On the 31st day, excuse me, on count 31, you understand and admit that between November 9th of 2023 and March 29th of 2024, you knowingly or intentionally exerted unauthorized control over property of the Volunteer Firefighters Association with the intent to deprive the Firefighters Association of the value of the property and the value of the property was in excess of $50,000 more particularly, there were American Express credit card purchases in the amount of $37,151 and Sam's Club credit card purchases in the amount of $15,667. You understand that that is a violation of the law of the state of Indiana? Yes, sir. And that you acknowledge and admit that you committed that offense in count 31, theft is 11-5 felony. Yes, sir. Judge, I have no further questions of Mr. Null. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilder. Mr. Harold, do you have any uh, further questions to Mr. Noll? Mr. Noll, you don't you know you don't have to plead guilty to anything today, don't you? I'm sorry. You know you don't have to plead guilty to anything today? Yes, sir. I'm aware of that. It's your choice? Yes, sir. You're pleading guilty because you committed these crimes? Yes, sir. Nothing related to those questions, Judge. Thank you. Shameful. Mr. Wilder, do you have a motion? Your at this time I'd ask Mr. Noel if he joins me in asking the court to give us an opportunity to withdraw our previously entered plea of not guilty to all of the counts that we have uh, acknowledge we are guilty of an inner plea of guilty for each count as you've asked today. Yes, Your Honor. Judge, we'd so move. Well, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no today. I'm going to take this matter under advisement. Mr. Hurdle, Victims, as you are well aware, and Mr. Wilder is aware, have rights. And I'd like to hear from some of the victims, or a lot of the victims, at a date in the future in regards to whether they believe that this is an appropriate sentence or whether they don't believe it's an appropriate sentence. I, I think it, the offer is not inconsequential by, inconsequential by any means. Uh, it appears that Mr. Knoll spent approximately almost 10 years incarcerated with a period of uh, probation. And everybody knows when uh, you make a deal, I expect people to abide by it. When you violate probation, you serve the time. As I hope Mr. Knoll has learned from my previous actions that uh, I mean what I say and I say what I mean. So, Mr. Hurdle, who may potential victims, and I mean not just management, not just the Sheriff's Department, I mean EMS workers that have lost their jobs, paramedics that are, at, are not out there saving people because the money was diverted for pleasures. I want to hear from people that don't have $800 belts. I want to hear from taxpayers that have been aggrieved by the actions of this individual. And Mr. Knoll, if I don't accept it, we'll set it all aside. We'll start back over, and it will be as if nothing happened. So who, who shall they contact? Your Honor, they can contact uh, my office directly, and uh, we'll put them in contact with the, uh, the victim assistance coordinator in Ripley County who will be... Uh, reporting them to me. I would represent to the court that I at least have spoken to some of the management and attorneys 
at Utica slash New Chapel, and I've also spoken to uh, Sheriff Maples, and we've spoken to the Department of Revenue. Uh, I'm assuming that they can get word out to their employees or former employees, and if there is a, a concern, I, I don't know that it's within the state's ability to contact every employee of, of oh, no. those, but, but uh, we will make the uh, administration aware of what the court's order is today. I understand. So, what what number is that, Mr. Hurdle? Uh, 812. 689 6331 6331 Yes, Your Honor. Members of the press, I'm going to ask you to, to do a favor for me. Ask victims. And Mr. Bostock, you'll do the same thing? Yes, sir. Just not now. Not now, you're correct. <laughs> Tell your viewers that if they believe that they have been harmed, that they are a victim, contact Mr. Hurdle's office at 812-689-6331. You may have to hire extra help, Mr. Hurdle, to take all the calls. I don't know. There may not be any calls. But my, my guess is 31 counts. There's going to be a few victims that may want to be heard and I, I want them to have that opportunity if it becomes so overwhelming we may have to call some of them and uh, select but I, I want the taxpayers of Clark County to know that I'm willing to listen to them. Your Honor, do you, is it the court's pleasure that I instruct them to write a letter for the court to review or that they, I said they are welcome to, uh, to be a part of the next hearing to uh, make their representation to the I, court. I think they should be present. I, I, I'd prefer that I hear, I, hear, I hear them live as opposed to receiving a letter. Um, if they want to be heard, they ought to show up, in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Wilder? I've got nothing, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Hurdle? Nothing else, Your Honor. Okay. We'll be off record. Uh, hold on. Mr. Wilder, your client's entitled to be sentenced within 30 days. Yes, Your Honor. And I'm going to ask my, uh, my probation department to do the pre-sentence investigative report. Um, do you wish to be present when she speaks with your client? Judge, we believe that we want to be present when they uh, interview our client, and then judge at this time, Mr. Null, you join me in asking the court to waive the 30-day sentencing time frame in order to allow the court to have an opportunity to make sure we have everything together at the time of sentencing. Yes, sir. Judge, we still move the 30 days. Any objections? No, Your Honor. All right. Court will grant that request. Thank you, uh, Judge. Considering the number of victims and the number of charges and the amount of time that uh, we've invested here today, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Wilder. So, unless there's anything else, anything else from anybody else? Your Honor, is the court's pleasure to set the, uh, the date today or will we get notified from the court at a later date? Or when are we? Uh, Renee? I think I'll call everyone and get up and on. We're good. I got a miserable schedule and the court will not, or my staff will not allow me to uh, manage a calendar. For and, and, if it, and if it pleases the court, Mr. Walls wanted me to make sure that we get him involved since. He Tell Mr. Boyles, I'm sorry he didn't get to come down and visit with us today. I'm sure that he would prefer to be here rather than Fort Wayne. All right. Thank Unless there's you. anything else, we'll be off right. Thank you, Judge. At 12.36. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Captain Ron Gallup. I'm the Chief Public Information Officer for the Indiana State Police. I'm sure I've spoken to or otherwise communicated with many of you here in the room over the last, last 14 months. Uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a ride. The last 14 months has, has seen a, an incredible amount of investigatory uh, the arrest of uh, former uh, Clark County Sheriff Jamie Knoll on uh, November the 8th of 2023. This thing has even has picked up even more steam. And again, I don't need to tell you all about it because uh, you all have been following this very very closely in your reporting. Uh, this afternoon, uh, Special Prosecutor Rick Hurdle. Uh, has asked to have an opportunity to provide an update and bring us uh, bring us the latest in this in this uh, in this uh, really significant case. So, and I believe Mr. Hurdle will also provide an opportunity for some for some Q and A. So, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Special Prosecutor from Ripley County, Richard J. Hurdle. Rick, thank you. 
look like I'm taking up residence in Clark County. Um, I want to provide, like the captain said, an update on kind of the what's going on. But most of you have just sat through the hearing um, and the, uh, the plea hearing with uh, Judge Medlock and Jamie Knoll. And as you heard, we will have a sentencing date. Um, to be clear, Judge Medlock has taken the guilty plea under advisement. He's not entered judgment of conviction at this point in time and will not enter judgment of conviction uh, until sentencing occurs. And he will accept the agreement or not accept the agreement at that point in time. Um, as the captain said, there's been a lot of investigation for the last um, 14 months or so. And a, a special uh, kudos to uh, Detective Jeff Heron, who's the uh, lead investigator in this matter and Chris Hansen, uh, the detective who has assisted him basically from day one, and it, it has been quite a ride. Um, I will say that um, Casey and Misty Knoll are set for trial October 28th. Um, Judge Medlock issued an order last week outlining whether or not those will be joined for trial, and the sum of it is that if the parties can agree to a way to handle the jury, then they will be joined for trial. And if we cannot agree, they will be separate trials. And the oldest case will be tried first, which is Misty Knoll. Um, next are the two defendants that were just charged last week, John Miller and Brittany Faree, who had their initial hearing and bond hearing this morning that many of you were also present at. The, um, date in October is a pretrial, um, an opportunity to give the judge a status of where the cases are going and whether or not there will be a trial. The omnibus date, as the judge outlined, is a time in which both parties need to file certain motions by, and we do have a February trial date. Uh, so those are the five defendants that are facing criminal charges now. Um, their various ages, as you can see, with, um, with all five of them. And uh, we're going to move forward uh, uh, kind of as time allows. And uh, the next hearing date we'll wait for uh, from Judge Medlock on the, uh, the potential sentencing date. So I'll take questions. Um, I do have to be in Ripley County, uh, so I can't spend too much time here. Rick, uh, we hear a lot of times from victim impact statements with regards to sentencing. What do you make of just what the judge said regarding uh, soliciting more victims to contact your office? How, what do you think of that and how are you going to handle that? Well, my office has been in contact with the management uh, and the, uh, the sheriff's department as well as the Department of Revenue as we've outlined in the plea agreements that you see and that's how we came up with the restitution figures. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a lot, but I understand Judge Medlock's position that he wants everybody to have the opportunity how this crime has impacted them or their family, and if they are a victim, they should reach out according to him, and, and if it sounds like he's going to give each of them an opportunity to, uh, to speak in open court, and if they choose that they don't want to speak, I'm guessing that he will read a letter or if they want to type something up for him and pass that channel through through my office. I think that that's what he's asking us to do, and uh, that's that was a directive. We have complied with, uh, with the statute. We've spoken to um, Sheriff Maples, and we've spoken to, uh, to Utica and New Chapel and had conversations with them, as well as Department of Revenue. That's how we came up with those numbers. But uh, you may be getting dozens and dozens of phone calls now from multiple media outlets putting out your office number for contact. I mean, is that extraordinary from your Perspective? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, obviously, uh, every prosecutor's office deals with a number of victims, depending on what type of crime it is. Um, but this could be uh, somewhat overwhelming, and I hope that uh, that my staff uh, can can handle that. But I, I think we're going to comply with what the judge told us to do. And uh, it sounds like it may take a testing hearing if all of these victims are going to be permitted to come in and testify. And uh, I don't think. Um, it's my role to say, no, you can't testify, given the directive of the judge today. After Ms. Uh, Marie and Mr. Miller's hearing, their attorneys came out and painted their clients as cooperative witnesses who certainly never knew Mr. Noel was stealing and certainly never took anything in exchange for a vote. Um, do you have to prove a quid pro quo, or was their mere uh, status as council members and, and those interactions with Mr. Noel is that enough evidence uh, to prove the conspiracy? 
Well, I'd refer you to the probable cause affidavit. One's like 15, 18 pages, and the other's like 21 pages. So we're basing the charges on that probable cause affidavit, and it's it's the state's responsibility and, in essence, my responsibility to prove each and every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, and uh, I think that's what we're bound by. No more, but certainly no less than what uh, the statute outlines. But does it have to be like a direct quid pro quo, or is it merely a conflict of interest? Is that, are those two totally different things? Is kind of what I'm getting at. Well, I, I, again, I'm going to refer back to the statute, and I'm going to be bound by what it says in the statute. And uh, um, in, in fairness, there probably is not a ton of case law, such as in a drinking and driving or a murder case, where there's a ton of conflict of interest. Um, but the law is on the books to protect people um, and uh, a matter of transparency. And we believe that... Excuse me? Sorry. <laughs> Um, that uh, there was evidence of a crime, but again, it's going to fall back to whether or not we can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and the uh, the elements uh, got to be met, and what's contained in the probable cause affidavit is what we're going to use. What does the plea agreement, assuming it's accepted, do to uh, Ms. Free and Mr. Miller's cases? Does it change them? It doesn't change anything. Um, and I think uh, my only comment on that uh, coming down here is uh, job's not finished. Two questions, sir. Um, as far as the guilty plea to date, what does that do to the, uh, as far as the investigation into potential co-conspirators uh, still remaining out there? Is that something that it's going to be a continuing investigation, or does it pretty much, paraphrasing, die in, uh, with no? I, I think that's a... Uh, a question maybe for the state police, but I, I think that um, I don't want to handcuff them if there's evidence of a crime, whether there's a co-conspirator or another defendant or someone else. Um, I don't think it's in Detective Heron, and it's not in me to turn a blind eye okay. to if, uh, if we're presented evidence of, a, of an additional crime, to not at least look at it and weigh the options of, of potentially filing additional criminal charges on somebody. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, looking at Noel, or not Noel, uh, Miller and Faree, uh, it, it appears you all have uh, kind of chosen to use an umbrella charge. Uh, it, what is the theory behind not charging individual co uh, conflicts of interest and going with the one umbrella charge? Well, I think that uh, we just uh, looked at the time period of which that they were uh, members of the county council, and that, that's what we decided to uh, to move forward on okay. instead of trying to line out each and every time that something may or may not have happened. Okay. Thanks, Why is sir. 15 years appropriate? That seems to be on at least the lower end from when, of course, you're hearing the maximum possible penalties that were read at the initial hearings for, for Mr. Nolan. So um, it's the uh, state's position that... Uh, this is the upper spectrum of, uh, of the actual sentencing range. Um, you hear an F5 felony carries from one to six years, and then you're saying, Hurdle, what are you doing? He didn't. Ple he pled guilty to all these. Why can't you just stack, stack, and stack? Well, there's provisions within the state of Indiana that does not allow for things to be consecutive to one another, but allows for what's called concurrent, one with the other. And so our work in this, and uh, provided by uh, certain people that have helped me do this research says that we are on the upper end of the spectrum of this 15-year uh, sentence, and, and that's why we uh, um, did what we did. What's the top that he could, could or could have faced? I think the top, the top is subject to, uh, to uh, interpretation. Um, it's not so black and white. Um, if, if you ask some legal scholars, I think they may say seven years. There may be other people that say 20 years. Um, and I, I know that's, I'm, I'm probably not answering your question, say so just answer the question, but that's, that's not, it's not such a black and white um, topic that I can just say, here is the number, because there's single episodes of criminal conduct, there's multiple episodes of criminal conduct, there's concurrence, there's consecutive, and it's, it's not quite so clear, uh, but uh, you know, as, as I mentioned to, uh, to Mark, that uh, we believe this is the higher end of the spectrum of charges. So it's 15 years with three years of probation after? That's correct. Okay. And in regards to the restitution for the uh, victims, so UTVFA has just done a lot of layoffs, and they may be down to as few as eight employees. So you're paying out $2.8 to an organization that has just significantly downsized. 
Are you going to have any say in what they should do with that two point eight million? No, that, that's that's not my purview. That's going to be um, up to to Utica, and if the judge accepts this agreement. Uh, if he sets certain provisions, and I don't, if he accepts it, he accepts it as is. So that would go to Utica for them to uh, to handle as they see fit. That that's that's something I can't control. Can you shed some light as to why the uh, ghost employment uh, charges uh, were dismissed in the deal? Well, the ghost employment merged with that official misconduct. If you heard Mr. Wilder as he uh, established a factual basis with the defendant, he talked about that he um, had these people. Uh, a number of them, four or five, that worked on his properties, his father-in-law's properties, and, and a number of other properties, um, and that was in his capacity as sheriff. So they, they sort of merged together, and so that's why we felt the dismissal of uh, those four counts uh, was appropriate here. Given that the judge would like to hear from taxpayers, people who don't own the $100 belts, and you've seen some of the language in his courtroom, are you concerned that he may not accept this plea deal? Well, I think that's again a, a, a question probably better asked for him. I, I you know, I think that uh, weighing everything and being involved from the very beginning, um, hearing the investigation, charging, and then working our way through uh, through the discovery pot process, we felt that this was appropriate. But at the end of the day, the judge has to say, "I agree with you, Mr. Hurdle, Mr. Wilder, Mr. Voyles, Mr. Stewart," or uh, he says um, no, and then basically it's like he said that hearing never happened, and we start again and and set a trial date. And uh, if if that happens, then uh, we'll uh, we'll saddle up and uh, and go to trial if that's what we need to do. I'll, I'll ask the elephant in the room. The timing of Mr. Knoll deciding to go with a plea deal coincides with a lame duck governor that is a close associate. Is there concerns? I know my viewers have great concern that turn around in uh, December 31st, there's going to be a pardon of this. What, what is the likelihood, and uh, you know, what have you heard on your all's end? I, I can't speak to that. Um, I, I, I do not have the governor's direct line, and he's certainly not communicating with, with me, and um, I'm not communicating with him about the status of this case, and I have to control only what I can control, and that's uh, the prosecution of Jamie Knoll, and what happens after that, um, it's going to be out of my control, and so uh, we're, we're going to do our job, and then uh, you know, what happens, happens. Rick, can you shed any light on the conversations that led up to uh, Jamie Knoll accepting this well, that might be a question you have to ask Jamie Knoll. What uh, what was it he, in, in his mind to do it? I, I can't connect with Jamie Knoll. Everything is through his attorneys. Your conversations um, with my, my conversation uh, with them. Uh, ultimately, that uh, I think I sent it out last Friday was that um, he's admitting guilt because uh, he committed the crimes. You heard the question, the very one or two questions that I asked him. You don't have. You know you don't have to plead guilty here today. Why are you pleading guilty? It's because he committed the crimes. So that, that I can only speculate that that's what he said. Would it be fair to say you were a little surprised to be to get that notification that he was wanting to plead guilty? Uh, I think you do this long enough, it's hard to get surprised. But uh, I think that um, um, an agreement to 15 years of, of a sentence, um, at least proposing it to the court and to the judge, uh, we've come a long way since uh, that initial hearing back in November of 23. Do you think you were a, a faithful steward of the people of Southern Indiana in your regards and special prosecutor in this case? And do you think they should be proud of um, the deal that you've gotten both sides to agree to? You'll have to take a poll down here. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm, pro I'm probably not for everybody. Um, but I feel like um, there's been a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of um, um, heartache um, trying to take into consideration the, uh, the folks in Clark County, the victims in Clark County. Um, this is new terrain for me. I, you know, I'm two hours away from here, and uh, you know, I'm a, a, at times a little bit of a fish out of water. But uh, I feel like, um, you know, I may be biased, but the work that the state police have done and the attorneys who've assisted me, um, they should be uh, given a ticker tape parade. Do you think this case will serve as a deterrent to future public officials' misbehavior? Um, yeah, I think uh, sometimes you can change criminal mindset and sometimes you can't. Um, and whether or not this changes somebody, I, I hope so. Um, 
You know, I think that um, him going to uh, to prison for 12 years, if he if the judge accepts this agreement, um, should be a pretty big deterrent for a guy who lived the lifestyle that he lived leading up to this. I mean, you all know the charges on the uh, the America Expresses and the uh, the judge talking about $800 belts and Tom James suits and $180,000 there. Um, He's, it's about to be a wake-up call if the judge accepts this agreement. Two questions, temperature questions. Um, so, with Jeremy Knoll and the questionable spending from the sheriff's commissary, I know council members in Ripley County have brought it to attention, at least according to news articles up there. Do you see the potential for some revamping of the uh, requirements and uh, basically the strings attached to the sheriff's commissary fund? I mean, he was paying $10,000 a year to Sheriff's Youth Ranch, just like your old sheriff up in Ripley County yeah, was. I think that's something for the uh, the council, the commissioners, or the legislative body to deal with. That's again out of my purview. I mean mm -hmm. that uh, it's something that I don't control or can't control. Yes, sir. Do you anticipate, just based on the investigation so far, um, additional indictments, additional defendants? Um, I, I think there's a possibility of that. Yes. Um, I, I we're not prepared to move forward today or tomorrow. I think. Uh, we're uh, at least uh, evaluating Jamie Knoll's guilty plea and the initial hearing with uh, with Miller and Faree, and uh, I think uh, one one step at a time. Will he be, will he be asked to cooperate with you guys? Uh, well, his plea agreement does not call for any cooperation, so I, I don't think that that's on, on the table. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here today. I appreciate your time and, and your patience. And uh, that concludes this, uh, this, this media availability. Have Thank a great you, day. Dad. Thank you. Make sure you come back tomorrow so you don't miss the wild mistress hearing. Learn how she uh, got a little sneaky and tried to avoid getting arrested. Maybe. Sort of. Might have been. While her kid was just chilling at school with no way home. It's a hot mess. Thank you for the support as always, and I will see you next time. Welcome back, everyone. We are here for part three of the Corruption in Indiana Sheriff's Department. Fun times. When we left yesterday, one of the last things discussed was the judge asking for victims to come forward. That was discussed heavily in the news in the past day. Well, Doug, Special Prosecutor Rick Hurdle says 15-year sentence is on the higher end of the spectrum of charges. But will this sentence stick? Judge Medlock is now turning to members of Clark County, specifically victims of Knoll, like New Chapel EMS employees, for the answer. On Tuesday, WLKY found it difficult to get Clark County taxpayers, whose money Knoll admitted to stealing, to go on camera. Tell your viewers that if they believe that they have been harmed, that they are a victim, contact Mr. Hurdle's office. At Still with the, the amount of jurors, and we'll be talking about th toward the end of this, but we also want to get to the impact that this case has had on all the fire and EMS services that Noel helped run. That's completely true, and that's kind of how my focus shifted throughout 2024. You know, I started on the court case, and then as you know, all these elected officials and, and all these people who are in charge of EMS service in Clark and Floyd counties, you know, they're watching the news and they're like, we got to move on. Um, it was a combination of, you know, some baggage, you know, people not wanting to be associated with New Chapel EMS. Mm -hmm. But the main thing that all these elected officials would tell you is that it had to do with um, staffing and response times. Um, I think given the EMS shortage across the nation, Clark County had relaxed some of its, you know, target response times a little bit, but New Chapel was still not meeting those target average goals. And there was some, you know, one-off cases where it would take an ambulance 30 minutes to get to somewhere. And Clark County is really big. And 
they were contracted to only provide six ambulances. Um, and so the, the response times got so bad that they lost four contracts this year. Well, tonight, the special prosecutor in the Jamie Knoll case is setting up a website for a victim impact statement. As we first reported earlier this week, the former Clark County Sheriff is trying to take a plea deal on the fraud charges he's facing. However, the judge wants to hear from the people who believe they were impacted by his crimes. The Ripley County Prosecutor's Office was so overwhelmed by calls that it set up a website. Now, if the judge accepts the plea deal, Noel would get up to 15 years in prison and would have to pay back nearly $3 million. I think it was very vindicating to have that. I think this is a day that uh, a lot of us here in southern Indiana were looking forward to hearing. It's really a major step that we all need to begin starting to heal from all of the damage that's been done and start to maybe put this chapter of life behind us. The thing that makes me the maddest is we ask for equipment, life-saving equipment. We ask for medications that when you have a haul from New Wash to Clark Memorial Hospital, those medications are life and death medications that we were requesting and being told there's no, the funding's not there, the money's not there. Well, the money was on your belt buckle. She is four months today. Natalia Weathers is a happy, healthy baby. <laughs> but just three days into her life, her parents had a giant scare. She started convulsing like um, possibly a seizure. On March 20th, she started shaking, her lips turned blue, and she wouldn't respond. Her mom, Janie, called 911. And with me being a first time mom and her being so young, I mean, I kind of told him, I was like, I, I gave you all the information I have, just please send help. Charlestown Police and Fire responded first, and then New Chapel EMS. Eventually. Yes. New Chapel arrived at their house 23 minutes after being dispatched. It felt like an eternity. I just remember, you know, waiting on them to show up and I'm holding my daughter in my hands because I don't know what to do. I'm waiting for the ambulance to get here. They stayed at Norton Children's Hospital for five days and after tons of tests, doctors said it was just abnormal jerking in her sleep and nothing serious. It felt very serious, especially the way she was convulsing. And then clearly these patients didn't feel like they got something out of this that they needed to make them feel completely cared for in that moment. And that's something we can learn from. New Chapel EMS spokesperson S. Coy Travis says there were six other EMS runs in the county at this time and they had to call in extra staff. Under our contract with Clark County is for six trucks, so we went uh, one truck beyond the contract to respond to that call. They are the victim of his alleged crimes because they could have used that money to run a better department. There's things that, that we should have had for this organization and our providers all along, like, you know, upgraded equipment, um, better ambulances to run in, nicer, you know, stretchers for patients to ride on, better protocols for our paramedics to work through. Um, and we were always told, even the fire departments, more crews to fill fire trucks. And we were always told that can't be because we can't afford it. And that wasn't true. Starting September 1st, New Chapel will no longer provide 911 emergency ambulance services to Clark County. It's kind of like uh, watching your family fall apart, like you're, you're leaving your home. And uh, that's been really hard on myself and a lot of people. Well, recently, I don't think that many people have really spoke out against Jamie due to the fear that they had of him. And it, it affects me on a personal level, but then it also affects me on a professional level as well because wherever I go, New Chapel EMS is going to be on my resume. Beatley says family is relieved at Noel's admission of guilt and the consequences that will follow, but says it does not heal the betrayal. Do you all ever think <coughs> you'll get those answers as to why? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, no, I doubt it. Um, I think he just felt like he was entitled. I'm a lieutenant with uh, New Chapel Fire and EMS. I've been there about six and a half years. This week will be the end of the road for Lieutenant Wesley Johnson with New Chapel EMS. My last day will be Saturday uh, at uh, 8 p.m. Saturday night will be the end of my last shift. Jamie was a person that I respected at one point in time. I would like to look at him and tell him, you know, exactly. I want him to hear and see how his actions have, have directly affected uh, all the people that worked for him at one point in time. To serve 10, 12 years in prison, have to pay all that money back, essentially come home to nothing when he does get out of prison, I, I'm satisfied with it. All right. You're fine. Thank you very much.
when you about turned around and followed. It's a lot different down here. All right. Anybody has a cell phone, please turn it off. Disturb the proceedings. I will have to confiscate it from them. Cause numbers 8810CO1, 2408F6. 867 and 868, 867 being State of Indiana versus Brittany Ferry, and 868 being State of Indiana versus John Miller the third. Folks, this was your initial hearing on new criminal charges. So when I ask a question, Ms. Free, if you'll answer first, Mr. Miller, if you'll answer second, so we're not speaking over each other. For the record, tell me your full name, please. Brittany Joe Furry. John L. Miller the third. And your date of birth? 82279. 101288. And that would make you how old? 45. 35. Last four digits, your social security number? The address you provided on the uh, pretrial release recommendation form, is that your correct address? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And is that, that your good, a good contact telephone number for you? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Are you under the influence of any drugs, including alcohol today? No. No, Your Honor. Read and understand the English language? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. And if I say something you don't understand, will you let me know? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Free, Special Prosecutor Richard Hurdle has filed what? one count of criminal conduct. That's conflict of interest as a level six felony. It would indicate I, the undersigned affiant, do hereby affirm under the penalties to perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1 that between August 21st, 2019 and December 31st, 2022 in Clark County, State of Indiana, you being a public servant, that being Clark County Council, did knowingly or intentionally have a pecuniary interest in and or derive a profit from a contract between Clark County and New Chapel EMS, that being defendant voted in favor of funding contract for New Chapel EMS, Chief Executive Officer Jamie Knoll, and defendant derived benefits of value from New Chapel and Knoll, said contract being connected with an action by the government entity served by you. Contrary to the form of the statutes in such cases made and provided by Indiana Code 35-44.1-1-4B and against the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana. Mr. Miller, for you it's similar. Conflict of interest as a level six felony. It would indicate that I, the undersigned, AFIA, do hereby affirm under the penalties for perjury as specified in Indiana Code 35-44.1-2-1, that between January the 1st, 2021, to January the 12th, 2024, in Clark County, State of Indiana, you, being a public servant, that being a Clark County Council, did knowingly or intentionally have a pecuniary interest in and or derive a profit from a contract between Clark County and New Chapel EMS, that being defendant voted in favor of funding contract for New Chapel EMS Chief Executive Officer Jamie Knoll, and you derive benefits of value from Knoll New Chapel EMS, <coughs> said contracts being <coughs> excuse me, connected with an action by the government entity served by you contrary to the form of the statutes in such case made and provide by Indiana Code 35-44.1-1-4B and against the peace and dignity of the state of Indiana. You each have level six felonies. A level six felony has a range of imprisonment of no time in jail if it's treated as a misdemeanor to two and one half years at the Indiana Department of Corrections with the advisory sentence being one year and up to a $10,000 fine. Ms. Free, do you understand what you've been charged with? Yes, sir. Mr. Miller, do you understand what you've been charged with? Yes, Your Honor. 
Ms. Free, do you understand the potential penalty? Yes, sir. Are you sure you looked at Mr. Watson? You yes. want me to go over it again? No, sir. No, no, we've went over it previously as well. Okay. Mr. Miller, do you understand the potential penalty? Yes, Your Honor. And I see you have counsel with you. Is, will they, have they been retained to, to represent you throughout these proceedings? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Then I need to tell both of you, you have a right to a speedy <coughs> public trial by jury in its county. You have the right to face all witnesses against you. See here, question and cross-examine those witnesses. You have the right to have witnesses brought into court to testify on your behalf. And at your request, the court will issue subpoenas requiring those individuals to come into court to testify on your behalf to bring evidence in. You have the right to have the state prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the right to remain silent. You cannot be required to give any testimony or make any statements against yourself to anyone. You do have the right to be heard in your own defense at any hearing or trial concerning the charges against you. Anything you say, however, may be used against you. Do you have any questions concerning your rights? Ms. Yes, Green? Mr. Miller? No, Your Honor. All right, then I will enter. Uh, well, I will ask. Mr. Weitzel, how, how do you wish to enter a plea on behalf of your client? We would ask that you enter a not guilty plea on Mr. Priest's behalf. Mr. Bateau? Not guilty, Your Honor. All right. I will set this for a pretrial conference for both of them, <clears throat> October the 11th at 10 a.m., uh, an attorney conference, Omnibus Day, October the 26th at 1.30 p.m. and trial dates of February the 3rd, 2025. They're not joined together, uh, but one of them will, one of them could be tried on that day. Mr. Weitzel, do you have any questions at all? Or does your client have any questions at all? No, Judge. Mr. Patel? No questions, Your Honor. All right, let's take up the issue of bond, since they were held without bond pending today's hearing. Mr. Hurdle, would you like to be heard? I would, Your Honor. I'd uh, like to briefly call uh, Detective Heron to the witness stand with respect to uh, Ms. Faree. All right. I'm not sure where the witness stand is here. While we're waiting, Officer Heron, you raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. You may have a seat. Answer counsel's questions, please. Sir, would you tell the court your name, please? Jeffrey C. Heron. And, uh, sir, where are you employed? Indiana State Police. How long have you been with the State Police? Approximately 36 years. And uh, what is your current uh, role or position with the State Police? I'm the Senate out of uh, Area 5, which is the central part of the state of Indiana, which consists of Putnamville, Fairfield, and Indianapolis districts. And when did you come to be assigned to the uh, state of Indiana, which is Jamie Nolan, ultimately uh, Brittany Furry and John Miller? June 13th, 2023. I'm going to confine my questions, Detective, specifically to uh, Brittany Furry. Uh, I'm going to speak to uh, Friday, August uh, 23rd. Uh, were you employed as a state police detective then? I was, yes. Uh, can you tell the, uh, the court kind of what transpired with uh, your understanding of uh, a warrant dropping for Brittany Faree? So uh, the warrant was issued and, uh, off, sorry, on Friday at approximately 11 20, 11 22, copy of the volume. And once I got a copy of the warrant, uh, I immediately uh, sent detectives to Ms. Faree's uh, employment. Uh, her salon at uh, Headplay on, uh, in downtown Jeffersonville. And then I sent detectives to her residence in uh, Sellersburg to attempt to locate her uh, and take her into custody. And uh, are you the affiant on the uh, probable cause affidavit that you warrant for her arrest? I am, yes. Sir. Yeah. And how did you come to learn that she was the owner and operator of uh, Headplay Salon? Through my investigation, I ended up, uh, I had a, ultimately had an interview with Ms. Faree, plus I was looking through uh, Mr. Knoll's records and saw a number of different Venmo uh, uh, transfers of money from Mr. Knoll to Ms. Faree via Headblade, which is this. And did you come to learn her home address through that same investigation? I did. I ultimately got a search warrant for her home, and I served that search warrant on December 28, 2023. 
at her residence there in Sunbrook, Highland Streets. Were you present uh, when the officers went either to her home or to her salon uh, that morning? No, other than when I came a little later on that day, we went back. But yes, not that morning, I was not present. And was she located at either her residence or the salon? She was not. Uh, can you tell the court what you did to try and locate uh, Ms. Furry that day? Oh, so once we could not locate her, I, uh, I ran a flock camera on a vehicle. I knew what vehicle she had. had. Back, can you slow down one second? What, can you explain the, the, for the uh, record what a flock is? So it's a license plate reader. Uh, they put over different highways throughout the state of Indiana, municipalities throughout the state of Indiana. They read, read a license plate. And so if I want to search for a particular vehicle with that license plate, number, I enter that into the database, and that comes up at any time in the rear of that vehicle, a picture is taken of it. I found that, that uh, she appeared to be going towards Madison roughly 10, 40, some in the morning on that one. Were you able to locate what sort of car or if she was driving alone or separate or do you know? Uh, so the vehicle plate came back to a BMW and that's what I believe she had. However, she appeared that that plate was on an Audi vehicle, a black uh, SUV and Audi vehicle. Okay. Um, and was she then apprehended in Madison since that's where, where she was? No, I sent detectives over to Madison to try to find her. We did not have luck with that. Okay. Um, so not at head play and not in her home, located in Madison. Um, what do you do as the investigator in this matter at that point? From then, I actually, myself and three other detectives came to her address a little bit later than the initial troopers came, about 1230 that day. We knocked on the door. We had no answer. We were searching the house. We searched for the arrest uh, the room. We searched for the person. We searched the house. We did not locate her. At that point, we, we checked with a neighbor. Uh, who indicated that she had left that morning. She'd taken her kids to school, and uh, then she left shortly after that. And as a result of that, we went to the school, we figured out which school the children, the three children, she had two older and one younger child. So we traveled to the scooter school, which is uh, St. Paul, uh, right there in Silverberg. Are all the three children at the same school? They were at that school, at least they indicated they were, yes. Whether it's two different types, but the administration of the the uh, preschool area we went to said that they were at the FS. Was Miss Furry at the school? She was not. Okay. Um, did you make arrangements with the uh, the principal or teacher administration to uh, attempt to locate her uh, at that point in time? So I tried at this point in time, I tried to call her on my phone with cell phone. I'm assuming because Miss Furry and I have had previous conversation, uh, assuming that my number may come up and call her ID and went straight to voicemail. At that point, I asked to use the school's phone. So from the director's office, I ended up calling Miss Furry. I left her a message. That she was wanted that had one of the rest and was asking that she contact me and her uh, Additionally, uh, my concern was that uh, the warrant had no bond on there, and uh, the administrator, the uh, director of that school, said that the school closed at 3 30. And so at that point, I, uh, I wanted to make sure that there was child care adequately protected or in place for the, uh, the child. So then the other thing, next thing I did was I asked the school for the emergency contact or for Ms. Free. Uh, and then I was given a name by the name of Debbie Owen. So I contacted Mrs. Owen, or Miss Owen, and I did not get a response on that. I then, uh, I then asked the school, did he have an alternative way of contacting Miss Free? He said he did, which was email. And then I had an email uh, Miss Free saying that the state police were at the school and asking them to contact us. What time did these calls and emails occur at the uh, school detective? Between 1230 and 1 o'clock. And did she uh, then turn herself into the uh, the school or uh, meet you at the uh, state police post at that time? There was no response. She did not at that time. So this is early afternoon. Um, did you make any attempt to make any arrangements uh, with the children who were at the school? I did. I uh, then traveled back to the state police post there in Sellersburg, and we contacted Ms. Free's uh, ex-husband, uh, Greg Free, and explained the situation and asked, uh, explained that, that she he may need to get the children. He said that he would get the two older children, which were his, but he declined to get uh, J.W., the younger uh, child, uh, saying that uh, that was not his child and uh, we needed to find out some other child here for him. And who is the father of J.W.? Uh, Jamie Noel. And uh, how old is J.W.? Four. And the other two children, Mr. Faree was going to pick up, he agreed to do that? He did. He picked up the old two children. So school ends, where do you go? So before I left the school, however, I left something, I apologize. Before I left the school, I left my name and number. And the school had told me, the administrator there told me that uh, it's not empowered for Mr. Capri to use a, a teenager at the school by the name of Savannah to, to occasionally watch JW after school. 
and that the, and she also indicated that the school closed at 30 and that they had a child care at 6 p.m. that evening. Um, you left the school though. I did. Why did you leave the school? At that point, uh, I already tried to contact her. I couldn't. So at that point, we were actively going to try to locate her out in the community. Did you have any luck uh, locating her in the community? Eventually, uh, I got some leads, and what I found out is uh, that she was with her cousin, um, a woman by the name of uh, sorry, Smith. Uh, I apologize for the last time. I can't kneel. Her main name is Neil. Uh, married name is Smith. And so as a result of that, I ended up getting a phone number for that woman, and they ultimately called her on the phone and left a, and left a message for her, and then I followed that up with a series of text messages asking her to call me and that Brittany was wanted. Was there any response from uh, from Ms. Smith? There was not. Okay. Did Ms. Furry ever respond back to you that afternoon? Uh, only for, for her attorney, attorneys, plural, later on that evening. The other thing we did is we actually went to Ms. Ms. Smith's parents' house that we found, we locating that. Spoke to them, we received a, a more information on where Ms. Smith lived, and actually when Ms. Smith's home, we could assist with uh, Ms. Smith or Brittany. Eventually, uh, I got a flock radar hit again, a camera pic a picture of the rear of the vehicle, and that the vehicle was now in the New Albany area. So it looked like it had originally been in Madison, and then now it was headed, it was actually passed by Clark County, and, uh, and then Jeffersonville, and then it actually going into the New Albany area, and that was at about 4 uh, 45 ish. You'd mentioned earlier that uh, there was a, uh, a, a worker at the school, a daycare worker, or after school worker by the name of Savannah. Uh, did you speak to Savannah or did the school speak to Savannah? Eventually, uh, I got a uh, call from the director during this time, about 3.30, quarter to four -ish, and the director said, uh, Ms. Free has reached out to uh, Savannah in a text message saying, uh, it's an emergency, I need you to take JW from the school to my house, watch him all weekend, uh, make sure he's fed and everything else, and then uh, I will and then take him to school on Monday, and then I will have my cousin pick him up Monday afternoon. Is that when Brittany Furry turned herself in to you then? She did not. That concerned me because now the school is at this point closed. I don't know about this teenager watching the child. I know that both, one parent is incarcerated, the other one is soon to be incarcerated. And that concerned me, so I ended up uh, asking one of our detectives for say police, Mike Bennett, to go and take the child uh, at the school, take him to the post uh, to watch. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then, I, then I actually text again Miss um, Smith and Miss Free and said, Your child is now at the state police post. And at that point, I called DCS and asked them to, to start the procedure for placement of the child. Sometimes that takes a while, a while, even hours. So I wanted to expect it on a Friday evening. I wanted to make sure that was in the process. Is that protocol when you have a, uh, an underage child and uh, both parents seem to be uh, not located or, or incarcerated? That is pretty standard, yes. Sir. Okay. And did DCS respond to you that they would uh, get involved? He did. I called the hotline and then I ultimately got a call from the FCM, the family case manager, who ultimately called me on the phone and explained that they would come to the post and work through the place. Right. And did they come to the state police post? They did, yes. Um, do you ever hear ultimately then from uh, Brittany Furry? I got, I got a call from uh, one of our attorneys, uh, and, uh, a female, and I apologize for the name. I'm not, I'm not from this area, so I don't know these the attorneys by name. Uh, and then I ultimately got a call from Mr. Weitzel, who called and said that Brittany would be turning herself in to the Sheriff's Department. I asked that he tell her to come to the post so we could, she could sit down with the DCS worker and go through the placement of her child. And instead, I got a few minutes, a call a few minutes later that she would turn herself in roughly 5.30ish, 5.35 at the, uh, at the jail. So there's a window of about I don't know, five to seven hours where um, you're actively looking, the state police are actively looking for Brittany Furry and uh, she's not to be found. That's correct, yes. Efforts were made with the salon, her home, the school, her cousin, her cousin's parents. Yep. Anyone else? And then the, uh, and of course we left a message for the, the emergency contact person. You know, to talk to her later, she'd been out of state, she's not able to respond. That, that person also, and then the neighbor too. What time did she turn herself into the sheriff's department? About 5.35 p.m. on Friday.
Do you have any other questions? Right now? Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Now, Thank you. Now, to take the you said that you sent detectives out to Brittany's salon and her home when the warrant got issued on 823, correct? That's correct. What time did you say that you sent them out there? The detectives? Mm -hmm. uh, 11.47. 11 11.47 in the morning? Yes, yes. Do you know what her salon hours are? I do not. Okay. So you don't know if it was actually open that day or not? I don't. Although oh, there was a ring doorbell. And they activated the ring doorbell and did not receive response. Okay. But you don't always receive a response when you ring a doorbell, correct? Well, ring type camera. I understand what you're saying. That's got to be personal. I'm going to finish answering. Well, I believe that I was. Well, let, me, let me stop you right there. Okay. So I understand what a ring doorbell is. I understand it's got a camera in it. Okay. Even with that type of doorbell, you don't always receive a response back from the person that owns that doorbell, correct? I don't know the answer to that, sir. I, I, have I, you ever, I don't have a ring doorbell. Have you ever used one? Yes. Okay. Did you get a response every time you used it? Okay, thank you. Now, you said she wasn't at her salon or her home that morning, correct? That's right. At 11.47, almost noon, do you know if she knew that she had a warrant at that time? I don't know what she knew. She had a warrant at 11.47. I think she knew she had a warrant about 12.30, 1 o'clock. So and how's that? Like I explained earlier, I had text, or I'm sorry. I had the school send an email, I get a voicemail, and um, I believe that was, that was what I believed. And then and then also, uh, I ended up contacting her cousin, who later I had an interview with that later that evening, who acknowledged that, that she received those text messages and that voice. That the cousin had received those? Yeah, yes. Okay, so the cousin received those emails and text messages that you'd sent her? The cousin received a text message and a voicemail. Her and she indicated that she was with Brittany okay. that day. But the cousin didn't say that she told Brittany what was in those text messages or on that voicemail, correct? I don't believe specifically she said okay. that way. I have to review the interview. Okay. And you say you sent those messages and reached out to Brittany to try to indicate to her that she had a warrant, but you don't know if she actually read any of those or actually did anything with those, correct? I don't know the answer. Yes. I don't know if she read them. Okay. You said at 10.40 a.m. you got a hit on an Audi that had a plate matching Brittany's vehicle. Is that right? That is. I got a hit on a plate that came back registered to Brittany Free, and I believe it was a 2015 BMW that was on this vehicle, which is a white Audi. Okay. <clears throat> That was at 10.40 a.m., correct? Sorry, that was at 10.27 or 5 seconds. Okay, so 10.27. You didn't even attempt to go serve the warrant on her for at least another hour, correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay, so her going to Madison in a vehicle doesn't have any relevance then, correct? And if I did. Okay, all right. And you didn't check to see if she actually sold her BMW and bought that Audi, correct? Actually, I did uh, do a little bit of digging, and, and that's what my understanding was just word of mouth from other people that knew Brittany. Okay, so BMV wise, the, the BMV, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles wise, she did not register this year. My knowledge, at least, it's not in the system. Okay. But it's not a situation where she had jumped in an white Audi and took the plate from her BMW and put it on there that morning because she had a warrant. The information I was receiving, she bought the white Audi and traded the BMW. Okay, well before this form was issued. I don't know when that happened. But before this, right? That was the indication of the people I saw. Okay, all right. <laughs> now, you said you talked with the neighbor about 12.30 when you went to her home, is that right? I said we talked to the neighbor. Okay. So I didn't actually talk to the neighbor. I okay, supposed. so somebody else talked to the neighbor, you were present though? One of the detective, uh, Hanson. Okay, but you were present? Present as in uh, at her house location. Who we're talking about wasn't present at the physically there. So you weren't present with him when he talked with the neighbor then? Correct. Okay, so you're being told what the neighbor told him by him, correct? Correct. Okay. 
Now, the neighbor said that she took her kids to school that morning? That was my understanding, yes. Okay. Nothing unusual about that, right? No, sir. Okay. The two children that were picked up later on from the school by her ex-husband, those are his children, correct? George Wilder, yes. Okay. Do you know if he was supposed to pick them up that day? Yeah. Okay, so it could have been that he was scheduled to pick them up anyway, right? I don't believe he's indicated either way. Just said he's okay. going to pick But you don't know either way? Correct. Okay. Um, now you said that the school closes at 3.30, is that right? That's what they told me, yes. Okay. But that's for the school itself, kindergarten through eighth grade, right? I don't know the answer to that, sir. They just said they closed at three and it was after school program. Okay, so there's an after school program that you hear for the children, is that right? Yes. Okay. And would it be accurate to say that to be part of that after care program, to have them care for your children up to six o'clock, you have to be paid for that? I don't know. They did indicate that she used the after school care program. Okay, so JW was part of the after school care program. For the end of the year. Okay, so he had the ability to be there until 6 o'clock, right? He did. Okay. What time did you take him from the daycare? Roughly noon. <laughs> Roughly 16.30, which would be 4.30, 35 p.m. So an hour and a half before they close. Right. Okay. Now you found out from them that he that there had been arrangements made for his care. Is that right? I think I told you that just for this minute. I'm just verifying. Okay. okay. You said it was a Savannah that was going to pick him up. Correct. How old is Savannah? Eighteen. Okay. Legal adult. Yes. Okay. Any reason why she couldn't have cared for the child? Wouldn't be my call. I think it was a DCS call. Why is that? Because I again explained one one parent is incarcerated, the other parent is going to be incarcerated without the bomb. But she wasn't incarcerated at the time you took the child from the daycare, was she? Okay. Arrangements had to been made by the custodial parent for the care of that child at that time, correct? Yes, according to the school administrator, and ultimately the interview I did with Savannah uh, indicated she only watched the channel one other time the other evening. Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, yeah. meaning, meaning not watched during the day, but it, it actually spent the night with. Uh, she indicated that, that, that was a, it wasn't a plan for a thing. She, it's my recollection that Savannah said she watched the channel on Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. Okay. But there's no reason why Savannah couldn't have watched the child. I believe I was concerned about the ability for the child to get proper food, nourishment, watch properly, and the fact that it, it appeared that it was a last minute uh, decision to make, and so I was concerned for the child welfare, and I believe that DCS was the appropriate people to contact. Okay, so if Brittany had turned herself in on a warrant to you at one o'clock, and had made arrangements for the child, you're going to call DCS, right? I probably still would have called DCS. I don't okay. explain the situation to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, being that she had a warrant, didn't make a difference on who was going to care for the child. I to make sure the child was adequately picked. You have no, you have no evidence, no argument, or no statements that says that that child was not going to be cared for by Savannah, correct? Your question. You don't have any evidence to show that Savannah would not care for that child. I do not, but I did. Okay. That's so that, that yes. my question. Yes. It's a yes or no question, sir. You can either get yes or no. Well, you're cutting me off halfway through half my answers. Sir. Well, that's because it's a simple yes or no question. You had no statements from anybody or any witness that Savannah would not care or could not care for that child, correct? Yes or no? I can't answer a yes or no on that. You want, you want my answer to that? I want you to yes or no on that because that's the question. Whether you had any statement from a witness that she could not care for that child. Judge, I can't answer that question yes or no without a qualifier. Judge, I would ask that you 
ask the or order the witness to answer the question as a simple yes or no question of whether he had statements from a witness that Savannah did not care for that child. Officer Heron, if you'd be so kind to comply with uh, counsel's request, if Mr. Hurdle wants you to qualify, he'll give you that opportunity. All right, and then please restate your question one more time to so make sure. Did I you have any statement from any witness that Savannah could not care for that child? Yes. What was it? The, the, the statement was from the principal or the director that said that uh, she received a text message, uh -huh. that, meaning Savannah had received a text message, and the in, implication I got from her was that this was questionable. Who was making the questionable statement? The, the director, director or Savannah? The director, Jennifer Sieber. Okay. Well, this is all very interesting, Mr. Bytel and Mr. Heron. What's it got to do with this, with the establishment of a bond? Well, Judge, the, the, I, mean, I, I think I get the point, Mr. Bytel. Yeah, but, okay. But I, I can see it if you want to. The, the, the insinuation from the government is that she's a flight risk, is what her, they're insinuating. And I'm trying to show that their evidence that they put forth here today that she is a flight risk is not accurate. But I'll move on to court. I, I, get, you know, I get that point. Okay. I can move on, Judge. So you said that you picked up on a flight camera that the alley you believed. Miss Farida be in with going toward New Albany at 4:45, correct? It's 4:44 28 seconds. Yes. Okay. Do you have my office address? I don't have your address. I'm going to because we can visit you there. New Albany, right? Yes. So she could have been coming to my office for a number of reasons. Maybe to make payment to hire me in the first place. Possible. Anything's possible. Okay. And then after she. You didn't see her again or learn any additional information about her or where she was located until you received a call from me. Is that right? Yes. I got it. Okay. There was another attorney that called just prior to you. Rebecca Walker? Yeah, yes. Sir. Yeah. And she, Rebecca actually called you regarding the custody and care of JW, correct? Well, both. The attorney was going to turn herself in and then the chair, the care of JW. You're not privy to any contact that I may have had with Brittany during this period of time, are you? No. Okay. So if I were to tell you that she contacted my office and I instructed her to turn herself in on the warrant and she said she was going to do so, you wouldn't know what, whether that's accurate or not, correct? I would not know. Okay. But nonetheless, Brittany turned herself in on the warrant to the jail, correct? She did. She wasn't found in another state, correct? There is no other jails, yes. Okay. Well, you don't have any information that she was trying to flee to California or anything. She's in Louisville or Ohio or anything else. No, any of them. Other than the flock camera. I don't have any additional questions this time. Yes, Mr. Whitehall. Mr. Hurdle? No, Your Honor. You may step back, thank you. Thanks. Any other witnesses, Mr. Hurdle? No other witnesses, Your Honor. Mr. Whitehall? Oh, Mr. Patel? Yes, Judge, I'd call Detective Heron. For? For Mr. Mellon. Okay. No well, questions are asked. I'll move on to that in, in a second. I'm sorry. It, it, Mr. Heron, you can stay there. It'll be perhaps more convenient. You want to make argument in regards to bond for Ms. Farid? Yes, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, the, uh, the state would ask the court to review the um, factors set forth in 35338 for the amount of bail and look at those factors uh, for Ms. Furry as required by statute. I'm going to ask the same thing with, uh, with Mr. Millen and ask the court to take a look at those. The reason for the, um, the testimony today was, uh, I think, uh, circumstantially, the state has shown that there was some evading going on by Ms. Furry, whether that was an hour, whether that was two hours or five hours. The state's not trying to say that she was skipping town or flying to another country or anything like that, but it seems that at 11.30, 11.45, somewhere in that ballpark, that she's missing and 
she's evading phone calls from the school, from the detective, um, and not turning herself in, except maybe at her convenience, 5.30 at night. And ironically, the only reason the only reason she came forward at the time that she came forward actually was when the detective reached out to her and said that the child was at the Indiana State Police Post and that changed things dramatically and then there was a turning in very quickly after that. So the, the state would ask the court to consider that. I'm not going to ask for a specific amount, Your Honor, but I'm going to ask that the uh, the court look at Ms. Farine, look at what she's charged with, and that's six felony. Um, look at the circumstances of Friday and what happened with the, the arrest and also um, the connection to her role as a county council member and the co-defendant, Jamie Knoll, and the allegations that the court has heard much about over the last year. Mr. Watson. Thank you, Judge. First, first off, I don't disagree with Mr. Hurley. You need to look at the factors in the statute. I think the court is well aware of what those factors are. I think the court is well aware of review, having reviewed those numerous occasions on other cases, setting bond on other cases. I don't think that that's going to be a problem for the court to review. I think that one thing that I do disagree on is what Mr. Knoll did or didn't do, what he may admit to or not admit to, is not a factor to be considered in this or relevant. The charge against Brittany is conflict of interest. It's not a violent crime. So you gotta look at the danger to the community. So the argument could be made that she could be in the community because she was on the council and she allegedly voted for something that she shouldn't have voted for and misallocated or misappropriated funds for taxpayer for, for taxpayers. She's not been on the council for over four years now, Judge, or approximately four years. So that argument that her being a dangerous community is not relevant. So when you look at whether she's a dangerous community, she's not. Second thing, Judge, she actually is not a flight risk either, which is the other factor that the court should consider. Mr. Perini has actually hired me to represent her on a pending investigation. I'm that sorry, who? who? Ms. Free oh. has hired me to represent her on the pending investigation. I've had numerous contacts with Mr. Heron, both by phone, by email, when he's periodically asking questions that he does not know the answer to that he's wanting Ms. Free to provide the answer to if she can. And every time a response was sought, it was received. Ms. Free didn't flee run, evade, or anything during the last plus year plus when she could have easily fled to Montana, gone off the grid, and been nowhere to be found. She didn't. She stayed here. She wasn't evading anything on Friday. The fact is, is that anybody that gets an arrest warrant issued that they know that you're going to be in jail for two days at least, if not three, because you're not gonna be able to bond out when the warrant was signed and, and everything was filed on a Friday and you're not gonna be brought to court until Monday. People have lives. People have to get their fares together. Sometimes that entails going from different locations, doing different things to get those taken care of. Brittany has three kids. She had to make arrangements for at least one of them to pick up and be cared for. <clears throat> she wasn't evading anything. She clearly was in contact with two of her attorneys that are local that told her to turn herself in on the warrant, and that's exactly what she did. What she didn't do is didn't turn herself in on the warrant to the state police post for Mr. Heron to arrest her. That's the problem. So what we would ask the court to do is release her on her own recognizance. If the court looks at her pretrial release recommendation that the probation department did on her and actually filed, she's not currently on probation. She does not currently have any holes 
There's no past failures to appear. The only failures to appear that she could have possibly had would have been on some type of civil matter because she's got no prior criminal history, never been charged or arrested before until this incident. It says that she has DCS involvement. Well, the reason why she's got DCS involvement is because the state police called dealing with the care of her child when there was no basis for that. She's currently employed full time. They recommend that she be supervised by pre-child supervision one monthly contact a month. She's considered low risk when it comes to flight. So we feel like that when you look at the changing of the criminal code and the changing of the bond statutes by the legislature to show that somebody that has fi filed a charge against is a minor offense or a low level offense, even if it is a felony, should not have to post a cash bond, but should be released on their own cognizance. So that's what we're asking for to do here today. Well, Mr. Whitehall, I think maybe you've forgotten. I don't always abide by Clark County standards, and it's not my intentions to do so again today. Um, and I get the point. I don't believe she was trying to leave the jurisdiction. I just I get the impression maybe she didn't follow Mr. Heron uh, directions, and maybe that was a bit irritating. So, Mr. Hurdle, anything in response? No, Your Honor. I'll take it under advisement shortly. I'm going to hear from about Mr. Miller. Uh, anything in regards to Mr. Miller? Again, pointing out the statute to the court that the court's well aware of, as Mr. Weitzel said. Uh, the only things that the, uh, the state might bring up is that uh, Mr. Miller, at least uh, to my knowledge, is a police officer who is probably issued a, a weapon, probably has other weapons. <coughs> The, uh, the danger probably changes slightly uh, with somebody who has training and experience uh, with a weapon and, uh, and, and certainly probably um, physical uh, combat, defensive tactics and things like that. So the, um, the potential for, um, I guess, risk to others might elevate more so than it would with uh, a Brittany Furry. But uh, the state does not have any witnesses and asks the court to consider that. And again, that connection, he, he is, well, while the state does agree that Ms. Faria is not a city councilwoman, Mr. Miller is a city council, county, uh, council. county councilman who did and does have connection with uh, Mr. Knoll, and the allegations are similar in nature of the conflict of interest in his role as county council. Do you know if his arrest has created any uh, change of employment status? I am not aware that that could be potentially something that the witness is, is, is aware of. I, I have not asked him other than I knew prior to this day or Friday that he was suspended with pay, I believe, Your Honor. And I don't know if Friday changed that or it's status quo. So there would be no reason for him to be carrying a firearm if he's suspended. I, I can't imagine if there would be, Your Honor. Mr. Bateau. I call Detective Heron. You may. You. He's previously sworn. I'll consider him still under oath. Would you mind stating your name again? Jeffrey C. Heron. Thank you. And what do you do for a living, sir? The United State Police Officer. And you've been assigned as detective in this case? I have been. Lead detective? Yeah. Did you know Mr. Miller prior to this investigation? No. Were you aware that he was a police officer? No, sir. The investigation, yes. Are you aware how long he's been a police officer? In an interview with me, it's 2016. The interview was in February? The interview that you did with me? Yes, it was, yes. Uh -huh. Did you perform any investigation into his family dynamic? That was very good. Us. The reason why I'm asking you is the court has to consider family and relationships pursuant to Indiana Code 3533, at least four. 
party there he has it on you? You know, the only thing I know is he has a wife and daughter. Right. Uh, are you aware that the rest of his extended family lives in the area? And then he's been a resident of the state of Indiana basically for a lifetime? Uh, we've indicated that in the Okay. And he is a police. As we've already talked about it. He's a police officer. Is that right? Correct. Did you look into his disciplinary file? I did not. Are you aware that he's never been disciplined in any way? I don't know either way. Do you know whether or not Clarksville Police Department undertook their own investigation as to any wrongdoing by Mr. Miller? I'm aware of that because they contacted me and asked me for documents to say they were going to do their own internal investigation. Right. And you're aware that they cleared it? No, I'm not aware. <coughs> it's, according to you, do you think it's still going on? I believe it was still going on, yes. I wonder when the last time you checked. I talked to the chief, Nick Wall, on the front. All right. And you talked about the investigation, and he specifically told you this investigation is ongoing? Yeah. I, I indicated, I, I, uh, through my search warrants of Jamie Wall's computer, I found a polygraph uh, investigation. Indicated, uh, then, uh, Wait, does this have to do with your conversation Friday? It does. All right. Well, I didn't ask. I asked whether or not you were told specifically that the investigation was ongoing. That was my question, and I think you answered that, and you said uh, you believed it to still be ongoing. I was getting ready to explain why I thought it was still ongoing. I didn't ask that question. But I think you and I can agree upon there's been no disciplinary action taken against Officer Knowles. In regards to this or anything else? The only thing I know is he was suspended with pay up until Friday, and then they came by and collected all of his belongings and police equipment and things like that from his wife uh, from their residence. And that was the last thing. That's an important point because they took his service weapon, is that correct? I don't know the answer to that. Well, you and I talked on the telephone on Friday when you were opening the lockbox that contained his service weapon. I don't know if that was a service weapon or not. I was looking for a cell phone. All right. As lead detective, is it your responsibility to know what's collected pursuant to a search warrant? If my search warrant had covered a firearm, I certainly would have collected it. If my search warrant included just a cell phone, and I obviously would have opened the box with a firearm in there, and so there was no need to go through and look and see if that was his issued service weapon. What a serial number. So did not go any further. I simply shut the box and we Good enough. So the only thing you collected on that day was a cell phone? No, sir. Actually, I couldn't find a cell phone. Okay. He had his residence, and uh, we ended up having his vehicle towed from where he was apprehended uh, to the post. I applied for a search warrant, or I wrote the search warrant over the weekend, I submitted it this morning. So you collected none? I didn't, yes, correct. Huh? Is it accurate to say that you talked to Mr. Miller on in February sometime? Yes. And how did that interview come about? Uh, we had a attorney by the name of Pat Grath who set that up. We had an interview in the, uh, the courthouse square. There was a lawyer's office there uh, on the south side of the square. We had an interview which lasted about two hours. And uh, did he cooperate during the interview? Yes. Your probable cause affidavit indicates that he issued several incriminating statements. Yes. Did you ask him to do anything else besides participate in the interview? I asked him for some documentation as far as bank records and different uh, demo receipts. So he, uh, he went on some different great trip in particular with Cuba One. I asked him for the documentation for that. And did he provide you those things? There was an attorney, he did, yes. Great. So I think the important thing for the judge is you and I agree that he's been totally cooperative. That's not correct. How would you say he was not cooperative? I asked him where his cell phone was and he. To my answer, and then I, I said, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to get a search warrant. It would be a rather lengthy process. The vehicle was going to be detained, and he said, oh, well. Which was his right? Absolutely. Could you ask me to squawk? I understood. That was a good thing. Thank you. If you know, has the county council ever taken any disciplinary action against Mr. Miller? I do not know. Besides 
the charges in this case, are you aware of any wrongdoing by Mr. Miller? Yes. Legal crime? Yes. Was it, did it come out of your investigation in here? Yes, sir. How was it that Mr. Miller was picked up? Uh, Mr. Warren came down and was active. I got a call from the sheriff, Scott Maples. He advised that the warrants were acting. They were going to be put in the system. Uh, I said, well, I will start the process of looking for Mr. Miller. Uh, he said, well, I have a fundraiser. I just pulled up the Kingdom Life Church in Lewis Hall. And he said, John Lewis Hall is here in the parking lot. If he's here, what would you like me to do? I said, well, Sheriff, if you would, please take him in custody. And I will send a detective by there. And that's exactly what happened. Well, as far as the detective by, I called him back. I said, hey, I have one of my detectives here. We'll just take the bit But that's not all that happened. Uh, what did John Miller do or say when he was told there was a one? I don't know I wasn't there. I right. know he was allowed to make a phone call from inside his vehicle. But I don't know what the conversation was on and what he did. All right. Are you aware that John Miller wanted to turn himself in? I'm not aware. Are you aware of whether or not there's a physical occupation at the time? I go by what the sheriff told me and one of his deputies told me that it was not. Right. And he wasn't combative or difficult or anything like that. Surely that would have been reported to you. Correct. So he was taken into custody immediately. He was. You don't disagree with me that under Indiana Code 353384, he's got a significant length of time as a resident of the state of Indiana. I don't know what code you're referring to, but as far as your verbiage there, I, I believe he's a long term resident of the Indiana. Yes. He was employed at the time? Yes. Um, do you dispute that he has strong family ties and relationships to persons here in southern Indiana? The only thing I know is what you have told me, or that he has a wife and child in the home. <coughs> so you don't know whether or not he's got any contacts whatsoever out of state? I don't know the answer that is. Do you know whether or not, has he had has he ever been ordered by a court to appear for anything? Yes. It's my understanding that he was arrested in Louisville on two different occasions prior to being employed with the, the uh, Clarksville Police Department and Sheriff's Department. And it's, uh, at one point he gave a false name and he had a failure to appear warrant for him. Was that in 2010? I don't know the exact dates. I think to look at the documentation. Are you aware of the nature of the failure to appear? It was an OWI and then it was another one where he gave a false name. I'm not sure. A PI? What the indicated will be indicated that if there's been an expungement of that, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that is. Mr. Well, you know, it looks like I can figure out what it is. All right. But you can't explain to the court today the nature of the failure to appear. I can't. Do you know if it was an attorney's fault? You don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> That's all. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Lapel asked you about the, uh, were you aware of crimes that the uh, defendant uh, either was accused of, committed, or was convicted of as part of your investigation? And uh, what, what were those? I believe it was the OWI and, and the PMA. And that was obtained through the polygraph test we found on Mr. Mills' computer. He had a free polygraph uh, questionnaire. He described his arrest as, as a failure to identify or as a false investigation and arrest. And that was in Louisville or the Commonwealth of Kentucky? It was in Kentucky and Louisville, I believe, is what it indicated on the record. So there were, there's been past arrests? Correct. And there's been a past failure to appear? I believe so, yes. That's what it indicated on his questionnaire. Plus, that's what Louisville indicated that there had been a possible expungement. That's all, Judge. I want to be clear on that. The way it works is it's not necessarily disqualifying 
for employment that a police officer has been in trouble? No, they disclose that. At least with more people, do not disclose the information in their mind to our employees who ask that question. Well, see, I, I say it wrong. That's not what happened. Don't they ask police officers whether or not, potential police officers, whether or not they've had criminal trouble before? In this case, they did. Yes, the whole law and background investigation I've been involved with. Yes. Yes. And so he disclosed those at that time. He disclosed them to the sheriff, Jay Noel, at my knowledge. He also disclosed them to Clark. That's just my knowledge and my conversation. All right. So he disclosed them to Jamie Noel. But are you saying under oath that he did not disclose them to Clarksville or that he intentionally lied to them about having those convictions after he'd already told the sheriff? What I'm saying to that is that my conversations with Chief Wall indicated to me, and I don't know the exact facts, I haven't looked that far into it, indicated to me that it was not disclosed. But that's off his word and not me actually seeing his his files and jackets and what he disclosed. That's so why I don't have any, any self, other than Chief Wall's statement, I don't have any other information. When was this thing? It's yeah. polygraph. Polygraph? Yeah. Uh, I can provide a copy to you, sir, but I believe it was in 2016. Right. I don't know if Paul hands it. And so rely, well, Chief Wall said that's the way I remember. I don't know exactly the characterization. My conversation with him on the phone. Well, the characterization is important. I can't let you off the hook on that one. I mean, the description is like he wants. Yeah. I did not look at Mr. Miller's file, jackets, anything, parts of PD. All I had to do was go off with the chief. Well, that's not true. You could have got those things. You just didn't. Good. No one. Right. right. Yeah. That's more of a news. Right. I would think that honestly you do that if you're prepared to testify that he made a dishonest statement. I'm in the process of looking long. through that. Those are, I've contacted the local PE, I've asked them to the records, I've asked them to do research. Wait. No, I'm talking about the Clarksville record. I know, but what you're asking me if I'm looking at the past, his rest, I need to start with the police because that's what he arrested arrest him. But anyway, you didn't look at it. Look at the locals, not going to say That's not what I'm asking you. I'm talking about Clarksville, and you know it. I'm not asking you about bull. The questions are wrong. I mean, did I didn't read to you any of the Clarksville records concerning this polygraph. I have not. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions you'd like to make argument? Mm -hmm. Mr. Bateau, do you have any other witnesses? Mm -hmm. Mr. Bateau, do you have any other witnesses? I have no other witnesses, Your Honor. Like to make argument? Your, Your Honor, the, again, the, uh, the state is not going to ask for a specific number for bond today. Again, the, uh, I'll go back to the statute. Um, but I also thought that the, uh, the witness that the defense called provided some insight um, and shed a little bit of light on a couple of things. Prior arrests by uh, the defendant in Louisville, as well as some failure to identify or failure to provide information, something uh, along those lines that the court can, sit, can consider um, in, uh, in dealing with uh, his, uh, his bond today and ask the court to consider those. Mr. Cook. I don't think the court can consider those things because the officer testified that they may have been expunged. State doesn't present any evidence whether or not they had been expunged, so I don't think the court can rely on it until that's proven. Two, it was a long time ago, and they were misdemeanors, uh, OWI, and I'm not sure what he said about he did make a reference to some sort of false informing, but I no details were given of that. What the state had to demonstrate for the court, and it's the state's burden, is that there's a risk of non-appearance or some danger to the community. So risk of non-appearance, what we know from the officer's testimony is that he's a lifelong resident of the state of Indiana. He's 35 years old. His immediate family, a wife and a daughter, reside here. And to most folks, that's kind of important. People don't run off from their wife and family, especially for a level six fellow. Also important is that the rest of his family is here. His roots are here. 
It's ridiculous for any argument to be made that this guy's going to flee. It's ridiculous. State had to prove that. They didn't prove that. Second thing, danger to the community. And I dis very disappointed heard the prosecutor say, well, he's got access to guns. Well, of course, the court can order him not to have access to guns, especially in line with the fact that he's been suspended as a police officer. But more importantly to that, although it's difficult to understand what they say he did, some sort of a, of a conflict of interest by voting for funding for the fire department when he was getting a few free meals and maybe vacation, some substantial things, I'm not quibbling, some substantial things from Jamie Knoll with no evidence as to whether or not he knew how Jamie Knoll was paying for those things. The thing about it is, I'm sorry. I think the, it came from the gallery. Okay, I'm sorry. The had I known, I wouldn't stop. Sorry. So the thing of it is, is that Indiana statute thirty-five thirty-three eight four says. Subsection B, bail may be set no higher than the amount reasonably required to assure the defendant's appearance in court or to assure the physical safety of another person or the community if the court finds by clear and convincing evidence, clear and convincing evidence that the defendant poses a risk to the physical safety of another person or the community. Now, we certainly don't have that from the offense itself. And I... I can't understand the state argument that, well, he's a police officer, so he has guns, even though there's no indication as a police officer or as an individual he has ever acted irresponsible with a gun. No evidence that this man ever threatened anyone. No evidence that this man has been improperly aggressive to another soul on this earth. And the offense indicates nothing about violence or dangerousness. It just isn't there. If it is there, the state didn't show it to us by clear and convincing evidence today. This officer didn't testify, the only witness presented. This officer didn't testify that he's dangerous. He cooperated with law enforcement throughout the investigation. Now, it was a proper response, and I'm glad the officer says that, hey, he didn't surrender himself. But the court can't use that as a term of, in setting a proper amount of bond because it's his right to. Criminal defendants don't have to uh, consent to searches, make statements, or any of those other things. Now, that's something he certainly would have been aware of when he made his statement, but he didn't have to surrender his his. Well, so you have what is a law-abiding person his entire life except for the OWI and the PI. And maybe he gave a false name. We don't know because there wasn't any evidence. Maybe he gave a false name when he's underage and he's arrested for illegal consumption. The passage of time alone on that from 2010 I think gives that really no weight, or very little weight, uh, combined with the fact that it may be expunged and shouldn't have been referenced at all. The Indiana Constitution, Article 1, Section 17, guarantees a reasonable bond. Section 18 protects my client from excessive bond. Those are due to the circumstances. The circumstances in this case indicate he should be OR. Remember, the Supreme Court in the case called Fry, kind of the seminal case on bonds, said that precise thing. People are presumed to be OR. Pretrial incarceration is the exception and not the norm. Of course, the criminal rule on bonds says that exact same thing. So he's presumed to be released until they showed us something. But nothing's been shown. Judge, I am going to request in the strongest terms that he be released on his own recognizance. 
Uh, I would point out, although I heard the board's comments earlier about the pretrial screening, pretrial screening does say that he's category one, a low list. And I'd point out that the rule requires the court to consider. It doesn't require the court to act on it or to accept it. That's cool, well, no. But it does require the court to consider. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tuck. Anything else, Mr. Perno? Only, Your Honor, that the uh, probable cause affidavit can and should be considered by the court in its determination as well. well. Jeff, I want to object to that. That wasn't introduced at the hearing. The prosecutor did not. Part of the case, Your Honor. The prosecutor did not request the court to take judicial notice. There's a lot of things that are part of the case. The court can take judicial well, notice. It's not part of the record. Of its can I finish, please? The court can consider anything in this hearing that wasn't made a record of during the hearing. That really is black letter law. I don't know why anyone thinks that to be funny. Okay. Mr. Toe, if you may not have followed this from the beginning, but when Mr. Noel was originally arrested, uh, the state asked that his bond be set at 25,000. I multiplied that by a factor of three. Um, Mr. Stewart took it up on appeal. The uh, Court of Appeals found that my ruling was appropriate. And based upon Clark County standard, Mr. Noel was to be released on recognizance with, I think he was at the same low level. So I'm not too concerned about Clark County standards. Does your client have firearm? He can answer that just yes, sure. what, what kind do you have? Um, I've got multiple uh, handguns. Um, three handguns. You have a shotgun? Uh, not at all. Got access to one? No. Well, I'm going to impose the same terms I did with Mr. Hall. Surrender your sidearms. You may possess a shotgun for personal defense. Remember what I told Mr. Null? Yes, sir. Repeat it for me. Um, don't try to deceive you. I'm not like the consequences. Do not do anything stupid. Do not try to deceive me. Do not try to defy me. You will not like the consequences. Good. You will not have any contact with any of the individuals associated with this case to discuss it. You obviously interact with your own attorney who will have the opportunity to speak with other counsel. Not leave the jurisdiction. Or do you know what the terms of your employment currently are? No, Your Honor. Can you post a $3,000 bond? Yes, Your Honor. That would be what it is. No, no drugs or alcohol. Yes, ma'am. That's in my jurisdiction. I typically set a level six felony sometime, somewhere between 2000 and 5000 depending on the circumstances. Um, What's your position with the council? Um, vice president of Clark County Council. What's your specific job, anything? Uh, Clark County Council is official body of county government. I understand that. I'm still on the council. Is there any subcommittees? No, you're on it. Does your client have a shotgun? She doesn't have a shotgun, Your Honor. She just informed me that she does have a handgun and she's going to surrender that or have somebody else take yeah. possession of it. Have her surrender unless you want to take possession of it. I'll have her surrender. She can have a shotgun too if she wants one. Right. Same terms as uh, Mr. Miller, except I'm going to set it at 3,500. 
because it seems like she had some trouble following directions. Can you post that? Right. Shh. Quiet, folks. Mr. Weitzel, will she be able to post 3500 She will, Judge. Same terms. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got a question, and, and it's more for her to know that follow, so she can follow the court's rules. Her son has medical issues, and she's wanting to know if he has have to go to Coast Sayers Children's Hospital, but either taking him there or if he's rushed there for she, medical she issues. She may go. Okay. But I want to. I want her to report to uh, to the court anytime she's had to go. Why? I will have her report. That why and for how long? Anything else, Mr. Herbert? John Miller, the Clarksville police officer and county council member of Clark County, Indiana, arrested and charged with felony conflict of interest in the Jamie Knoll investigation, is now asking for his trial to be moved outside of Clark County. According to Indiana State Police, Miller received allegedly thousands of dollars in gifts from Knoll and voted to approve several funding requests for his nonprofit fire and EMS service. He pleaded not guilty Monday and posted a $3,000 bond. This newly filed petition says this case has generated significant prejudicial publicity and claims Miller will not receive a fair trial in front of an impartial jury in Clark County. C01-2401-F529, one, one, State of Indiana versus Misty. No, um, it's my understanding, uh, Council, that uh, there's been some negotiations in regards to a possible settlement. Mr. Hurdle? Your Honor, I would represent to the court, and I'll, I'll let Mr. McMahon speak on, on the defense behalf, but we have been in negotiation. Um, for, for quite a period of time. Um, we don't have a resolution at this point in time, but uh, we, we are working and continue to work toward a potential um, plea agreement to, to offer to the court for uh, review and uh, possible um, acceptance. But we are not there yet at this point in time. Mr. McMahon. Yes, Your Honor. I would uh, echo Mr. Hurdle's statements. We have been in earnest negotiations. And we hope to have a resolution that is satisfactory to the court in the very near future. Thank you. Do you think it's possible that the state of the negotiations would get to the point where a week from now you might have a, a possible resolution? A resolution? And I'll be honest with you. I, I know there's victims that are coming in uh, next Monday, and that will have a big impact on whether or not I'm willing to accept whatever deal you guys enter into or propose to enter into.
Your Honor, I, I will be in Clark County on Friday this week for the motion to dismiss in uh, State versus John Miller and change of venue, and obviously for the, uh, the sentencing on Jamie on Monday. Um, there will be some time this week uh, to con continue on negotiations uh, with Mr. McMahon, and uh, he's been accommodating, and uh, we've had, uh, like he said, a number of conversations, and uh, would make time for that this week if, if that's what the court is asking us to do for, for Monday. And we can say probably one way or another that we're at a point of um, an agreement or we're at a point of, Judge, we're just going to have to go to trial because we can't resolve it. All right. Um, Mr. Uh, Judge, I can make myself available Friday at Mr. Hurdle's pleasure so that he and I can discuss and if we can finalize something, we can do so. As he indicated, uh, he's been available by phone, text message, email, and uh, we've had several conversations after business hours to try to get this thing done. Mr. McMahon, could you make yourself available next Monday afternoon? I know where Mr. Hurdle's going to be next Monday morning. And part of the afternoon, I suspect. Could you be yes, Judge. over here approximately 1.30? Whatever else I have on my schedule, I will juggle. Because if you're not, if you don't have a, a resolution that I'm willing to at least significantly and seriously consider, uh, we've got a trial date and I want to move on with that. Understood, Judge. It is our collective hope that we have a resolution and it is accepted by the court. Thank you. Ms. Saltel Bush, can you have your client here? Next week, also. Yes, Judge, I absolutely can. Monday? Monday. Thank you. Is there anything else that needs to be addressed, Mr. Hurdle? Not from the state, Judge. Thank you. Mr. McMahon? No, Judge. Again, it's our hope that we have this case resolved uh, next week. And of course, if not with the 28th trial date, then we probably have to get on the books a uh, couple of hours for pretrial motions. But thank you, Your Honor. We can do that. Unless well, there's anything else, we'll be an offer. Thank you. I'll see you next month. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. You okay? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wilder, can I see you and Mr. Earl? <clears throat> you may, Judge. Mr. Yeah, Your Honor. The state has received it also, Your Honor. Was there any corrections, modifications, supplements, additions? Your Honor, in fact, I reviewed it with uh, Mr. Noll. There are no additions, no corrections, and no uh, uh, supplements. Thank you, Mr. Wilder. Mr. Hurdle? No changes or additions, corrections. Filed and presented. We would accept it as filed, Judge. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Would counsel like to make an opening statement? Judge, on behalf of Mr. Noel, um, it will be our position to proceed with this sentencing uh, as the court has ordered. We did want to make an objection on the record uh, for non-statutory witnesses who may testify in this matter. Uh, on behalf of the defense, we would object to their testimony. Statutory witnesses, we believe, are appropriate. Non-statutory witnesses, we believe, are not appropriate. That would be the only objection and the only opening we would make with this court. Thank you very much. Response, Mr. Hurdle. Um, Your Honor, the, uh, the, the court at the, uh, at the guilty plea hearing uh, um, made the statement to uh, invite uh, the opportunity for other uh, victims and uh, people who've been affected or impacted by the crimes or Jamie Knoll's actions that defendant here. And uh, I, I'm going to defer to the court for um, uh, reaching out to them. And I have uh, met with these, uh, these people and uh, I believe that uh, the court, uh, based on its prior statement, uh, should allow them to do that. Mr. Rawls, I don't, I don't know uh, what they're going to say. Uh, I did make the request, uh, those that have been hurt, I wanted to give them an opportunity to be heard. So I note your objection for the record, but I'm going to overrule it. Thank you very much, Your Honor. You're your, your Honor, prior to going on the record, the, uh, the state has provided to defense and to the court 
uh, copies of letters and statements made by individuals who will not be present here in the courtroom today. And I would show at the direction of the court, those were to be provided to defense in the court on Thursday last week. Um, and would note for the record that those had been provided. Uh, I believe the, the, the judge's staff has indicated they have received those, and I believe that uh, the defense has received those as well. I would ask the court to, uh, uh, to take those into account uh, in accepting the, uh, the agreement today and give them their due weight. Mr. Your Honor, Mr. Yes, Your Honor. In fact, we did receive the information provided by Mr. Hurdle. We've had an opportunity to review it, and we believe that the court, in, in reviewing those, will give it the appropriate weight for each one of the messages that were sent. And the court has received them, and the court has reviewed each and every one of them. Your Honor, and the only other thing, I, I guess, with respect to those, is they have asked to, to not be a part of this and, and testifying. So I, I would ask the court that uh, it's probably appropriate for me not to release that list or those documents uh, in respect to their privacy and their confidentiality and providing it to the court and to defense at, at this point, unless the court directs me Otherwise, I, I, I believe that that might be appropriate uh, given uh, their statements. And Your Honor, we agree with the prosecutor in as much as we believe that you afforded it the way that, it, uh, that these messages and information uh, should be afforded, and we have no objection with, that, uh, with it not becoming part of the record. Well, and I, I believe that that's what I'll ultimately decide. I'd like to take it under advisement. I know that there's emails and private information they want to testify, but they did want to be heard. Um, let me take that under consideration for you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. You're Please. welcome. Um, would you like to call your first witness? I would, Your Honor. The state calls Suzanne Davis. Court's permission, um, must, now Chief Deputy is going to ask maybe that the, uh, your staff or the staff of the county have two or three that basically are in here on her. Just to kind of turn on some of the process, yeah. if that's okay. We've already thought about it. Okay. Are you saying then two at a time? Okay, great. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Thank you, Judge. Uh, You're welcome. Ms. Davis, would you state your name and spell it for the record, please? Yes, sir. My name is Suzanne Davis, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-D-A-V-I-S. Uh, and Ms. Davis, um, are you familiar with the defendant, Jamie Knoll? Yes, sir. Okay. And have you asked um, the court through the prosecutor's office to come in and make a statement uh, of the impact that Jamie Knoll uh, and his actions have had upon you and maybe your family or your career, et cetera? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, I would make for the record, too, that many of these witnesses have prepared a written statement. Some of them will read it, and some of them may not read it. So I, I just want to at least uh, apprise the court of that. That's fine. That's fine. Ms. Ms. Davis, you can uh, speak uh, freely to the court. You have about five minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Once again, my name is Suzanne Davis. Um, I have been a, involved in EMS for 16 years, 12 of which I have also been a firefighter. I worked for New Chapel EMS from December of 2020 until April of 2022. Uh, there were several, several things that could have had and also did have an impact on, on me. One of them was almost career as well as life ending. Um, for one, I was issued inadequate fire gear. I was issued gear that was meant for a person that is six foot two and approximately 250 to 280 pounds. Um, my mask that I was issued, if I was to make entry into a burning structure, was too big. Therefore, had I had to go into a burning structure, that mask would have not properly sealed. That could have potentially drawn in smoke, superheated gases, and any toxic particles that would be burning in that structure. That would allow that to enter into my lungs. Uh, there were also things on the EMS side. There were several times where I was the only paramedic for Clark and Floyd counties. 
if somebody in Charlestown needed a paramedic level care, I was usually stationed in the Floyd's Knob station at the end of my service with New Chapel, which meant that person would have to wait potentially up to 30 minutes for a paramedic to get there. That's not fair to anybody, in my opinion. Nobody should have to wait that long for an ambulance. There was no regard for employee safety. Uh, we worked long hours. We had no downtime. There were times I was sent on non-emergent transfers to Indianapolis, let's say, at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning with maybe 30 minutes of sleep through the whole shift. My shift started at 8 a.m., would run all day, Going to Indianapolis on 30 minutes of sleep for anybody is dangerous. Mistakes can be made. My partner could have wrecked. Uh, there were times that I requested to leave because I was wearing a fever, vomiting, just generally sick all around. My supervisor, no, you can't leave unless you find your own coverage. That, that's the kind of environment that was fostered there. Turns out I had COVID one of those times. There's no telling how many people, immunocompromised or not, in general, were exposed to COVID because of a practice like that. Uh, there was no regard for employee mental health. I may not have the whole five minutes to speak, Judge, um, but... Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you know, Ms. Davis. Well, th this is... Really, this is my last thing that I want to say. Um, December 2nd, 2021, 12.51 p.m. I was toned out for an unresponsive male in Georgetown. I got on scene, entered the residence. I had to pronounce not only a former co-worker, but a friend of mine, deceased. My partner received a phone call from one of the command staff telling my partner he needed to pick me up off the floor and go back available. That run almost ended my career. I have put my heart and soul into this profession. I have missed birthdays. I have missed sporting events, band concerts. And this is how employees were treated. This is how we were treated. No regard for our personal safety, no regard for our mental health, None. I had to sit there and look at my friend, dead, and be told to get back to work. There was no support offered to me except a phone call that started out with, well, we all know he had, he had issues. No support whatsoever. That all went unresolved until August of next year, of the next year in 2022, when I attempted to take my own life. Ms. Davis. Is that a fireman's tattoo on you? Yes, sir. It is a fireman EMS tattoo on my chest. I'm sorry. I had to experience that. And I'm sorry for the trauma that was imposed upon you as a result of finding your friend deceased. Thank you. Thank you for the courage to come in and speak today. Thank you for letting me speak. You're welcome. I wanted to hear from folks like you. Thank you. Are you okay now? Getting up. I'm better. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. My current employer helps. Good. Well, that's a lot. Good. Thank you. Take care of yourself, okay? Hey, Judge, we have one question. Next. Your Honor, the state calls Roger Montgomery, Jr.
Good morning, Mr. McGovern. Morning, Your Honor. Mr. Montgomery, would you uh, state your name and spell it for the record, please? Sure. Roger Dale Montgomery, Jr. R-O-G-E-R-D-A-L-E-M-O-N-T-G-O-M-E-R-Y, Jr., J-U-N-I-O-R. Mr. Montgomery, uh, you had an affiliation with New Chapel as well, and you've asked to, uh, to speak about the impact the defendant Yes. His actions have had on you and your life, your family, your career, etc. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you then, Mr. Montgomery. All right. uh, Your Honor, if it's okay, I have something I, I wrote. Can I read from? Certainly. Just remember, you got about five minutes. Yes, sir. Your Honor, thank you for allowing us to speak today. My name is Roger Montgomery. I worked for Mr. Knoll from 2005 to 2011 as a sergeant and advanced EMT on New Chapel Fire and EMS in Floyd County. My career as a firefighter began in 1994 in Northern Indiana as a paid firefighter EMT for Bethlehem Steel Fire Department in Burns Harbor, Indiana, and Lakes of the Four Seasons Fire as a fire, uh, firefighter and EMT in Crown Point, Indiana. Altogether, I've had 24 years as a firefighter, one and two, hazmat ops, fire instructor two, three, water rescue, technical rescue, fire officer one, strategy and tactics, so on and so forth. Uh, I was the first paid sergeant in New Chapel Fire Department's history. I was also the first paid sergeant in Georgetown Fire Protection District's history. I retired in 2015 uh, from an injury I received in the line of duty uh, that left me 100% uh, disabled. At the onset of the paid district, Jamie Knoll had us covering the Floyd County side for 911 fire and EMS related calls, only 911. It didn't take long soon after for us to start making what's called convalescent runs. Those are basic transports where you transport someone from the hospital back to the nursing home, dialysis patients back and forth from dialysis, uh, and, and those, those, type of, those type of calls. Uh, in doing so, he pulled, nine, he pulled firefighters being paid by the tax dollars of Floyd County, or New Albany Township, out of 911 coverage to make those convalescent runs. <clears throat> there was often times we had to respond back to the firehouse, drop off an ambulance and pick up a fire apparatus to do fire and rescue calls, delaying fire and rescue to the citizens of New Albany Township, the area which we, I, I primarily protected. That appears to put citizens' lives in jeopardy. Uh, Jimmy Knoll also allowed prisoners on work release from Clark County Jail to make entry into structure fires. These prisoners had the bare minimum of training, Your Honor, and held no certifications. Due to such operations, there's more than one occasion that my life safety was put in risk because of these poorly trained prisoners. Jamie Knoll also would pull on shift firefighters, particularly out of my station on Chapel Road in New Albany Township, to drive his personal limousines while they were being paid by the tax dollars. Leaving one firefighter to respond, usually me, or, or whatever a firefighter else was on duty, to respond with a fire engine. That is, two firefighters responding on a fire engine is inherently dangerous, let alone one person to operate the pump and try to make entry to at least make a grab if need be and try to get back out. There's no way one firefighter can operate a truck and make injury at the same time. Not, not safely. In 2011, I left New Chapel's employment and I went to work for Georgetown Fire Protection District and Yellow EMS. Jamie Knoll had his lawyer, Tom Lau, sent several letters threatening legal action due to non, a non-complete call, call clause, sorry, we were forced to sign or, or be terminated. I responded to Tom while letting him know that I would not stop working in my chosen profession. I let him know that the non-compete clause held no legal weight as I was a sergeant, did not, was not privy to any information, to any contracts, to any facilities uh, by, from New Chapel EMS and my, what knowledge I did have of their operations would not cause New Chapel EMS any financial strain. The letter stopped coming. But there was a unwritten rule 
on the street in New Albany Township that if his ambulance crews and I bumped head or ran across each other on a call, that his crews were not uh, not 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 to help me with with patient care. Hmm. Hmm. That they were to turn around and leave. If he had a basic ambulance show up, and I was an advanced EMT, and at that time National Registered Advanced EMTs were considered ALS, and I got on their truck because I've already initiated advanced life support care, and you know they're, they're, they already had the patient loaded on their ambulance. If I stepped on their ambulance. From what I understood, there were threats of those those firefighters and EMTs being disciplined if I was caught on another New Chapel squad giving patient care. You were at five minutes, Mr. McGonagall. Okay. Um, I had one last statement, perhaps. Okay. Your Honor, uh, as firefighter first responders and public servants, we take a higher oath. We, take, we are held to a higher standard of integrity. Jamie Knoll has betrayed the trust of the public, any first responder or anyone else that, that's ever worn a badge and taken that oath. He did so knowingly and wittingly for personal gain and, he, and he, that personal gain was put ahead of patients and lives and the people that work for him, safety. The, the convalescent transport, did they pay more or something? Ye, well, yes, sir. Uh, why, with, why was that a priority? Because Medicare and Medicaid will pay pretty much 100% or a certain percentage of a convalescent transport when 911 is just tax dollars. And if we were to bill for some, no, someone for 911, they rarely pay that bill. Mr. Waller and Mr. Boyles, any questions? Judge, we have no questions on behalf of Mr. Mill. Thank you for asking. Mr. Montgomery, thank you for your dedication. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for letting us speak. Thank you for taking your oath seriously and for having the courage to come to me. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. <coughs> Next one, Your Honor, the state calls Susanna Worrell. Right. Yes. Ms. Worrell, would you please state your name for the record and spell it, please? Susanna, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A, Worrell, W-O-R-R-A-L-L. Ms. Worrell, is it uh, your intent to, uh, to speak to the court today about uh, the defendant, Jamie Knoll, about his actions or inactions and how it's impacted you and your family and your career, uh, any of those things? Yes. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you then. Okay. Well. I have a statement I'd like to read. Yes, ma'am. As Prosecutor Hurdle stated, I am Susanna Worrell. I want to express my sincere, sincere gratitude to you, Judge, for allowing us to present our statements before accepting Mr. Knoll's plea agreement. I'm here today to discuss the terrible treatment my brother-in-law experienced from New Chapel Ambulance Service under the direction of Jamie Knoll on November 7th, 2023. November 7th, 2023 was election day here in Clark County. My brother-in-law, David Red Worrell, was on the ballot for Clarksville Town Council. At 3.20 p.m., Red was outside a polling site in Clarksville, greeting voters, which is two miles from Norton Clark Memorial Hospital. At 3.21 p.m., Red stumbles, then falls to the ground. Within 30 seconds after that fall, it was clear he was in a life-threatening situation, struggling to breathe. The timeline of events that occurred are as follows. At 3.22 p.m., 911 call was placed. At 3.23 p.m., CPR was started by voters on the scene. At 3.29 p.m., Clarksville firefighters arrived from a fire station located 1.6 miles away. At 3.33 p.m., paramedic in a chase car arrives. At 3.38 p.m., the ambulance arrives. When dispatch dispatched this ambulance, it was 11.9 miles away. At 3.49 p.m., the ambulance arrives at the hospital. For 16 minutes, Citizens, police officers, firefighters, 
and family members watch as heroic bystanders and firefighters took turns administering CPR. 16 minutes, we all waited and wondered where, when, and even if an ambulance would arrive. Did I mention we watched 16 minutes CPR being performed? Have you ever watched CPR being performed on someone? It's devastating. It is scarring. It is burned into my mind. That's all I can remember about that day. Well, that and the sounds of my husband's sobs when he arrived on scene. After waiting for what seemed like an eternity, the ambulance finally arrived to do what we thought was to be a load and go. But no, it took 11 more minutes to get him into the ambulance and travel two miles to the hospital. Even with the police escort blocking all street entrances for a faster arrival, it took 27 minutes from when 911 was called until Red arrived at the hospital. Unfortunately, 27 minutes was too long. At 4.13 p.m. on November 7th, 2023, ER doctors at Norton Clark Memorial Hospital called Red's time of death. Could Red still be alive today if the ambulance had arrived faster? Possibly. I believe Jamie Knoll and his family, if Jamie Knoll and his family had not spent approximately $5 million of New Chapel's money on lavish vacations, expensive suits, high dollar cigars, cars, and other items, and reinvested the taxpayer dollars back into that ambulance, my life would be completely different today. I was there the day Red died. I watched it all unfold before my eyes. Our family dynamics are changed forever by his death. My husband's grief after the loss of his brother, his best friend, and his business partner is truly devastating. Seeing the pain and agony of my mother-in-law daily after having buried her son, the heartbreak my sister-in-law feels after losing a sibling. Red's nephews and nieces lost their biggest supporter and cheerleader. It's not just his immediate family that has suffered his loss, but it's the entire community. Red grew up in Clarksville and is remembered for his support of community and his dedication to local schools. He advocated for Clarksville Cares, a community-run program for students who need food, clothes, and school supplies. Today, we cannot change the outcome for Red. He will never be forgotten, but we need Jamie Knoll's crimes against our family and the community to be remembered forever as well. The neglect Jamie and the other New Chapel Ambulance Service officials showed on November 7th, 2023 was appalling. Red considered Jamie a friend, and I hope my friends are there for me faster than 16 minutes if I'm ever laying on a concrete sidewalk fighting for my life. Ms. Wallace, the time is up. Let's do this for just a moment, though. Just take one minute. That was for a minute. Seemed like a long time, didn't it? Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Should sure. rather be remembered by a lot of people. Thank you for having the courage to come speak. On behalf of Mr. Noel Judge, we have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Next. Your Honor, the state calls Terry Thornton. 
and I believe actually uh, her daughter is going to be uh, part of this as well. Okay. <laughs> Which one's turn? Uh, if you could both state your name one at a time and spell it for the record, please. Uh, my name is Anitra Coatley Williams. It's A N I T R A Coatley C O A T L E Y Williams. Thank you, Ms. Williams and Ms. Thornton. My name is Terry T E R R I, last name Thornton T H O R N T O N. Ladies, I think you, you, uh, one of you is, is going to speak on behalf of, uh, of the two of you. Okay. Yes, and is that you, Ms. Williams? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Williams, uh, are, are you familiar with Jamie Knoll? And your ask today is that you're able to speak about his actions or his actions have affected you and your family. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And have you prepared something to give to the court today? I have. Okay. Go ahead, please. My name is Anitra, and I'm here on behalf of my dad, William Morris Thornton, and our family. My dad and my mom, Terry Thornton, were married for over 42 years. He was well known and beloved. He was a well known and beloved Jeffersonville resident. He worked and retired from Jeffersonville High School after 40 years of employment. Everyone at the school and all over the community loved and respected him. He was loved by so many. On August 14, 2024, around 2 p.m. or so, his heart suddenly stopped while walking to the restroom. He had no heart issues, no known heart issues. 911 was called. Jeffersonville Fire Department and the Jeffersonville Police Department responded. The fire department came and began CPR while waiting on an ambulance service to arrive. After about a whole hour or so passed. An ambulance service finally came. It was not New Chapel. Our family lived and lives in Capitol Hill's neighborhood for over 20 years. New Chapel has always been dispatched to us numerous times and always arrived within minutes. We have a disabled family member, their disabled grandson that We've had to call an ambulance service for several times, and they were always there within minutes. We truly believe that William Thornton, my dad, Terry's husband for over 42 years, would have had a fighting chance of survival if Do Chapel was dispatched to us. because they would have not taken all that time to get to us. New Chapel also would have possibly had the resources the fire department did not have, such as a defibrillator or anything else needed that could have possibly saved him. We were told he had been down for about 90 minutes when we got to the hospital finally. We do praise the Jeffersonville Fire Department for all their efforts in trying to keep my dad alive until an ambulance came. On September 13, 2024, William Morris Thornton would have turned 70 years old. If New Chapel had not have been robbed and was up and running, we truly believe my dad would have had a fight chance of survival after his sudden cardiac arrest. 
We hope that nothing like this ever happens to another family because of Jamie Noe's selfishness and greed. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. We lost one. Do you know why? Why they didn't show up? Were they already out of business? Yeah. Yeah. We just know that if if they were in business, they would have been there within minutes to help. Yeah. Any questions, Mr. Wilder? Judge, on behalf of Mr. Nall, we have no questions. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for coming and talking to me. Mr. Earl? Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, a statement called Beverly Kinnett. Beverly, could you uh, state your name for the record and, and spell it just so we, uh, we get it right? B E V E R L Y K N E C H T. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Kinnett, are you familiar with, uh, with the defendant, Jamie Knoll? Yes. And have you asked the uh, court through, the, through me that you would like to come and, and, and say some words and how Jamie Knoll and his actions have, have impacted you and your family? Yes. And have you prepared something to re either read or tell the judge today? Yes, I have. I'd like to read it, if I may. You may. Jamie Knoll's crimes have impacted me and my family because his choices hurt the Utica Volunteer Fire Department and the entire Utica community. My family has lived in Utica for 54 years. We have been very involved and dedicated to the fire department and the whole town. My husband, Charles Connect, was on the fire department from 1970 until it closed after the 97 flood. He was also the chaplain. My daughter and two sons were also volunteer firefighters for Utica. It was a community effort, and it brought the entire Utica community together. Everyone participated in the yearly festival to raise money for the fire department. There were also parades and other activities. The fire department had an old fire truck it had purchased in 1954, and Charles bought that truck in 1993 when the department was ready to get rid of it. He used it at his own expense to support the community. During the 1997 flood, he drove it around town and helped people with it by washing the mud out of their homes and off the streets. He drove it in Utica's parades. The truck meant a lot to the town and to us. When my husband passed away in 2012, the community came together at the old firehouse for a memorial service for him, and Jamie officiated at the fire department honors at the graveside service. After my husband's death, Jamie approached my son and said that he would like to have the truck back to restore it for the fire department. I was happy to keep the truck in the community, and we traded it to him for another truck. That was 10 years ago. I recently went to see the truck. It was outside. The fire hoses had been cut off. I took pictures of the fire truck from before and from now to the Vintage Fire Museum and talked to the chairman and a man who specializes in restoration of fire trucks. They told me it is past restoring at this point. Jamie did not keep his word. We considered Jamie a personal friend. At that time, at that point in time, we considered him as a part of our community and people trusted him. He broke that trust. It is hard for me to comprehend, comprehend what he stole from our small <coughs> town and his own brother's children to purchase expensive homes, cars, clothes, shoes, trips, and unne other unnecessary things for himself and his family and his friends when I live on $1,200 a month to cover everything I own. I shop at Goodwill and go to the food bank, but I still volunteer for things in the community I believe in and love. I believe there should be serious consequences for bad choices that were knowingly and willingly and purposely made to benefit Jamie, not just a slap on the wrist. I also believe the money he stole from the people of Utica 
should be repaid in restitution to our community. The scripture says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanessa. You seem like a, a very nice lady, and I'm sorry. No, thank you. It sounds like that truck had a lot of sentimental attachment to it. Yes, for the whole town. Sorry we lost it. Any questions, Mr. Nolder? Your Honor, on behalf of Mr. Nolder, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> the state um, has spoken to a, a witness by the name of Courtney Cutright. Uh, Ms. Cutright prepared a uh, statement as, and has asked me to read it into the record for the, uh, the court to consider, and, and I have a, uh, that in front of me now. If it please the court and counsel, I, I, I ask leave of court to do that now. Oh. No objection, Judge. Is Ms. Cartwright here? She is here, but um, I, I think uh, court staff has indicated that she is not, uh, does not want to come in the courtroom at this point in time. Uh, I, I can go out and speak to her if you would like. Will you bring her to the door? It would. Is that what you want me to read it now? There's no objection. No objection. Yes. Go ahead. I want to thank Mr. Hurdle, Tracy, his staff, Detective Heron, and other law enforcement present when we met at the ISP post two weeks ago. Thank you for your compassion, for your condolences, and for all of your hard work. Judge Medlock, I want to thank you for making this trial a fair and neutral process. Thank you for showing compassion to all Mr. Knowles' victims, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak on behalf of Chris Sweet and to be his voice today. The reverberations of Mr. Knowles' actions will ripple throughout this community for a long time. Vengeance is not mine, as I surely wish it could be, but it is the Lord's. I have to trust in that. I want to speak about the pain of grief. It never leaves you. The sharpness of it does diminish somewhat with time. Pain changes shape, and you learn to live around it. Sweet was my fiancé and the love of my life at the time he passed. I used to pray every night that the Lord would take my life in my sleep because I did not know how to be without him. But I am a mama, and I would never do that to my children. <clears throat> Sweet was only 37. We were raising our daughters together. His daughters had mothers. He had a mom and a dad. He had a brother and his wife and their boys, his nephews. He had a grandma. He had aunts, uncles, cousins. He had so many friends. He had a best friend that he considered another brother. So what happened to Sweet? While in Bookin at the Clark County Jail over Memorial Day weekend 2017, he had chest pain, high blood pressure, dizziness, and anxiety. He was in a room with several other men, and he stood up and said, I don't feel so well. He then got a drink of water and said, I feel like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. He then collapsed, never to get up again. Medical attention was not rendered in an appropriate amount of time. No .9 miles driven to CMH, no heart cath, no stent for his oculated occluded artery, and no more sweet. Mr. Knoll told me he always had two EMTs and a nurse on staff. Perhaps had he chosen to better allocate the money he stole, putting it towards much needed medical staff, I was lied about utilizing it instead for $800 belts, extravagant vacations, college education for children, then the medical care could, and I know it would have been provided, and sweet would still be here. How dare he? Mr. Knoll forever altered our family dynamics and the tra trajectory of all of our lives. I would also be remised if I didn't mention the Lakers and Kobe. 
Sweet was the biggest Lakers fan. I like to think he and Kobe are shooting hoops, <laughs> talking about that Mamba mentality. Your Honor, in closing, it is difficult for me to give my opinion on the measure of time that Mr. Knoll should serve. What I will say is that Sweet got only 37 years on this earth, and he lost the whole rest of his life. So 15 years is no comparison. Your Honor, if I may have your permission to direct this brief part of my statement to Mr. Knoll. I choose to forgive you, not because I want to, but because I believe in the Lord, and I know it is the right thing to do. So I stand still, and I stand firm, and it is only by the grace of God I do forgive you. I will leave this court with words that Sweet used to say often and end a lot of text messages and Facebook posts echoing his Kobe. Mic drop, Sweet out. It's well written. Hey. Um, okay. Is Miss Cut right? Is she going to stick around? She's out, out there in the other room. Oh. That's good if just stay for a while. Okay. Call your next witness, Mr. Morley. That was Janice Sweet. Ms. Sweet, would you uh, state your full name and spell it for the record? Janice Marie Sweet. And would you spell it, please? J-A-N-I-C-E-M-A-R-I-E-S-W-E-E-T. Uh, Ms. Sweet, um, are you familiar with the uh, defendant, Jamie Knoll? Yep. And have you asked the, uh, the court to read a statement today about how his actions have impacted you and your life and yes. your family? And have you prepared that today? Yes, I have. Okay. Go ahead then, please. Okay. I am the mother of Christopher Sweet. I'm here to tell you how Jamie No and his crimes affected myself and my family's lives while he was out cheating, stealing from his people and businesses and his own family. My son, Christopher Charles Sweet, went to jail Memorial Day weekend 2017 because of an argument with his fiance. Police came and someone had to go to jail. It was Chris. 17 hours later, my 37-year-old son lay dead on the floor. The cold, concrete floor of your jail, Jamie. He told them he needed his blood pressure medicine and it was brought from home for him just a few hours after he arrived. But they were unable to give him that until the nurse came in and gave the initial dose. Nurse was called and told his blood pressure was lethally high and he was not feeling well. The nurse just put him on medical watch but did not come in, even though his blood pressure was extremely high. Medical watch is to monitor a person watch for certain uh, things to happen to him, signs of distress, change in color, blood pressure, respirations, pulse, breathing, sweating, color, etc. After that call, Chris started to have chest pain and for the next 12 hours, he begged for help and none was given. He laid on that hard, cold floor all night in agony, stating, I feel like an elephant on my chest. I want to make it clear this is not about Clark County Jail. I have already settled my grievance with them. However, after I found out all the criminal activity that you, Jamie, were involved in, the picture became clear to me that there was no training or education or leadership for your people. Jamie, no, you're no training on emergency care. His employees were as much a victim as we were. So next day at 11.30, the nurse came in after he got up and went to church, not caring that his blood pressure was an emergency uh, and not addressing that emergency. The nurse gave him blood pressure medicine, and in addition to that, he was given a controlled substance that was not ordered for him or ordered by any physician. That's against the law. Jamie, this is the, uh, no vitals, I'm sorry, no vitals were charted other than the initial high vital sign. The nurse left and went home, but he came back in at 5 o'clock and charted a normal blood pressure reading, 130 over 80. Only problem was, my son Chris died at 3 o'clock, so he illegally charted that, but the computer stamped it at 5 o'clock. And that's against the law. Your staff 
should have been trained to handle a medical emergency, especially if you were not going to be around due to your criminal shenanigans and how much more you can get and squander away to make you look like somebody. I was notified Sunday evening that he died by the coroner and chaplain that came to my house. However, we went straight to Clark Memorial where he was taken to. Several sheriffs and security guards spread out in front of us and informed us that we could not, we were not allowed to see or touch him because he was still under their custody until an autopsy was performed to clear them and you, Jamie, of wrongdoing. We saw him four days later in his casket. Where were you, Jamie, on that weekend? I tried multiple times to contact you, but you were not available. Were you celebrating the holiday with all your wealth and thievery while my son lay dying on your jail cell floor, frothing at the mouth and turning blue? Jamie, your own family has to hold their head above your crimes in this town that they were raised in, and you didn't even care about them. You put yourself above your greed, above all others. The saddest part is family and your voters had you pretty high up, up there. They really thought a lot of you. Now they have found out who you truly are. Jamie, you are less than any person I know, and I hope you rot in prison. My son was a good man. He adored his children, Hannah and Avery. They were his whole life. Now they have to live the rest of their lives without a father. Chris was not a criminal, a drug addict, or an alcohol abuser. He tried really hard to live his life the right way, with respect and integrity to others. He lost his life over a simple little argument and was sent to his death chamber under your watch. In your lack of leadership, his manner of death, he did not have occluded arteries. His manner of death was determined natural causes. Ms. Sweet. Your time is up if you have a closing. Okay. Well, just let me say that, um, let me see what I want to say next. Well, anyway, I'll go on and say, uh, again, for your lack of leadership, I lay this on your shoulders and I have you suffer every day. Now, I want to say, too, that when you're laying in your jail cell and have anxiety and can't get your breath, I want you to think about my son every time. I hope that haunts you for the rest of your life because it's going to be with us for the rest of ours. Well, sweet. Um, I can only imagine the depth of your loss. I, if my son was to pass away, I think my world would end. I'm sorry. Well, that was all due to the, the way he wasn't giving attention to his elected chair for all the things he was doing. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and talking to us. Did you have any questions? On behalf of Mr. Noll, Judge, we have no questions. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Wilder, I get ahead of myself. And that's, that's all right. I'll make sure that we Good morning, ma'am. Morning. Mr. Hurley? Yes, Your Honor. The uh, state calls Martina Webster. Mm -hmm. Ms. Webster, would you uh, state your name for the record and, and spell it also? Yeah. Martina Webster, M-A-R-T-I-N-A, W-E-B-S-T-E-R. Uh, Ms. Webster, are you familiar with, uh, with Jamie Noll? And are you here to... Uh, to give a statement about how his actions and his criminal actions have impacted you, your family, your, your career, etc. I am. Okay, would you please go ahead? I'm, I'm here mainly as a victim of, I believe, the Republican Party and what he's done to, for our part, against our party. Um, I was a precinct committee woman in 2012 and in 2016 in Clark County. Um, I moved to Floyd County in 2019. Um, I'm still a vice precinct committee woman there. Um, usually the first order of business with the caucus at reorganization was for Jamie to get mostly appointed precinct committeemen um, to give him the authority to fill, up, fill ballot vacancies. Um, that way there wouldn't have to be a caucus and the precinct committeemen wouldn't have a say in who was appointed to county council and so forth. Um, so. In 2014, I went through weeks of classes. In 2014, they changed the law since, but in the, at that time, 
um, you had to be a level three certified assessor to run for assessor in the county. Um, it was two tests and then five weeks of classes that had to be taken before you could even put your name on the ballot. Um, I finished those classes in May of 2014 and needed Jamie's signature on the CAN 29 in order to be placed on the ballot. Um, multiple candidates were appointed and multiple emails were sent to Mr. Noel to sign that, <coughs> um, but it wasn't until I took the paper to a parade where all the other Republicans were present and requested that he sign it that he actually signed it in time for me to run. Um, <laughs> That was a big Republican year. I was one of two Republicans in the county that did not win, and I fully believe it was because Mr. Knoll did not want me to win. Um, it, it, him and his friends actively worked against me. I only lost by 630 votes against a two-term incumbent. The following year, 2015, I ran for Sellersburg Town Council, and I won. Um, in 2017, there was a big push. There were three Republicans and two Democrats on the council. There was a big push to change the town attorney to Mr. Wilder. Um, I did not go along with that and the others did not. We retained a, a separate council. Um, that year, one of my fellow Republican council members accused me of kicking him. And in return, I had to hire an attorney, retain an attorney, because the Clark County Sheriff's Office then called to ask about this situation. So in 2019, Jamie encouraged a fellow police officer to primary me. Um, I know that Jamie was behind it because friends of mine told me that Jamie had personally called to ask them to support my opponent over me in the primary. It's my personal opinion that Jamie is a narcissist and a sociopath. He's a danger to society, especially when in positions of power. Many people were afraid of what he could do to them as county sheriff, and at one time he was up for consideration for state police superintendent and there were many of us terrified of what he could have done with that power. Um, there's no my, doubt in my mind he would have abused it and ruined lives with it. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, no. Mr. Wilder, do you have any questions? Literally, Judge, we have no questions of this witness on behalf of Mr. Mill. Mr. Webster, th thank you for coming and talking to us. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Hurdle. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. The uh, state will call Teresa Ballou. Ms. Ballou, would you uh, state your name for the record, please? It's Teresa, T-E-R-E-S-A, Ballou, B-A-L-L-E-W. And Ms. Ballou, are you familiar with the defendant, Jamie Knoll? Yes. And have you prepared a, a statement for the court to consider prior to his sentencing today? I have. And did you write it or did you? I have it written. Okay, I'll let you go ahead and speak then. Thank you, Your Honor, for allowing me to speak today. My information is not necessarily criminal, but speaks to the character of Jamie Noel and how he treats those not a part of his inner circle. I became acquainted with Jamie Noel around 2009 when myself and some others were alarmed at the downward spiral of politics at the national level. We started a local chapter of the Tea Party Patriots and wanted to become involved at grassroots level. Some of the participants campaigned and were voted in as delegates to represent the GOP at the Republican State Convention in 2012. In order to be delegates, we were required to pay a fee to the state party. Jamie did not control the Tea Party Patriots and was therefore opposed to us. We were told that the elected delegate fees were paid by a benefactor except the Tea Party delegates. But those of us outside of his support group never received notification of the amount or due date. At the last minute and after multiple attempts, Jamie posted a notice on the window of the local GOP office that was obstructed by a bush. The notice said the fee was due on May 11, when they were not actually due to the state party until May 22nd. I paid for mine and another duly elected delegate who was on vacation out of the country by credit card on the GOP PayPal site on May the 18th. There were other Tea Party delegates who followed suit. Jamie claimed we did not pay on time, refunded our fees, and was preparing to replace us with delegates of his choosing. 
when voters who had gone to the polls and voted for us found out that their votes were being tossed out, many raised an outcry. A letter was sent threatening legal action against the disenfranchisement of these voters and resulted in us being reinstated by the state party. A copy of that letter is attached. Another instance of which there were several, but to make this brief, was the ouster of the president of the Clark County Republican Women's Club. This newly elected president had turned what was a social club into a working and educational club for the women involved. She was an independent thinker and researcher and believed in ethics and politics. Ultimately, the strong GOP woman who was ousted won her seat as the first Republican woman to be elected to the Clark County Council, even as Jamie and his sycophants actively and openly campaigned against her. There was a state senate race, and it was well known of Jamie's support for one candidate over the other before the primary. He even enlisted his vice chair to spy on the campaign he did not support. As the head of the GOP, his role was to support all of the candidates until after the primary. He would thwart campaigns of those he did not like. For example, in a different campaign with the full knowledge of Jamie, a candidate for a state seat drove to Indianapolis to file only to find out that Jamie neglected to tell a candidate that his application had to be approved and signed by Jamie. These are just a few examples of the malicious deeds Jamie Noel did for over a decade as head of the local GOP in order to maintain his control of people and elections. In closing, I was proud to have been elected and to have participated in my civic duty. All because I was not a yes person, Jamie has spoiled the way I view leadership in my party. I also wonder if my donations to the party went to those who I supported or to Jamie's chosen ones. He abused his power and we knew what kind of person he was and now others know too. He is a person of bad moral character and I hope you will take this into consideration. Thank you for your time, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Um, thank you for exercising your independence and and uh, having the courage to do so. Thank you. Mr. Wilder may have some questions. Please. Certainly, Judge, we have no questions at this point. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Hi. Your Honor. Mr. Hurdle. Your Honor, the state calls Angie Payton. Uh, Ms. Payton, would you uh, tell the court your name, please, and yes. spell it for the record? Angie Payton, A-N-G-I-E-P-A-Y-T-O-N. Um, and Ms. Payton, are you familiar with the uh, defendant, Jamie Noel, who he is? Yes, absolutely. And have you prepared a uh, statement you'd like the court to consider before making a decision on any sentence today? Correct. On behalf of the community, I want to establish with it. Thank you. You may, you may go ahead, then, Angie. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first off, I wrote mine down, so I want to thank you for allowing us to testify. There are many, many members of the community that are very upset um, about what Jamie has done. And I would like to speak to him, if I could, on their behalf. Okay. So, um, I work, Mr. Noel, if I should even give you the respect to call you Mr., you do not know me. But I work in an establishment you are associated with. It is a place where people gather, and you frequented, you were a frequent member there. You've been a topic of conversation multiple times, and they aren't good. It's more in disgust. You are being called a disgusting pig, and that's no pun intended. You've been living on our money for years. What have you been doing with yours? Sending to overseas accounts, not spending it. Clearly, it has not been your money that paid for the lavish dinners, fancy clothes, antique cars, women's lingerie, extravagant vac vacations. I'm a single mom. Do you know where my vacation is? It's in your pocket. Or it's going to property taxes that keep getting raised because Clark County doesn't have any money. Wonder why. Um, so I'm so sorry. 
So oh, take, um, take your time. Please. And then uh, something else: the community, <laughs> the people are saying they were, uh, they just couldn't, they were appalled that even after you got arrested, you were out spending money on credit cards that you knew was wrong. You knew it was wrong. Um, how you didn't have a heart attack from stress keeping up with all the bank accounts and how money was coming from which way. I do good keeping up with two accounts. I don't know how you have any hair at all. <sighs> Let's see. You seem so calm about everything. You never seem like anything mattered. So it's almost like you don't have a soul. You mentioned you wanted to be famous. Well, careful what you wish for. I'm sure A&E is embarrassed and ashamed that they had your jail on their show. Um, I'm sure they could still profit off of you, though, by making a movie and now calling it 12 years in or from sheriff to cellmate. I'm sure your mom would have been proud. Um, everything you did to your brother, his kids, and his wife uh, is, is disgusting. Some small part of me feels sorry for your children because they didn't know what they were doing and you dragged them into this. Um, You're supposed to protect their children, and you did the exact opposite. Um, they wouldn't be involved in all this if it wasn't for you. So a small part of me feels sorry. You deserve everything you get. And I wonder if you will be smirking like you did on TV now on your way back to Scott County Hill. I'm sure the jail fabric does not even compare or come close to the $80 underwear or $2,000 suits you're wearing. But I hope you get used to it. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome, Miss Peggy. Thank you. A question. Sure. What do you what do you do for a living? I'm a bartender. Okay. Um, I, I really don't want to say where, but no, I'm not going to ask you where. I, I, you look sort of familiar. I, I thought you might have been a, a, a waitress somewhere. <laughs> like that, but. but that's all I have, Your Honor. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Weber? Your Honor, none for this witness on behalf of Mr. Nello. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Payton. Thank Thank you very much for thank you. having the courage to come in and speak to us. Thank you. And I'm on behalf of the community. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Why don't we take a uh, comfort break? It's we've been out here about an hour and a quarter. Thank you, Jack. Come back. It's like seventy percent. How come after I get this in that? Is it going? Don't <laughs> 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 Hope Noel, H-O-P-E-N-O-E-L. And uh, Ms. Noel, are, we, are you related uh, to the defendant, uh, Jamie Noel? Not anymore. Have you prepared a statement uh, that you wish the court to consider prior to a uh, decision on uh, his sentencing here today? If you could uh, explain, uh, you said not anymore. Uh, could you explain that, please? I'm the ex-wife of Leon Noel, and I have his son, Jack. Noel, we have a son together, and then I also have Taylor Noel, who is Leon's son, or Leon's daughter, sorry, not mine, but she also lives with me, 
and then they have another. Uh, there's another son, Dorian, as well. So these are nieces and nephews mm -hmm. of, uh, the of Jamie's. Okay. Thank Can you. Can I speak directly to him? Your Honor, I'll, I'll let you ask the judge that, uh, Ms. Nolan. I want to aim this directly at you, okay? I'm speaking on behalf of Leon's kids. I'm his ex-wife, mother of his youngest son, Jack. We trusted you to handle Leon's estate and give the kids what was rightfully theirs when he passed away. Leon trusted you to do what was right for his children since he was not going to make it. He literally had to make a will in the hospital. Do you remember him passing away? I'm sure you do since you were there in the hospital with, with all of us when he did. I don't see how you can say in your Facebook post that your brother Leon is missed and loved after what you've done to him and his children. I believe in you and I have a very different, different definition of the word love. I'm not sure why you felt the need to steal from the estate since you're already stealing from everyone else. And you claim to be a Christian man. Did you know greed was one of the seven deadly sins? Apparently you didn't pay much attention in church. When you gave the chicks, checks to the kids from the estate, the amounts were lower than I would have expected, but I did not question it because I was not married to Leon anymore and I did not know his financial status. So I never questioned it, why would I? His brother, the sheriff, was handling it since you were the executor. Looking back now, I wish I had a gotten, gotten a lawyer for the kids when he passed. I remember having numerous phone calls with you, trusting you, even sent you a thank you gift of cigars that I contacted John Miller to see what your favorite cigars were. I was grateful that you handled the estate process and wanted to thank you for doing so. I had them sent to your house and you never even acknowledged it or said thank you. Now I know why. Then a little over five years later, we find out that you have stolen from the same estate that I thanked you for handling. From your nephews Dorian, Jack, from your niece Taylor, your brother's children who lost their father like that wasn't bad enough. Now here we are dealing with courts differently than you did your other kids. Leon had more to do with her than you did, and he was just her uncle. At least he didn't steal from her like you did to your nieces and nephews. He was the better brother, the better uncle, and a better, better father than you'll ever be. Your niece Taylor has written you a letter. I'll read it for you. <coughs> from Taylor. I am extremely disgusted by your actions towards not only the family, but to this county. What you did is unacceptable and will pay the consequences. There is no getting out of this. Because of you, the family now has trust issues. The family never sees each other. The family now has trauma. You really hurt us in a way no family member should ever have to go through. And you hurt this country or this county because now we don't trust our elected officials either because of the corruption you've caused. And I hope one day, and if you're ever released and you can finally be a de decent human being because you, what you have done is pure evil and I expect apologies to everyone. And she wants to re really hope this thing sinks in for you at this part. That grandma, your mom, grandpa, your dad, and Leon would be very disappointed in you. Karma is coming for you and I hope you realize how bad this upsets me. Have fun in prison because you deserve it. <coughs> Yeah, that's what I want to see right there, is you crying. Finally, some reaction. You've put us through hell. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm sorry for all the trauma that you and your family have experienced from this. Thank you for letting me speak. I hope you could be on. Thank you very much for letting me speak. The bottom. No questions, Judge. Any more questions, Mr. Herman? Thank you, Your Honor. The uh, state calls Sean Bostock. Thank you, Mr. Bostock. Good morning, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Wilder, do you need to, you need to take a short break? Ted, we prefer to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, would you state your name for the record? Sean Bostock, S-H-A-W-N-B-O-S-T-O-C-K. Mr. Bostock, would, uh, do you know the defendant, Jamie Knoll? Yes, sir. 
And have you uh, prepared a, a, at least some sort of statement that you wish the court to consider prior to uh, the decision today on his sentence to court? Thank you. Your Honor, once again, thank you. How do you put 20 years into five minutes? It's almost impossible. So it's going to be a very abbreviated experience. Jamie, you're responsible for a lot of death in Clark County because of your decision making. My wife's sister being one of them. Your policies, your decisions, and your greed over the responsibility to the county has led to these deaths. <clears throat> one of those deaths being Julia Bissing. You are just as responsible as Mike Hutchins was because your policies allowed that type of behavior. Your Honor, in 2016, Jamie Knoll pulled me into his office not too far from where I'm sitting right now, and he described to me how he, pardon my language, runs this motherfucker. He explained that his time at the Indiana State Police, he remained apolitical, therefore he was expediated through the ranks versus having to be paired with a Democrat to move up the ranks. He outlined to me that he wanted the Clark County Sheriff's Department seat as the sheriff because it's the most political power to be paid for. He outlined to me how he would use precinct committeemen. Uh, he preferred to have the precinct committeemen positions vacant so that he could appoint them with people that would be an echo chamber to himself. And that's how he ran this. He outlined how the importance of holding the coroner close to him was important. Therefore, it was Terry Conway who was the first coroner for the, the county. He outlined that people did what he said because they, they loved to have the power. And this continued all the way to just the week before the contempt hearing where Mr. Noel himself was passing on to his flunkies and his cronies that I killed somebody behind the wheel, which was false and fictitious, that I was a wife beater, which was false and fictitious. This was the way this man ran. You know, shortly after 2004, I had to sue in federal court back then because back then he was stealing from the firefighters and not paying us as we were supposed to be. So I sued in federal court, one of the few that did it, to hold him accountable. And the only thing that that did was make him more angry with me. And more, more, and more times, I was went after him, not necessarily by him by word of mouth, or him directly, but he would send his flunkies. There were occasions that he would point me out himself. Jamie, you've done this to yourself, man. You, you had the world. You could have done so great for this county. You started New Chapel with the correct frame of mind because you wanted better things for the county. You yourself had had a loss because of a long ambulance time. We all realized that. It could have been the right way, but greed took over, man. You took something great and you dwindled it down to where it cost people their lives because of long EMS response times, improper equipment, um, the, the, the CPR vests that the paramedics were asking for. Jamie told them, no. I've got these all chronicled where all these medics and all these instructors came forth and said, we need this equipment. We're being told no because we don't have any money because it was being paid for for Cuba trips and everything else. Meanwhile, he targets everybody that tried to draw attention to it and tried to put an end to it at an earlier time. I believe that this deal guarantees us some accountability. You know, we all have to worry about the corrupt nature of Clark County. <clears throat> you yourself have said on the bench, you know, you don't do things the Clark County way, and I thank you, Your Honor, because I'm afraid if it went to jury trial, the Clark County way may come to the surface. And I beg you to go ahead and accept this offer. Sean. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Sean, thank you, thank you for having the courage to speak and mm -hmm. and communicate your concerns to to the community you obviously care about. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Waller may have some questions for you. No, I have no questions to this witness. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Waller. The next witness I believe you do too. Thank you. Mr. Wilder. Judge, we have no relevant questions for Ms. Hodges. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Hodges. Thank you. Thank you. Call the next witness. Your Honor, the uh, statement called Matt Owen.
Morning, Mr. Allen. Excuse me. Mr. Owen, would you uh, please state your name and spell it for the record? It's Matt Owen, M-A-T-T-O-W-E-N. Uh, Mr. Owen, uh, you know Jamie Knoll. That's correct. How long have you known Jamie Knoll? Um, approximately 15 years. Have you prepared a, a statement today for the court to consider about the actions have had on you, the organization that uh, you work for, and the individuals that have worked for it? <clears throat> I, I, I do. Uh, your Honor, I'd ask that uh, Mr. Owen be permitted to uh, make that statement to the court. Person. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh. Barrow, Beswick, Levins, Bullard, Clark, Constant, Cooper, Kramer, Dorset, Dowd, Duncan, Graham, Green, Grow, Hall, Ham, Harl, Herod, Johnson, Mayford, Middleton, Mullins, Ogden, Olick, Powers, Reese, Roadcap, Sorrell, Story, Tackett, Thomas, and Westerfield. These are the names of the providers who clung out to our mission and yet still had to find alternate employment because of the credibility you stole from our organization. Sadly enough, that theft is not something of which you can be charged and convicted. I've spent much of the last several months insisting that New Chapel was bigger than one person and one person's actions. The men and women I mentioned, along with others, held that to be true. Our service was bigger than you, but unfortunately, in a time that prefers clicks over careful consideration, the shadow of your actions uh, that cast made us all out to be suspected criminals. And I don't just mean myself because of our perceived friendship. I mean EMTs that you probably can't even picture their faces who were responding to calls for service, only to have been met as if they had direct involvement in the crim criminal enterprise. Your actions robbed them of the earned acknowledgement of their clinical skill and replaced it with suspicion and unease from a shell-shocked community. You'll never truly know the added burden you became for 20-something-year-old EMTs who just wanted to go into their community and help. The tragedy, <clears throat> excuse me, the tragedy for the most recent crew of clinicians who wore the new chapel uniform is that it didn't have to get to this point. You sit here having pled guilty now when you were guilty all along. The crimes you now commit, or you now admit you committed, were already true when you professed this time last year were the result of nothing more than a political witch hunt. You knew then, and you insisted it was not true. You sat next to me in a room full of EMTs and paramedics and let me insist that there was nothing wrong here. When I pressed you, insisting that the truth would easily be uncovered in time, you were steadfast in innocence. You let myself and others stand beside you, all while you knew the day would eventually come that all the truth would come down upon us. Instead of holding yourself accountable and admitting it then, you let this whole process draw out, despite who it affected. But your actions have resulted in much, much more than lost credibility for the organization I now have to dismantle. You Take used... your phone if it's a phone. Please call me back. I'm sorry. It was mine. I thought I had it off. Take possession of it. <coughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Long, being around here. Thank you. <clears throat> you used many who believed in you to convince this community to put our trust in you. We held you as the pinnacle of a public servant. We rallied behind you in the pursuit of ridding out public corruption, all while no you knowingly stood behind the curtain extracting so much for personal gain. You designed this persona of selflessness for yourself and misled our entire community, all while extracting as much as possible. You were masterful in disguising a narcissistic need of self-importance. You surrounded yourself with people who had the integrity and selflessness you want, wanted others to see in you. The tragedy for them is that their trust in you is what now is causing their diminished credibility. Good people who have dedicated themselves to public service are now finding themselves guilty by association just for having believed in the web of deceit you spun. But for a moment, take out all the damage you've done to the reputations of those who believed in you. And for a moment, consider the risks you took. 
consider the 59 Corvette you bought with what we know, now know as New Chapel money. You once bragged to me about that car just because someone else you knew wanted to have one. You wanted him to see you have it. Was that $45,000 car worth the cost of an organization that was so short-staffed in its number of available responders? That's one example of the charges now you plead, of which now you plead guilty. Was having that car and so many other material things worth the risks you put on your people instead of staffing more effectively? Was it worth the risk of my kids possibly not having a father come home one day so that you could buy a mansion or two and fill buildings of car with cars that you didn't even drive? The fact is that I was your friend and I supported you. I saw what I believed was work being put in to build for the good of our community, and I believed in that work. I saw the group of professionals you surrounded yourself with and believed it was for a greater good. But somewhere, and I'm not sure when, but somewhere, your drive from, to make a better community, if that's what it ever was, got lost to a drive uh, for personal gain. I would have been your friend regardless of the level of success found because I, believe, I believed that we believed in the same morals and ideas, but realizing the level of greed and lack of personal accountability have now shown that the foundation of our friendship was really worthless. Everything you built was built to be dependent on you. It was always about you. New Chapel EMS didn't have a cohesive management structure built to last after you because you never intended to stop taking from it. Even now, you've surrounded yourself with an expert legal team, paid in large part from the value extracted from those who entrusted you as chief and sheriff, and though you've spent a career building a house of cards that's fallen over the last several months, I do hope His Honor will accept your plea that comes much too late for many, knowing that you'll have the Knowing you'll spend the time you've now bargained for behind bars allows the rest of us to move forward. Does the sentence you now face account for all that's been taken? I'm not sure. But the risk of seeing a legal team get you off on a, out on a trial uh, far outweighs uh, the certainty that you'll be forced to face a consequence for the deceit. Mr. Owen. And though you were willing to bet against me running to calls by myself, <coughs> I'm not willing to make the same bet that you'd come out unscathed in trial. It said the saddest part about betrayal is it only comes from those closest to you who are trusted most, and how true that rings in the story of Jamie Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Walmart. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry you have been betrayed so deeply. I can only imagine the pain that you've experienced over this past year. It's been a terrible year. <laughs> awakening that you've had to reconcile yourself with. Mr. Bobby. Your Honor, we have no questions, Mr. Thank, Thank you. you. Call your next witness, Mr. Herman. Thank you, Your Honor. State Paul Mark Group. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Grub, would you state your name and spell it for the record? Mark Grub, M-A-R-K-G-R-U-B-E. Mr. Grub, I, I note that you are in uniform today. Could you tell the uh, the court your employment and how long you've been uh, employed as such? I'm the assistant chief at the Clark County Sheriff's Office. I've been there since uh, March the 13th, 2006. <coughs> Mr. Grub, <coughs> Officer Grub, did you uh, work as a, uh, a deputy or a an officer under the uh, term of Jamie Knoll. I did. When he was sheriff? Yes, sir. Are you here to ask the court to consider uh, a statement that you've prepared uh, in determining whether or not to accept his plea of guilty today? Yes, sir. You may proceed then. I'm going to try to get through this, Your Honor. Okay. Bear yeah. with me. Uh, yes, sir. Your Honor, I'm Mark Group. I'm the assistant chief of the Clark County Sheriff's Office. For the past year, or the half, year and a half, I've been the presiding witness for the Indiana State Police and their investigation into Jamie Knowles' criminal action. I'm on the top two lines of every probable cause affidavit. <laughs> I, I recall seeing this to you. Each day, I was impressed with two of the best investigators I've ever met in Jeff Heron and Chris Hansen. 
it's been a privilege to work with them. Throughout this investigation, I have seen firsthand the damage he, Jamie has caused, damage that reverberates not only within the walls of our law enforcement agency, but also in the hearts and lives of the people of this county. The personal impact of this investigation has been profound, and I have a lot of truth to tell today. I pray someone does some good with it. <clears throat> I hold in my hand a post-it note. The handwriting on the paper says 1 p.m. the 7th, Doug Carter. It is the note I wrote down the moment Sheriff Maples and I decided to contact the superintendent of the state police to begin this investigation. We did so after I started looking into falsified documents we had found. It's been over a year since that call was <coughs> made for the meeting on June 7, 2023. Identifying <coughs> who initiated this investigation should not be difficult. Sheriff Maples and I did. No deal was made. No attempt was made to cover up someone else's actions or save the current sheriff. We called because it was the right thing to do. When that call was made, Sheriff Maples and I were deeply concerned for the well-being of the community and the men and women of the Clark County Sheriff's Office. We knew they would ultimately pay the price for what was to come. And this concern has been a driving force in this investigation. During this time, I have met so many people and heard so many stories of how they were affected by Jamie Knoll's actions. And when I first stepped forward in this investigation, I was met with hostility from many of Knoll's associates. I was accused of being a pawn in a political attack, but I knew that was not the case despite Jamie trying to tell the world that's what was happening to him. While I didn't particularly appreciate hearing that's what people thought, I understood. I too had defended Jamie Knoll at different points in my career on what I now know are false beliefs, and for that I deeply regret and apologize. As I told Jamie in our last conversation in April of 2023, I had placed him on a pedestal he did not deserve. From the beginning, I hoped the truth would emerge and everyone would eventually see how Jamie had manipulated, used, and damaged those around him. Witnessing how deeply his actions have affected many, especially those who trusted him, is heartbreaking. Jamie did hire me as a police officer at the Sheriff's Office where thankfully I had already served nearly 10 years as a corrections officer. My service as a corrections officer solidified my loyalty to the agency and not to any one person. <clears throat> that loyalty is to the people, not to a single man. The difficult part about the past year and a half is the public perception that as sheriff, Jamie somehow owned the deputies. From the criminal allegations against him, it seems Jamie believed that too. But this office is more significant than any one person. It is not defined by who holds the title sheriff. The men and, men and women who work here are hardworking, honest, and dedicated. Many employees served long before Jamie and will continue to serve long after. The, the actual damage here lies with them. They will forever carry the burden of his actions. I know I will. <clears throat> Personally, my career aspirations have been affected. I had always considered running for sheriff. But Jamie has tarnished and dimmed that possibility. The negative effect he had on my family, I will never be able to explain. It was only after I discovered potential criminal behavior at the sheriff's office that I was able to see who he was and what he had done to me. Time lost with my family, vacations ruined, and emotional damage you caused, I will never be able to repair. As a father, how do I explain to my four teenage boys that the person we followed was not who we thought he was, or who I told them he was? The truth is, all that can heal that. I will forever carry with me the reality that I truly believed you were someone you weren't. There are so many people out there, I am sure, who share that same guilt. Those of us who served in his administration, and those of us who considered him a friend, will forever be associated with his actions. We will never be able to remove the photos of us volunteering in his campaign, and we will never be able to relay just how much we believed he was the man who would restore integrity to the sheriff's office. We will always have to answer the question, how didn't you know? For me, the answer is simple. Jamie told me he owned the for-profit EMS service, New Chapel EMS, and that he had non-profit contracts with Utica and New Albany for fire service. He told me the business was lucrative and I believed him. In the sheriff's office, Jamie ran things as a one-man show. Anyone who dared ask financial questions was chastised, criticized, and bullied. 
When I was responsible for jail operations, I was forbidden from asking how many positions we had available, and I was forbidden from asking financial questions to his secretary, as she was forbidden from discussing finances with us. I have a few last things to close up here, okay. if you can give me yes, just a moment, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> to the Knoll family and friends who were not complicit in his actions, when Sheriff Maples and I contacted the Indiana State Police, we had no idea the scope of what would unfold. We didn't foresee the suffering so many of you would endure, from internet attacks to personal attacks. <clears throat> so many of you were only guilty of believing you were his friend, brother, nephew, cousin, and I am deeply saddened that long, lifelong careers were lost because of this. I'm deeply saddened that his actions forever ruined solid friendships and bonds. You are not responsible for the things Jamie did, period. <clears throat> to Jamie, I say this. The men and women who wear this badge are more significant than the damage you caused. They will move forward and they will persevere, but no sentence, no matter how severe, will ever make them whole. You've done irreparable irreparable damage to countless lives, reputations, and careers. Your sentence is necessary, but for me today marks the beginning of moving forward. Judge Medlock, I encourage you to let us begin the healing process. Let this community move forward. Let the first responders in this community start rebuilding the trust that were lost because of this man's actions. I applaud you for the way you've handled Mr. Knoll. As you're aware, his actions were flagrant. I hope today is an opportunity to close the door on his 15 minutes and get him off of our television screens and off to the Department of Corrections. Thank you. Officer Gordon, thank you for your honor and your character. Thank you. Mr. Wilder, may I have some questions? No, we have no questions. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Officer Gordon. Call your next witness. <clears throat> Your Honor, I've been provided a, uh, a letter from the uh, Sheriff of uh, Clark County, um, Scott A. Maples, Jr., and he has asked me to, uh, to read it to the court for consideration in uh, determining uh, whether or not to accept this plea of guilty uh, mm -hmm. last week and then today. Who oh, objections? I just I think we addressed those things. We have no objections Thank because you. it relates to this. Proceed, Mr. Hurdle. In 2014, the people of Clark County trusted Jamie Knoll by electing him sheriff. With the election came high expectations from the community and the Clark County Sheriff's Office employees. We anticipated Sheriff Knoll would bring a renewed sense of professionalism to our agency and restore the public's trust in this place so many of us call our home and have dedicated our lives and careers to. However, in 2023, after being elected sheriff, I uncovered evidence of corruption and crime directly and solely attributable to former Sheriff Knowles' actions. Upon discovering this evidence, I had an obligation to the citizens to act, fully aware that doing so would subject the hardworking employees of the Clark County Sheriff's Office and myself to unnecessary and unfair public scrutiny and harm. The investigation over the past year has been challenging as we grappled with the disheartening reality that someone we knew had engaged in such egregious actions that even stretched beyond the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Despite these concerns, the integrity and ethical standards of the Sheriff's Office compelled me to uphold their law no matter the personal or professional cost. Unfortunately, those who had no part in these wrongdoings, our dedicated employees, and myself have suffered the scrutiny and damage of Jamie Knoll's actions and the involvement in these crimes. They deserve the opportunity to move forward, continue their dedicated work, and focus on repairing the image of the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Today, we stand at a crossroads where we can begin the process of creating public value and restoring the trust that has been deeply eroded because of Jamie Knoll. My hope this day marks the start of a new chapter for our agency and the community we serve. Respectfully, Sheriff Scott A. Maples, Jr. Thank you. You have another witness? I do, Your Honor. May we approach it prior to that? You bet. You may. <laughs> Your Honor, there, there are it's, there are three side there not going to be today. I don't know how the court and defense wish me to proceed. And I don't know what they were, what, what their statements were about. Do you think any of them were 
I, I can I can read them. They're they're rather short. Uh, if the court wants me to read them, we can just move them in. Jeff. Court's pleasure is. I'm I love the public here. Okay. Nice to meet you. No. I'm already overruled by that reaction. The invitation is wild. Proceed, Mr. Herta. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> there are three individuals who um, are not present today but have submitted something to the, uh, the state, and we anticipated them to be present. However, they're not here, so I, I'm asking leave of court to read those into the record. Yeah. Proceed. <clears throat> Over objection. This is a, a note from Ed and Janine Wiley, signed by Janine Wiley. It reads, as a taxpayer, Jamie Noll and all his, quote, friends have taken so much money from our county. In his plea, it says he has to pay New Chapel, but I believe he should pay us, the taxpayers of Clark County, first. It was, ta it was our tax dollars that went to New Chapel. As farmers in Clark County, we have seen a 10 to 16% raise in our property taxes. Now, I, I don't even know if it's because of Jamie Noll and friends, but I am sure that their spending didn't help much as it went to useless things. I wish someone would explain why someone needs that many cars, houses, and other crap. I think everyone involved should be prosecuted for all of this damage they did to this county. Janine Wiley. Secondly, Your Honor, Rita Bowley. Her statement reads, I was hired at the Clark County Sheriff's Office 225-1991 as a corrections officer. On 4-6-2015, I was promoted to captain. I was told it was in title only due to having an, another captain. I was told that if something happened to him, I would start getting captain's pay. I'm not sure what the date was that Captain Dogendorf and I went to the Sheriff Jamie Knoll several times and asked about my increase in pay. Also about a take-home cars, I was told I would get that too. Every time I spoke to him, about it, he said he would look into it. Nothing ever happened. I retired 12 30, 2021, and got nothing. The whole time I was captain, I was receiving officers' pay. After hearing about ghost employment, I feel I deserve the money of the rank that I held. Signed, Rita Bowley. Lastly, Your Honor, um, from Austin Metzler. About eight or nine years ago, I was in Clark County Jail. I was on special medications for a clotting disorder. I needed certain blood thinners. I was told repeatedly the jail could not afford them. I sat in pain and felt tortured. Because of the, these clots formed in my right leg, it was amputated. Today, I'm in a wheelchair forever. Sheriff Jamie Knoll spent millions on his friends and family stealing from the jail. The doctor lady was fired for stealing medicine. Today, I see he spent $11,000 on stakes, and I'll never walk again. Signed, Austin Metzler. Those are the three, Your Honor. Yes. Do you have any other live witnesses, Mr. Berger? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Is there any other live witnesses? Your Honor, I have a called Doug Carter. Good morning, Mr. Superintendent. Good morning, Judge. Thank you for coming down. Yes, sir. Sir, would you state your name and spell it for the record? Douglas G. Carter, D-O-U-G-L-A-S, G. Carter, C-A-R-T. And uh, the, the court to drive, I guess, um, called you superintendent. Could, could you tell the, uh, the folks here what your uh, role and position is? Yes, I'm the superintendent of the state police. How long have you been the superintendent of the state police? Twelve years. Are you familiar with Jamie Nall? I am. Have you prepared a, uh, a statement you'd like the court to consider um, today outlining uh, maybe how the actions have impacted you, law enforcement generally, and others? I have. Your Honor, I'd ask the uh, lead court to have uh, Superintendent Carter uh, direct his remarks to the court. Your Honor, I tried to five minutes, but I might be in just a, few, a minute or two over. <coughs> Your Honor, I'm humbly here today to share my thoughts about the actions of Jamie Knoll and the effects of his decisions on my profession, on this community, and on all citizens of our state. I take no pleasure in what must be said, but the time has come to be candid, to be honest, and to be direct about his actions. 
Just for background purposes, I began my state police career in 1984. Sorry, excuse me. Would you like some water? No, no, I'm good. Um, in 1984, and I served Hamilton County, just north of Indianapolis, as a really, really proud Indiana State Trooper for more than 18 years. Somehow, in some way, I became the elected sheriff of Hamilton County in 2003. After serving two consecutive terms, Governor-elect Mike Pence selected me to become the 20th superintendent of the state police in 2012, and I was again reappointed by Governor Holcomb in 2016 and again in 2020. I've now served as a superintendent of the Indiana State Police for 12 years. While I had known Jamie Noel for many years, we were nothing more than acquainted with one another. I can only remember a handful of conversations that the two of us ever had. One specifically happened to be in my office. That was after he was elected by the people of Clark County, I believe in 2015, as their next sheriff. I shared some experiences I had when I served in the same role, but of course a different county. <clears throat> Most importantly, we discussed money management, the do's and don'ts of commissary, and to be very cognizant of doing anything that, that has even a perception of impropriety. Over the years, I've had many similar conversations with other people, <clears throat> some from the ISP that were elected and some not, to local sheriff's offices and to other elected offices. Additionally, while politics certainly is necessary to get a person elected, a person must make it very clear that politics will not, will not drive your day-to-day -day operation. In other words, the trappings of politics will sure come into your office, but you, as the sheriff, should never let it out of the four walls that you were elected to. Politics should never be priority number one, but it seemed it was for Jamie. <clears throat> Jamie either did not hear the advice, did not care about the advice, or over time became oblivious to righteous accountability. I've heard today, and I've heard multiple times before, <clears throat> that Jamie was going to become the superintendent of the Indiana State Police. That terrified me. The intuition I felt while I was around him, even though only a few times, seemed to be of arrogance, of untouchable persona, and a person searching for power, relevance, money, and control for horrible words. That very search for something he so desired discredited an already eroding sense of public trust in my and many others' chosen profession. I have long believed that one person can destroy what thousands have tried to build. And for me, that is the importance of public trust. Jamie Noel was obviously not a person who strived to build public trust, rather a fiefdom of his own. We should never serve ourselves, rather those that don't even know our names, but those that rely on us in the most difficult times of their lives to do the right thing for them and never for us. The state police began the criminal investigation into Jamie's Knowles action some 18 months ago. I had no idea what we were about to learn. While I was not necessarily surprised that he was being accused of wrongdoing, our job was to objectively determine the facts, which we did. The very facts surrounding this case have become arguably one of the largest, if not the largest case, of public corruption of an elected official in our history. The facts are now known and very clear. Probable cause was established, dozens of felony charges were brought, and Jamie Noel recently admitted to the charges brought against him, even though initially they were referred to as a witch hunt. A debt of gratitude is owed to Prosecutor Hurdle, his staff, Lieutenant Jeff Heron, Detective Chris Hansen, and ISP analyst Carrie Steflick for their tireless, substantial, and unselfish commitment to the truth. To Jamie directly. 
I'm grateful that you have taken responsibility for your actions. I will never be able to understand how or really why you found yourself here, Jamie, only you know. My hope is that while you're away in prison, you find purposeful redemption, and that when you come back, you commit the rest of your life to those you have hurt, to those you have misled, and to those you owe. I also hope you find internal peace, stability, and one day maybe even purpose again in this life. specifically to the citizens of Clark and Floyd counties. My profession has been through some very difficult times over the course of these many years. Whether nationally in our state or within our counties, officers, while so often performing heroically and unselfishly, have also made some very poor choices that we must talk about, pursue, investigate, and take responsibility for. The true litmus test of our profession lies in the perception of our citizens. You all should expect stability, but that very stability can only be established through continuity and consistency of service. In other words, hold our own unapologetically accountable, and we did. All of our decisions have consequences, and my hope after I'm long gone is that future leaders will continue to hold those in, in our profession accountable, no matter who they are, no matter who they think they are, no matter what they have done, or however they may have lost their way. No one is above the law. Our citizens deserve nothing less. Judge Medlock, thank you, and I yield. Thank you, Officer Carter. I appreciate your words. Mr. Herman, any other witnesses? No, the, uh, the state uh, has no other witnesses uh, to present to the court. Your Honor, we only have uh, Mr. Noel who has a statement. I want to call uh, the probation officer that prepared the pre-sentence investigating for the first. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, could you find Ms. Albertson for me? Thank you. Thanks. To repent, which I have in the will, and to ask for forgiveness, I apologize. I'm sorry I wasn't able to apologize to any of the witnesses that spoke earlier. For some reason, even I'm not going to say because I don't want to dare make it look like I'm trying to deflect blame because it's mine. Um, the reasons of how this was allowed to happen, that's not who I am. It's definitely a big mistake that I made. But first, victims that you have are um, it's not me. And I apologize. Ask my kids to uh, forgive me, not being honest with them about where the money was spent or came from. My dishonesty with them has caused them all great emotional pain and suffering. My daughter Casey could lose her freedom because of me. It's all my fault. And they had, my family had no knowledge of the business that I was running, or how I was running it, or whether or not I had the right to tell them how they could spend their money or use their credit cards. 
I controlled everything when it came to our family's finances. I can think that maybe over 28 years of being married that my wife may have asked for 10 checks school related that she would have ever signed in her finances. I took out the garbage. That was my wheelhouse. My family trusted me to do that. And I obviously didn't do it. I prepared everyone's tax returns on turbo tax without their input. Matter of fact, when my daughter Casey, after she bonded out, she said, Dad, could you please do my taxes? I need the money because I paid bond. <coughs> and I said, Casey, I can't do it. She'd just been charged for something that was my fault that I did on her taxes. They were victims of my deceit, just like anybody else. I don't think you forgive me. Second, I asked my wife, 28 years to forgive me. I understand why she wants to end our marriage. I don't blame her. I violated her trust more than once, and I lied to her. I know this has caused her embarrassment and a lot of heartache and hatred being funneled towards her. I was not honest with her about the money, the credit cards, or the taxes, which I did. I'm sorry that I caused her so much pain and embarrassment, and I'm sorry. I'm going to apologize to the citizens of Clark County that trusted me, that voted for me, and let me be their sheriff, including everybody and some of which you heard from that helped campaign for me. I let sin overtake me and I violated their trust. I'm sorry. I want to apologize to the men and women of law enforcement, fire the best. I spent a lifetime as a law enforcement officer, volunteer fireman, and an EMT. And I know how difficult it is to do the job. My activities have tarnished the reputation of the public safety community, and it's not fair to them. None deserve the public to look at them and worry about their integrity. My actions should not tarnish them. It's my fault. I want to apologize to my friends and colleagues that have been brought into this case because of me. I'm sorry to each and every one of you. I never asked anyone to do anything wrong. I never expected you to do anything wrong, but because of me, you have suffered. I'm sorry for this and I apologize. I apologize to you, Judge, to the prosecutor, to the legal team, and in the end, thank them for being fair and forthright in consideration of my crimes. I do not look forward to the next 12 years, Judge, if you accept this plea, but I understand why I'll be spending time in prison, and I accept it. Finally, I ask for forgiveness. I'm a lifelong Catholic, and I understand the Lord will forgive me. And I hope each one of you can forgive me as well. Judge, I'm going to say just a short prayer because that's what I, I need to do. I need to make things right. I confess to Almighty God, you, my brothers and sisters, that I have grinned, sinned through my own thoughts and my words, that what I've done and what I've failed to do. Through my faults, through my faults, through my most grievous faults. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary and Virgin, all the saints and angels, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord my God. I'm sorry, and I hope I didn't leave anybody or anything out. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. <laughs> Counsel, I'll make argument in regard to the sentence. Your Honor, the... Um the state has no argument to make other than uh, I would only say that uh, this uh, agreement that was proposed by the state, ultimately signed by the, uh, the defendant and his counsel, uh, was uh, a lot of time, effort, and uh, thought that went into it. Ideas were taken from the Indiana State Police who worked this case from day one. There were disagreements at times, but at the end of the day, we believe this is appropriate punishment for the crimes that he has committed. 
each one of the victims and others who are not here. Um, I've met with. I've heard, this is at least the second time that I've heard the pain that he has caused to them. And as the court ordered, I'd ask the court to consider what they had to say today in determining whether or not this is appropriate. Does the question to you, does the punishment fit the crime? We, we are bound by the parameters of the law in the state of Indiana. At times we may agree with it, and at times we may disagree with it. But as officers of the court, uh, this is what the hand that we're dealt, and this is, it's not a game, but this is what we have played. And I believe that it's appropriate, and I would ask the court to, uh, to consider it. There today, maybe a little bit of solace for them, though. It's been the state's theory all along that um, Jamie Knowles been the boss. And it's also been the theory that if you cut the head off the snake, then the body follows. And while it's our hope that the other cases will attempt to take care of themselves, each one of those will be differently. I will say again that the job's not finished here. There's still four other people. I cite back to, as the judge said, he gets appointed by the Indiana Supreme Court. Well, he's the one that tabbed me to come down here and handle this case. I didn't know who Jamie Knoll was. My experience with Clark County has been almost minimal. But back in August, when all those search warrants started the, uh, the fall, 71 later, here we are. And now he's sentenced to the Indiana Department of Corrections for a period of 12 years. 15 with three suspended. A lot's changed. Law enforcement for 30 years, district chair, CEO, and now inmate at the Department of Corrections. I'd like to say in my mind that it, that it ends today. It ends for him, it ends for his case. And the hope, you know, as I look around Clark County and the people behind me, that y'all can turn the page this chapter is closed and that you can move forward and the healing can kind of start to begin. I know it won't be overnight, maybe even not in the next year, but in time. But at least in my eyes, the grip that Jamie Knoll had on this community is over. And nobody has to go through him to get elected for anything, to get medical care for anything, or to report a crime. Today's about accountability prison, restitution, all of those things. We'll stand aside now too to let the Attorney General work on the civil actions they have pending. Our case was the criminal part, theirs is the civil part. I want to thank Superintendent for all the, uh, I guess, allowing of the um, detectives, CSIs, computer techs to be at our disposal to work through this case. That's how much emphasis he placed on this, how much emphasis the Indiana State Police. You got the best from the Indiana State Police. And I'd also like to thank my staff who's been with me throughout the, this from day one. 
and it's been a grind since the time of the appointment until now I'm losing what little hair I have and what's there is all gray now so thanks I'm going to turn it over to uh, the superintendent but uh, echoing some of the judges remarks outlandish expenditures tarnished badge failed every officer failed his family all of those things and the judge took that into consideration but the judge like us the prosecution has to take into account what the parameters of the law are and that's why we ended up where we did and we believe it's an appropriate sentence and the punishment does fit the crime I'll step back and introduce you to Doug Carter just very briefly I echo what prosecutor hurdle said I think the word that keeps coming to my mind is that is that absolute power corrupts absolutely and this is an example of, a, of, of corruption and every time this happens to a person dressed like me no matter the color of their shirt takes away from who we are and how we, we are supposed to serve all of you and I understand that and that's why we we have done and will always do everything within our power to hold people accountable I had as I said in my comments in the courtroom today I had no idea what we were about to learn and I appreciate what you all have done over the course of this period of time and you properly reported the facts from what occurred and now and certainly today so I, I please accept my sincere thanks for what you've done you should hold us accountable you should hold us accountable and I think today's an example of that and um, I'm not going to apologize to anybody for, for, for what we have done in response to what Jamie Knoll did it's going to take us a while to crawl out of that I hope that the community here that the people that live in southern Indiana that might have felt like he had a grab or a hold on them understand today that that's no longer that is absolutely no longer we are human beings we are human and these kinds of things these people people are going to make choices that are going to bring a discredit to our profession continue to hold guys like me and gals like me accountable to hold them accountable I really feel very very strongly about that and sometimes it's hard to talk about but that doesn't mean we shouldn't so again thank you we'll take some questions as the prosecutor said this is still pretty active so we have a pretty narrow lane of questions that we can answer but we'll I promise you we'll do the very very best we can so. Rick could you start by addressing Jamie Knowles tension what happens to that uh, I know he's a retired Indiana State Police and he's a retired sheriff. Um, as far as how the pension works, that, that's, as the superintendent said, it, that, that's out of my lane. I don't know what's going to happen to the pension and uh, it would be probably irresponsible for me to speculate on that. These crimes he, 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 Jamie Knoll did not retire as an Indiana State Trooper. He left several years before his eligible time. So he, he received a separation benefit, but it is not, it is not a retirement. These crimes went on for so long. I think the question is, is there something wrong with the checks and balances in this county? Should there be more oversight? Well, I think we always want uh, the most checks and balances, but I mean, I, I, I think those are questions for the locals to say that, uh, to answer that. Um, the new chapels and the Uticas and the Sheriff's Department and any, any other agency that he touched, I think uh, only to protect yourself or an individual why not have those checks and balances it only protects the individual as well as the organization rick are you confident that he's going to be able to pay back the full amount of the restitution well the the order is there um and uh you heard the judge in the courtroom say today that there would likely be some sort of order coming about um some of the restitution and how that might be addressed there are a number of assets obviously in Jamie Knowles names including personal property and real property and uh, that's going to be have to be something the judge will sort out and or in the civil lawsuit with the Attorney General the my position is we've entered that amount in the plea agreement but how it tends to occur is going to be more of a, uh, a court decision or in a, um, a civil action for the superintendent I believe um, Jamie did apologize for uh, what he may have done to people who wear the badge. Uh, did that resonate with you at all, his apology? No. 
there were multiple times prior to this where he could have taken responsibility. I appreciate the question. The answer is absolutely not. It's easy to apologize when you got caught. Superintendent, uh, as far as the investigation into potential co-conspirators go, is there a timeline uh, for your officers, or is this a, a until the job is done investigation? Until there's nothing left for us to do. Okay, thank you. Does Jamie Bolt know have enough money to pay back the restitution that's in the order? <coughs> Well, the, uh, the restitution amount between Utica, the Sheriff's Department, Department of Revenue, and the Indiana State Police totals about just over $3 million. Um, whether or not the assets uh, will cover that, I don't know that, that fact right now. I, I don't. I, I think that's going to be someone doing a, an accounting of it, what, what he still owes on some of these personal properties and real properties, and what, uh, what equity he might have in those. What if they don't cover it? Is he in violation of the plea? Well, I think the determination would need to be made then that he has an ability to pay and is knowingly not paying. So there would be a separate determination of that because part of his conditions of probation when he's released from incarceration is that he will have to pay restitution if it's not paid back. And that's the, when the knowingly or intentionally uh, not paying would come into account. Does he get taken to prison today or what does that process look like? Um, that will be up to, to the Department of Corrections. Um, I know in, in, in Ripley County there are certain days that uh, prisoners are, are picked up and taken to the Department of Corrections, and they usually go to what's called the RDC, Reception Diagnostic Center, where an assessment is made, and they will be taken then to, uh, to the appropriate facility, wherever that might be. But that's something out of the prosecutor's hands as well as the judge's hands. That's going to be up to the Department of Corrections. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Okay. All right, should we do it real quick? Oh, we need to interview Mitch.